Hachette Audio presents Slow Hand, the life and music of Eric Clapton. Written by Philip Norman, read by Peter Coates. This program includes a Mac and PC compatible PDF of images. Prologue, a clockwork strawberry. It's December 1969 and lunchtime in a busy motorway cafeteria a few miles south of Leeds. Standing in the self-service queue are half a dozen young men whose shoulder-length hair, biblical beards and homespun clothes give them the look of 19th century evangelists. Their fellow customers recognize them as rock musicians, pick up their mostly American accents and stare with curiosity or hostility but no one yet realizes that they include George Harrison. Since the time of America's moon landing in July, it has been clear the Beatles are headed for breakup, and that, with the saddest synchronicity, they and the 1960s may come to an end together. But every press report has the fractious four battling behind closed doors in London's Mayfair. How can one of them, especially the most private, fastidious one, possibly be 170 miles to the north in this unsympathetic environment of harsh strip lights, clashing trays, and greasy smells. George is interrogating a female counterhand as to whether the mushroom soup of the day contains meat. It's mushroom soup, she reiterates patiently, still not recognizing the face behind the beard or the voice. It could be made with meat stock, though, George persists. I'm a vegetarian, you see. Meanwhile, the bushy-bearded, fur-coated figure who's next in line loads a plate with eggs, chips, bacon, and baked beans, and for dessert, chooses a portion of synthetic-looking trifle in a frilled paper cup. He's the 24-year-old Eric Clapton. At the cash register, he remembers he's carrying no money, In this case, not a mark of poverty, but royalty. Can anyone lend me a pound? He asks with a shamefaced grin at the incongruity of it. The two choose a table in a deserted sector, where their companions respectfully leave them by themselves. George starts to drink his mushroom soup in the way taught at young ladies' finishing schools, tilting the bowl away from him, plying his spoon outwards. After a few spoonfuls, He detects the presence of meat and pushes the bowl aside. By now, he's been noticed, if not yet positively identified, by a trio of women nearby, collecting dirty crockery with a trolley. After a murmured conference, their crew boss, a formidable-looking Yorkshire matriarch, approaches and says, "'It is you, isn't it?' "'No,' George replies. "'But there's no escape.' The women crowd round, paper napkins are produced, and dutiful beetle that he still is, he signs them as directed for Sharon, June, and their leader's grandson, little Willis. Why don't you ask Engelbert here for an autograph as well, he suggests. The trio turn to the table companion who's quietly working his way through his outsized fry-up. In truth, the most ardent Eric Clapton fans, even those who regard him as God, might have difficulty in recognising him today. His apostolic beard is newly grown, replacing the Ernest Zapata moustache he previously wore in homage to his best friend George, which in turn had superseded a mushroom cloud afro copied from Jimi Hendrix. No one else in his profession changes their look so frequently and radically. To these three least likely aficionados of psychedelic rock, all that can be said for certain is that he isn't Engelbert Humperdinck. Actually, George continues in the same flatlining tone, this is the world's greatest white guitarist, Bert Whedon. Another Beatley in-joke. Few of Britain's modern guitar stars would be where they are today without Whedon's play-in-a-day tuition book. But with his lounge suits, crinkly dyed blonde hair and big white Hofner president, no one less rock and roll than dear old Bert can be imagined. The trolley boss realises it's a wind-up, bridles with annoyance, but makes one last sally on behalf of Little Willis's autograph collection. Are you a group as well? 
she asked Clapton sternly. No, he says, avoiding her eye, just a hanger on. Not every famous band's breakup is a world stopping tragedy like the Beatles. Just a few months prior to this encounter, the supergroup Cream, consisting of Clapton, drummer Ginger Baker, and bass player Jack Bruce, and so named because each was previously in a top group, have separated after only two years together. A fusion of old fashioned blues with embryo heavy metal and freewheeling modern jazz. Cream were largely responsible for transforming pop into louder, more male-oriented rock. In their brief career, they sold 15 million albums, of which the third, Wheels of Fire, was the first double one to go platinum twice over. Clapton has a history of walking out of bands at their peak. First the Yardbirds, then John Mayles' Blues Breakers, but this time his well-known restlessness was less a factor than the mutual often violent hostility between Bruce and Baker in Cream's premature curdling. Anyway, these days top bands continually split and reform in different shapes, like amoeba in a psychedelic light show. Throughout the Anglo-American rock community, musicians are resigning from ensembles where they feel misunderstood or whose commercial success has begun to weigh on them, and joining up with kindred spirits to play the kind of stuff they've always really yearned to. When Graham Nash quits the Hollies to team with David Crosby from The Birds and Stephen Stills from Buffalo Springfield as Crosby, Stills and Nash, it seems that this pooling of top-level talent couldn't get any better. But then, seven months after the end of Cream, Clapton and Ginger Baker are revealed to have joined forces with the vocalist-organist Stevie Winwood from Traffic and before that the Spencer Davis Group and bass player Rick Gretsch from Family. Eschewing the new fashion for baptising bands with their members' surnames like law firms, the Super Super Group will be called Blind Faith. Though long ago credited with genius by his peers, Clapton at this moment is far from a national celebrity. In the Britain of 1969, rock music doesn't yet titillate every generation and permeate every level of life. It belongs wholly to youth the most visible part of that long-haired, unruly nation within a nation known as the underground or counterculture. The Beatles apart, its luminaries are regarded as outside normal society, appearing in the national media only in negative contexts, such as promiscuity, drunkenness and drug abuse. With his still spotless record as regards all three, Clapton has remained largely unknown to anyone over 30, Lately, however, he's made a transition from the music trades to the society columns that only Mick Jagger had managed before him. The reason is his engagement to the Honourable Alice Ormsby Gore, youngest daughter of the fifth Baron Harlech, a hereditary peer and former British ambassador in Washington. Fleet Street loves this very 60s romance between a member of one of Wales's noblest families and a working-class boy from Surrey and there's little mention of the fact that when they met, the Honourable Alice had only just turned 16. Blind Faith's live debut is a free concert in London's Hyde Park on the 7th of June in front of an estimated 120,000 people. The occasion kicks off a summer destined to be filled with epic open-air festivals marshalling Rock's premier division. The Rolling Stones also in Hyde Park, Bob Dylan on the Isle of Wight, Jimi Hendrix, The Who, The Grateful Dead and Janis Joplin at Woodstock, as if the 60s thrice-blessed children are trying to hold on to the golden decade as long as possible and squeeze every last drop of joy from it. Blind Faith's eponymous first album is delayed by wrangles between the different record companies to which its members are contracted, so it doesn't come out until August. The cover shows an 11-year-old girl with cloudy pre-Raphaelite hair naked to the waist and brandishing a phallic-looking silver spaceship, an image which, even in these permissive times, is notably pushing the boundaries. It immediately goes to number one in both Britain and the US, over there even entering the black R&B charts. But for Clapton, Blind Faith do not live up to their hype, and on their debut American tour, it becomes an increasing burden to him. He realises they're under-rehearsed, 
and have launched before building up enough original material. On stage, they soon exhaust the supply of their own songs and have to fall back on old hits by Cream and Stevie Winwood's former band Traffic, so that some rock critics, mortifyingly, dub them Super Cream. Fatefully, among the tour's supporting acts are the American husband and wife country blues duo Delaney and Bonnie. Delaney Bramlett hails from Mississippi, a black-bearded, God-fearing, hell-raising good old boy. Eastern-born Bonnie is his antithesis, angel-faced, blonde, and refined-looking. In the early 1960s, she became the only white woman ever recruited into Ike and Tina Turner's Ikeettes, the sexiest of all backing groups. Seemingly, in reaction to that, although still only 25, she cultivates a grandmotherly look, pinning her golden hair haphazardly on top of her head and peering over little spectacles perched on her retroussé nose. Clapton is immediately drawn to the Bramlets, whose soulful acoustic music seems to have all the integrity he finds lacking in blind faith. He starts hanging out with them, writing songs with them, even joining them on stage while giving over more and more prominence in his own band to Stevie Winwood. By the end of the tour, Blind Faith are finished, and Clapton is planning to record with Delaney and Bonnie and go on the road with them. In token of his retreat from hype and over-adulation, they'll be the headliners while he merely plays in the backup band known simply as Their Friends. The Bramlets soon feel the financial clout of that unassuming chap who never has any money on him. Their friends are otherwise made up of high-quality sidemen brought over from America, including drummer Jim Gordon, guitarist, keyboards player Bobby Whitlock, bass guitarist Carl Radel, and saxophonist Bobby Keys. Their new friend-in-chief pays all the troops airfares and hotel bills, and gives them the run of his country mansion to rehearse with a set of expensive new amplifiers he's had shipped over from New York. It's an odd moment to crave anonymity since he's currently being interviewed for a profile in the London Sunday Times, hugely prestigious and glamorous colour magazine, whose readership is around 1.5 million, and his portrait is to be taken by the magazine's star photographer, the Earl of Snowden. That the Queen's brother-in-law, husband of her sister Princess Margaret, should be a working photojournalist, epitomises how the 1960s have sent Britain's ancient class barriers tumbling. But rock music will not touch the royal family for some years yet, and Lord Snowden, whose subjects are normally the elderly and impoverished, asks the profile writer, me, to suggest how and where the portrait might be shot. I mentioned the graffito that appeared on a London tube station wall in 1965 when our subject was still in John Mayles' Blues Breakers. Clapton, some anonymous spray can artist declared, is God. The Earl takes it literally, mobilising two assistants, a bank of strobe lights, an illustrated guide to the pagan deities of Norse and Germanic mythology, and a smoke machine. The Delaney and Bonnie tour rehearsals are in progress at the Lyceum, a subterranean, guilt-encrusted ballroom just off London's Strand. Snowden photographs Clapton alone on the dance floor with a vintage black Gibson Les Paul. He's temporarily clean-shaven, revealing a face one cannot call good-looking or bad-looking, or anything, really, with its wide-set eyes, pointed nose and slightly receding chin. But already as if by some instinctive defence mechanism, the first tendrils of a new moustache have begun to sprout. Shot from below, looming through icy clouds of dry ice with features convulsed as if in pain or ecstasy, though more likely in reaction to the smoke, he resembles a t-shirted Wotan hefting a thousand-watt spear. All that's lacking are Wagner's The Ride of the Valkyries and a horned helmet. On the 1st of December, Delaney and Bonnie and friends appear at London's Royal Albert Hall, where Cream gave their already legendary farewell concerts almost exactly a year earlier. Ordinarily, it would be a wildly overambitious venue for a visiting American act with neither a hit single nor album in the UK, but the name Eric Clapton on the poster has guaranteed that it's sold out. 
The troupe wait to be called on stage at the mouth of a tunnel, overlooked by a block of seats. A boy as slight and inconspicuous as Clapton spots him below and calls out, You're great, Eric. Thanks, man, he answers resignedly. The evening's MC introduces him as the guy who got this gig together and the band will be going to play around. True to his promise, Clapton stays well out of the limelight, standing on the right, well behind Delaney, identifiable only by the puffed-out sleeves of his grey silk shirt. But it soon becomes clear the audience is homing in on his guitar as if picking the best bits out of a salad. Among the songs he's written with the Bramlets is Coming Home, counterpointing Delaney's near falsetto with a bass riff like an early rough sketch for Layla. Each growl of the riff receives an ovation. He has the type of white blues singing voice that many young Britons have discovered in themselves, most notably Georgie Fame and Stevie Winwood. But although he's sung in both Cream and Blind Faith, it's been little more than underscoring to Jack Bruce or Winwood. The Bramlets have told him he's far better than that. Delaney warning in Southern Preacher fire and brimstone style that if he doesn't use his voice as he should, God will take it away. Unluckily, their British television debut together was on a show co-hosted by Georgie Fame and an equally bluesy-voiced Brit, Alan Price, formerly of The Animals. Seemingly intimidated by such competition, even though neither Fame nor Price performed on camera with the D&B troupe, Clapton still remained a country-picking accompanist, glancing diffidently at Delaney as if to join in the vocal would have been the height of presumption. But tonight, he sings lead on J.J. Cale's After Midnight and on I Don't Know Why, a big production soul number co-written with the Bramlets. Each brings the Albert Hall to its feet, rapturous that this time he's not saying goodbye, but hello, and they can hear it. The tour begins in West Germany and Scandinavia, then returns to Britain, where I join its northern leg to round off my Sunday Times magazine profile of Clapton. His publicist, Robin Turner, is on hand, but these are days before PR people hover possessively over star clients, doling out access in half-hour portions in hotel rooms. I ride the bus with the musicians, hang out with them between shows, and watch every performance from the wings. From this privileged vantage point, I notice an addition to the Friends, an extra guitarist in a black Stetson hat and buckskin jacket whose gaunt, bearded face noticeably lacks the good humour of his American colleagues. It's George Harrison, who has joined the tour to escape the strife among his fellow Beatles and get used to playing live again after years shut away in the recording studio. He keeps well to the back of the stage, providing chords only, until the story gets out in Melody Maker and in a motorway cafeteria near Leeds, the audiences have no idea who he is. Here up north, Clapton is God tends to be taken at face value, and since the Blind Faith debacle, many have wondered when they'll see him again, if ever. His only concern is that they should appreciate his protégés, and he's visibly upset when their response proves tepid. Robin Turner says the Scandinavian audiences showed even less tact. Eric was almost in tears because people were shouting for Delaney and Bonnie to get off the stage and for him to play on his own. For Turner, this whole exercise is yet further evidence of Eric's chameleon personality, something which goes far deeper than hair follicles. He has a way of turning into whoever he's with. When he was hanging out a lot with George Harrison... He bought a big house like George's and a big Mercedes. George gave him his Indian painted mini. When he was with Stevie Winwood, setting up Blind Faith, he went back to jeans and wanting to live out in the country. When he met Delaney and Bonnie, he gave up travelling first class and just climbed aboard their bus. Even with this colossally distinguished friend among the Bramlett's retinue, down-home togetherness prevails. There are no star dressing rooms, Clapton, Harrison and the Americans share communal changing areas with their British support band, Ashton, Gardner and Dyke. Clapton's guitars lie around out of their cases unguarded. His cherished Gibson Les Paul, a metal dobro dating from the 1930s, a custom-made Zamitis acoustic 12-string inlaid in silver 
that he calls Ivan the Terrible. At one point, he picks it up to show George something, and looping its strap over his head, says in all seriousness, I'm not very good at chords. Perpetually circulating joints aside, there's none of the depravity associated with rock tours, at least none visible. No move is made to trash any of the gloomy old grand hotels where they're accommodated, despite the surly staff and impossibly pretentious restaurants which refuse service to long hair, ponchos and crushed velvet trousers on principle and close as early as 9pm. Nor are there groupies or orgies. Quite the opposite. The Americans with their solemn beards and grave old-fashioned speech, I don't care for any thank you, give the impression of a non-stop Bible meeting. In any case, Bonnie Bramlett, always the focus of things in her granny glasses, wearing a shawl, working at a piece of embroidery and sometimes breaking into a soul-smoky gospel song, would act as a powerful deterrent. When I get Clapton alone, as I can pretty much any time between shows, he's friendly and candid, speaking in a 60s classless voice with a faint Surrey burr. I notice the dull teeth that are the legacy of most British boys born during or just after the Second World War. He's articulate far beyond usual rock star level, and better read than any I've met before, save only John Lennon. At the moment, he's immersed in A.J. Cronin's Hatter's Castle, the story of a tyrannical Scottish hat maker, which reaches its climax with the 1879 Tay Bridge railway disaster. He already loves the 1942 film noir version, starring Robert Newton and the young James Mason. He tells me about Robert Johnson, the blues musician who for him surpasses all others, a figure likewise credited with genius as a very young man. It resonates hugely with him that at recording sessions, Johnson was too humble to look the engineer in the eye, but sang and played facing the wall. He also talks about his childhood, something rock celebrities in this era seldom do. I'm the first interviewer to hear how he was brought up by his grandmother, believing that she was his mother, and how when his real mother came back into his life, he had to pretend she was his grown-up sister. This creates a bond, for there was a similar deception in my own family that blighted my existence for years afterwards. I assume the 60s have helped him get over it, just as they've helped me. When I raise the question of his personal wealth, in reference to all that expensive equipment given to the Delaney and Bonnie band, he's neither offended nor evasive. I don't know how much I got, man, he confesses. Rock stars are granted a second childhood, for the rest of their lives if they choose, and nowhere more so than when on tour. In one of our conversations, he reminisces about his days with the Yardbirds, belting up and down Britain packed into a single van, and about musicians' roadside meeting places like the Ram Jam Inn, where mayhem had no may about it. And there was a transport calf just off the M1 called the Blue Boar, where you could get away with anything, throwing plates of fried tomatoes, anything. Those memories of the old Blue Boar are clearly hard to shake. In Newcastle-on-Tyne, the hotel had unbent sufficiently to leave a cold supper laid out for the musicians after the show. It's an impressive spread, but not much of it gets eaten, for Clapton starts a food fight that leaves everyone soaked in mayonnaise and vinaigrette, and picking lettuce leaves and bits of sweet corn out of their hair and beards, helpless with laughter. That was great, he says later, with the exhilaration of someone fresh from a spa. Delaney Bramlett, that black-bearded, roistering good old boy, has become his soulmate. During the few daylight hours that see rock musicians up and about, they disappear together for long periods, apparently perpetrating juvenile mischief in the wider world. When they return from one such expedition, Delaney has somehow lost one whole leg of his jeans up to the thigh. He continues wearing them nonetheless, even on stage. Before the second Newcastle show, the pair sally forth again, intending to purchase water pistols. Instead, they return with a quantity of little plastic fruit, oranges, lemons and pears with grotesque leering faces that can be wound up to walk a few unsteady paces on undersized legs. That night, while the support band, Ashton, Gardner and Dyke are playing, 
Clapton ducks on stage and sets a lemon toddling along the top of Tony Ashton's electric organ. After the show, they all hold races with the clockwork fruit on the dressing room floor. It's a scene I'll always remember. The long-haired, hippie-garbed figures cheering on their chosen miniature oranges, cherries or grapefruit. Bonnie Bramlett, gold hair and granny-ish, an island of tranquility, working at her embroidery and softly singing, Oh, happy day. Her black-bearded spouse, with one leg clothed in blue denim and one bear, encouraging a scarlet strawberry. Come on, Big Red, you're a winner, Big Red. Go, Big Red, go. My last night with the tour is in Liverpool, a city which has raised no monument to its four most famous sons, and now seemingly never will. Out of respect for George Harrison, the subject is never mentioned. Instead, the talk turns to last August Woodstock Festival and its surprise hit, an American vocal group named Shanana, who perform 50s rock and roll as knockabout comedy. None of the 60s musical heroes, Dylan included, would be where they are now without those primordial anthems by Elvis Presley, Little Richard, Chuck Berry and the rest. Throughout the decade, they've put rock and roll firmly behind them, focusing always on evolution and experimentation. But on the cusp of the 70s, with heaven knows what lying ahead, there's a rush of nostalgia for its exuberance, simplicity, and what's recognised now as wondrous innocence. So this evening's Delaney and Bonnie show features a bunch of golden oldies like Richard's Rip It Up, all so familiar that they don't need rehearsing. Despite the fine specimens all around him, Clapton's bushy beard has not returned, and to get into the 50s spirit, he wets his hair and combs it into a teddy boy quiff that finally stamps some character on his naked face, a faint look of Gene Vincent. The so-called rock and roll tribute is intended as parody, but those old three-chord chestnuts prove as potent as ever. By the end, a guitar virtuoso who normally seldom moves on stage and never smiles is angling his fretboard, going down on one knee like Cliff Gallup from Vincent's band, The Blue Caps, actually laughing. Even George feels the exhilaration. I'd forgotten what a gas playing live can be, he says afterwards. That little Richard medley is in E, isn't it? Though the tour's live album will give Delaney and Bonnie the intended boost, and Delaney will go on to produce Clapton's first solo album, his acoustic folk rock Lord Almighty Ham and Grits Down on the Bayou interlude is nearing its end. In Rock's ever-changing light show, a new amoeba is soon to take shape. A few months from now, Delaney and Bonnie's friends will be no more, and Clapton will have taken the nucleus to form yet another band, one giving a new twist to his relentless self-effacement. In tune with the burgeoning rock and roll revival, their name will hark back to late 50s vocal groups whose leaders went semi-incognito. Dion and the Belmonts, Danny and the Juniors, Little Anthony and the Imperials, while wryly suggesting some clunky British contribution to the genre. They will be Derek and the Dominoes, the vehicle for one of Rock's greatest love songs and for their modestly pseudonymized leader to embark on the seduction of his Beatle best friend's wife. Backstage in Liverpool, Delaney little suspects what a different place Clapton's head is already in, while they and the others race their clockwork fruit over the changing room floor. Crouched down with one leg still bare, the satanic-looking good old boy cheers on his plastic strawberry, which does indeed seem to possess a turn of speed its orange, lemon and grapefruit rivals do not. Come on, Big Red, don't let me down. You can do this. Go, Big Red, go! He wails in frustration, a foretaste of much more to come, as Big Red hits a bump in the carpet and topples over, its legs continuing to rotate feebly. Introduction The Super Survivor When I wrote Paul McCartney, the biography, following on from John Lennon, The Life, and Shout, the Mail on Sunday's book reviewer, Craig Brown, noted playfully that it brought the number of printed pages I'd produced about the Beatles to 
to 2,106, excluding paperback and foreign editions. By contrast, Brown wrote, Tolstoy's War and Peace weighs in at a modest, almost petite, 1,273 pages. Even allowing that the Beatles story in its own way resembles a Tolstoyan epic, and that nowadays encyclopedia-sized books are devoted to individual years of the 1960s, my writing career may well look unhealthily Fab Four fixated. In fact, I've also written biographies of the Rolling Stones, Elton John, Buddy Holly and Mick Jagger, as well as novels, short stories, screenplays, television and radio drama, two produced stage musicals, an autobiography, and journalism on a wide variety of subjects. As I often protest, maybe too much, a rock biographer was something I never set out to be. When I began Shout in the late 70s, it was intended as a one-off, aimed at challenging the universal belief that everybody already knew everything there was to know about the Beatles. I little suspected it had begun a chain reaction that would chain me for decades to come. After Shout, I could hardly not move on to the Stones, whose story overlapped their supposed Liverpudlian arch-rivals in so many ways. The same was true of Elton John, who would never have dominated the post-Beatles charts and arenas without the sponsorship of their music publisher, Dick James. Those two books inevitably propelled me to Buddy Holly, whose vocal style, songwriting and backing group, The Crickets, first inspired both the Beatles and the Stones, and who got Elton wearing glasses, even though his eyesight was normal. Actually, I was writing one continuous narrative of undubitably Tolstoyan scale, how British popular music conquered the world in the second half of the 20th century and created a seemingly everlasting template. Now and again, I try to break free of my typecasting, only for another segment of the story and another publisher's advance to offer themselves enticingly, like Michael Corleone struggling to break free of his mafia crime family. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in again. But after Paul McCartney, who next? A life of George or Ringo did not attract me, still less the thought of bringing my Beatles word count closer to that of the Encyclopedia Britannica. I've limited myself to writing only about music's tiny topmost echelon, names that provoke the same instant, excited reaction in every country and culture. By that measure, even behemoths like Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd or Queen don't quite qualify. The only ones up there with the Beatles and the Stones are Presley, Hendrix and Bowie, market already saturated. Dylan and Michael Jackson, each undoable for reasons too numerous to mention, and, no dots, Eric Clapton. Clapton is God, that anonymous spray artist declared more than half a century ago. Although rock stars are often treated like deities, the title has only ever been formally conferred on somebody who at first glance might seem under-equipped for the topmost echelon. He writes songs, but without the fecundity of a McCartney or a Dylan. He sings, but always seemingly a bit under sufferance. As a performer, he has none of the flamboyance or daring of a Bowie or a Jackson. Such things are of no account when set against his single, immense gift, the ability to conjure magic from a slab of electrified wood. Over the years, he has seemed less like a god than some mythic gunfighter or pool player whom young upstarts are constantly challenging, only to retire defeated like everyone else, bar Hendrix. He's the guitar's Wyatt Earp or Minnesota Fats, peerless not only in rock but in the blues, a form which for generations was supposedly the preserve of poor black troubadours bewailing the hardship and oppression of their lives. The elite of Chicago and Memphis, the likes of Muddy Waters, B.B. King and Buddy Guy, were likewise to bow down before this white boy from the sedate English county of Surrey. It is not merely a question of fast fingers, nor even a unique sound, for Clapton has created so many across the spectrum from heavy metal to reggae. Like the supreme soloists in the classical sphere, 
The violinist Yehudi Menuhin springs most to mind. His mastery can touch the sublime, as if it comes from somewhere outside his so ordinary seeming self. Carlos Santana, his nearest counterpart in the Latino sphere, defines such moments as when the Holy Ghost takes over. In the 60s, when lead guitarists turned from soloists into superheroes, Clapton was the first, adorning three of the decade's most revered bands, the Yardbirds before Cream and Blind Faith, changing his appearance for each one and walking away from each when it failed to live up to his exacting standards. Uniquely, he became an ex officio member both of the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, at the same time backing every great name of the era, from Dylan to Aretha Franklin, as well as many of the American bluesmen he had worshipped since boyhood. In the 70s, initially with the deepest misgivings, he made the transition from team player, whom no team could ever satisfy, to solo recording artist and performer. It was a move that ultimately brought him record sales of 129 million, 80 gold, platinum, multi-platinum or diamond discs, 18 Grammy Awards and an unprecedented three inductions under different headings into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yet his concerts were conspicuously without the spectacle and egomania rock audiences normally expect. All they ever wanted was that lone figure with the close-cut beard on which his face finally settled, usually wearing jeans like the bricklayer he almost became, and crafting his matchless licks as impassively as if rinsing out a pair of socks. Rock's greatest guitarists are not remembered for their solos but their riffs, intros and recurring phrases that define a song in half a dozen notes or less and plunge it into the listener's bloodstream before a word is sung. There's no better example than Derek and the Domino's Layla, with Clapton's Fender, abetted by Dwayne Allman's Gibson, not gently weeping, but wailing with inadmissible desire, a secret hard-on in sound. Not the least remarkable thing about his career is how much of it he's managed to spend out of the headlines. Almost all the problems that normally go with great celebrity and longevity in the rock business seem to have passed him by. His epic addictions to drugs and alcohol never resulted in any but the slightest brushes with the law and did not reach the media until he himself was ready to confess them. Aside from a single, atypical incident in the mid-1970s, he's never been guilty of any seriously bad behaviour in public, never had to endure an embarrassing divorce case or paternity suit, never had children who grew up to be shiftless, damaged brats, never been pilloried for either ludicrous extravagance or meanness, never been clobbered by the Inland Revenue, never appeared on any list of offshore tax avoiders, never had to spend fortunes on suing his management or record company or being sued by them. Despite often considering himself the most unfortunate of mortals, he was blessed with amazing luck, leaving by the back door just before the police burst in through the front walking away from car crashes without a bruise or a prosecution, botching serial suicide attempts, narrowly missing a helicopter crash which killed a fellow guitarist, two of his road crew and his agent, being rescued in the nick of time from drowning, and diagnosed in the nick of time not only with lethal heroin addiction and alcoholism, but bleeding ulcers, epilepsy and pleurisy, all similarly on the quiet. Only in one area was he unable to keep the covers completely on his life. From his twenties to his forties, he was a womanizer on the scale of Mick Jagger, a sex addict before the term was invented, with a jaw-dropping recklessness all his own. He never had to do anything, observes a management figure who knew him in the 1980s. Women just stuck to him like iron filings to a magnet. Rock's most famous love triangle was created when he fell in love with Patty Boyd, the wife of his best friend George Harrison, wooing her from the concert stage and record term table with Layla, the song he had written in adoration of her. As she afterwards recalled, that lovelorn wailing riff did as much as the lyrics entreaties to wear down her resistance. A plectrum has never had more formidable pulling power. His very nickname of Slowhand, 
originally not a compliment at all, was borrowed by the Pointer Sisters' 1981 hit single to signify the perfect sexual partner. Endlessly patient, considerate, and skilled in strumming songs guitar. I want a man with a slow hand. I want a lover with an easy touch. Less alluringly, not even Jagger better illustrated the price of being a rock star's old lady and living with the egotism, ruthlessness, and insensibility to the feelings of others that are basic job specifications for the breed. With Clapton's old ladies, a laughable misnomer, the price could include addictions as bad as his, or worse, and permanent collateral damage while he moved on to the next one without a backward glance. But after all those decades of getting off scot-free came a dreadful reckoning. In 1991, his child with the Italian actress Lori Del Santo, a four-year-old son named Connor, accidentally fell from the 53rd floor window of a New York apartment building. A man who had shrunk from the public gaze throughout his career and whose capacity for emotion outside music had always seemed limited, now went to the uttermost opposite extreme, bearing his grief in a song called Tears in Heaven. No old-time vagrant bluesman had ever plumbed such depths of misery as he among his mansions and Ferraris. As he advances into his seventies, he still performs more or less continuously, seemingly unable to give up a life that once seemed intolerable past the age of thirty. And these days, he knows how much he's got, man. Concert earnings, back royalties and publishing. Unlike the Beatles or Stones, he controls all his own songs. A superb art collection, several lavish homes and innumerable expensive cars add up to an estimated fortune of £170 million, 11th equal with Rod Stewart on the London Sunday Times rock star's rich list. One of the most thoroughly dissolute rockers of olden times has become the most thoroughly reformed. The former drunken druggy in Excelsis is a pillar of Alcoholics Anonymous and a leading campaigner against drug abuse who has poured millions into the Crossroads Treatment Centre he helped to found in Antigua. If he missed out on the knighthoods given to his old friends Elton, Paul and Mick, at least his 1995 OBE, Order of the British Empire, was upgraded to CBE, Commander of the British Empire, in 2004. And there's still time. At the age of 54, his seeming quest to seduce every female in the world came to an end when he met his second wife, a 23-year-old American student named Melia McEnery. While herself maintaining a compatibly low profile, she has borne him three daughters, some restitution for the hideous tragedy of 1991, and to all appearances she is the only woman to whom he has ever been completely faithful. Survivor is a term commonly given to anyone whom rock music has not killed or sent insane or reduced to playing golden oldie weekends in Skegness. For Eric Clapton, as one surveys his six decades in the topmost echelon, it seems wholly inadequate. To borrow the prefix he so much hated when it was attached to groups in which he played, he is a super survivor. As a journalist, I interviewed him face-to-face -face only that one time for the Sunday Times magazine in December 1969. When we said goodbye after the Snowden photo shoot, he was wearing a dark blue bespoke suit with a white t-shirt saying, Toronto Rock and Roll Revival. An adventurous combination for then. Put it there, mate, he said with unexpected warmth, offering me his hand. My profile ran early in the new year, headlined the great god Clapton, with Snowden's got a Damarung portrait as a double-page spread, turned sideways. That was the old Sunday Times magazine for you. I received no direct reaction from Clapton, but gathered he'd liked it. That summer, when the New York Times approached him for an interview about Jimi Hendrix's death, he agreed on condition that I was the interviewer. I said I would do it, and was in discussions with the Times, when my magazine bosses sent me off to America to write about the Motown organization. In 1972, I published Wild Thing, 
a collection of short stories thinly fictionalizing my various encounters with rock, blues, and country stars for the Sunday Times. Its title story was based on the Delaney and Bonnie tour and featured a restless, capricious guitar hero, whom I named Reg Lubin. I don't know if Clapton ever read it, though his friend and frequent saviour Pete Townsend did, and sent me a nice note saying I had drawn him to the life. Our only further contact came in the late 1980s when I was researching the Elton John biography, and he talked to me on the phone about his occasional collaborations with Elton. I mentioned Delaney and Bonnie and the clockwork fruit races backstage, and he chuckled at the memory. It was during my American publicity tour for that book in 1991, stopping off in Atlanta, Georgia, that I first heard Tears in Heaven on the radio. I'd recently become a father for the first time, and the desolation in his voice had me in tears. For someone contemplating a biography in any genre, the first task is a scan for possible competitors, past and pending. In Clapton's case, the only one of any significance is Ray Coleman's Survivor, an authorised biography published back in 1986. There have been various unauthorised attempts since then, most recently Motherless Child by Paul Scott, not the author of the Raj Quartet, in 2015, to capitalise on Clapton's 70th birthday. Repeated tail gunner sweeps revealed no preemptive chronicler who might be reviewed ahead of me, or, almost as bad, alongside me. A formidable deterrent was his best-selling 2007 autobiography, ghostwritten by Christopher Simon Sykes, which was blisteringly frank about his addictions and infidelities and fully explained the childhood confusion, growing up thinking his grandmother was his mother, which he'd first revealed to me in 1969. But it was a speed read, sometimes condensing whole epochs into a single paragraph, and overall withholding as much as it revealed. Also from 2007, there was Patty Boyd's autobiography, Wonderful Tonight, with her account of the 15 tempestuous years with Clapton after she left George for him. Though wonderfully free of blame or bitterness, it illuminated Clapton's long-time inability to find any stability or contentment outside his guitar fretboard and oft-proven ability to make his own existence hellish. In all my years of chronicling the Beatles, I'd somehow never met Patty, who went on from being rock music's most famous muse, not only Layla, Wonderful Tonight, and Bell Bottom Blues, but George Harrison's Something, to become a widely exhibited photographer. She turned out to be rather curious about me and accepted an invitation to lunch at the Ivy. During a highly enjoyable three hours, we hardly mentioned Eric, or George, instead ranging over diverse subjects such as Winston Churchill, British boarding schools, the Elizabeth Arden Beauty Salon in Bond Street, where both she and my late mother once worked, mutual friends from the Beatles in a circle like Neil Aspinall and Derek Taylor. It was only when seeing her into a taxi afterwards that I got round to asking if she'd talk to me for a Clapton biography. Yes, we can do that, she said. Getting in, she remembered another mutual acquaintance, Derek and the Domino's former drummer, Jim Gordon. Is Jim out of prison yet? she asked. I didn't know he'd gone to prison. What was it for? Murdering his mother. That alone was enough to pull me back in again. 1. Rick Most top British rock stars of the 60s and 70s lost no time in putting their birthplaces far behind them. It's hard to imagine John Lennon ever showing reluctance to leave suburban Liverpool, Mick Jagger settled and content in Dartford, Kent, or Elton John irresistibly drawn back to Pinner, Middlesex. But Eric Clapton's Italianate mansion in Ewhurst, Surrey, his main home since 1968, is only 12 miles from the village where he was born and raised, and to which he remains intimately connected. For me, Patty Boyd says, Eric will always be the boy from Ripley. Village, Ripley may be, but it is no isolated hamlet. Situated only 20 miles south of London, it formerly lay on the A3, the main road to Portsmouth, making it less famous for its superstar sun than for sclerotic traffic jams. Drivers, becalmed in their vehicles, 
had ample leisure to study the generous sprinkling of pubs, the Church of St. Mary Magdalene, boasting a chancel dating back to the 12th century, and the ivy-fronted Talbot Hotel, an old coaching inn where Lord Nelson is said to have conducted romantic trysts with Lady Emma Hamilton. The opening of a bypass in 1976 took away the traffic jams, leaving a main street typical of Surrey's commuter belt, upmarket coffee houses, an orthodontist surgery, an interior designer, the Miss Bush Bridal Boutique in a converted Methodist chapel. The low profile Clapton has always sought so assiduously was never lower than here. The sole hint of theming is Ripley Guitars, its small bow window all but filled by a single candy-pink Fender Stratocaster. And that might equally signify Paul Weller, formerly of the Jam and Style Council, and born in nearby Woking, whose recording studio is just down the road. Despite such modern amenities, village life carries on very much as for generations past, deepening the sense of unreality that a great metropolis is throbbing just over the horizon. Social life revolves around the Anglican Church, St Mary Magdalene, and the Cricket Club, said to be one of the country's oldest. Alongside the transient daily commuters, there are families who go back centuries, would not think of dwelling anywhere else on earth, and regard even the neighbouring village of Send, three miles away, as pitiably alien and backward. At Send, so they say in Ripley, somebody once tried to shoe a horse while it was lying down. Any English village worthy of the name has a communal green space, usually in its centre and quite small, where the slow white ballet of cricket is staged in summer. Ripley's, however, is to be found on its easterly margin and deviates extravagantly from type. Ripley Green, where Clapton was born and grew up, comprises 67.5 acres of open grassland with an expanse of woods and undergrowth known locally as the Fuzzies. As well as parochial sports and celebrations, it has always been a venue for events that attract crowds from miles around, notably Guy Fawkes Night on 5th of November, featuring a mountainous bonfire the crowning of a bonfire night queen, a parade and a funfair. Clapton's childhood home was number one, the green. The corner house in a terrace of four facing directly onto that wide communal meadow. Built in the 1890s, it was a modest two-up, two-down, originally rented to local farm workers or craftsmen. But the fans who journeyed here from all over the world will look in vain for number one nor is there any commemorative plaque to help them. When his grandmother moved out in the late 1960s, numbers one and two were both bought by Ripley resident Keith Best, with whom he attended both primary and secondary school. Best knocked the two houses into one, installing a bathroom, a luxury the young Eric never enjoyed, and calling the result Fairview. It's also the brand name of a home glass engraving business run by Best's wife, Sheila. Coincidentally, stained glass designer is the only job description other than musician that Clapton ever had. Like those of the ancient oaks at its margin, his roots in the green still run deep. His oldest friend, Guy Pullen, the cricket club's longtime president, still lives there, in the same cottage as during their childhood, and like many older Ripleyites, refers to him not as Eric, but Rick. The two are still as close as they ever were. Pullen, a frequent visitor to Hurtwood Edge, Clapton's home at Ewhurst, and guest on his yacht. Behind the kitchen door hangs a parker of evidently superior downiness. That was from Rick. He always gives me lovely presents. A couple of Christmases ago, he gave me a new knee. I haven't had it done yet. He's a permanent vice president of the cricket club whose green and white clubhouse juts onto the green near the Talbot Hotel. The team's scorekeeper, Jenny Cliff, also chair of the parish council, was at primary school with Clapton, and her grandparents lived at one of the green before his did. For many years, he regularly played in celebrity charity matches, bringing along fellow rock biz enthusiasts like Rolling Stone Bill Wyman. In the end, security became too difficult, the club having no VIP enclosure. But we send him a fixture card at the start of every season, Jenny says. 
he still pays Ripley frequent incognito visits. Despite not having touched alcohol for more than 30 years, he's sometimes seen at the ship, the pub where he and his teenage friends love to eavesdrop on the village characters as they play dominoes and told stories. He knows that whenever he comes back here, he can just walk around the streets or go into a pub, says Guy Pullen. No one will ever bother him. Off the green, his closest ties are with St Mary Magdalene Church on the High Street. He attended its C of E, Church of England Primary School, which used to be next door, and its Sunday school. Its vicar, the Reverend Chris Elson, conducted the funerals of Clapton's grandmother Rose and mother Pat, married him to his second wife, Melia, and baptised two of his daughters by different mothers at the same ceremony. Black-bearded Reverend Elson also officiated on the day in 1991 when the coffin of four-year-old Connor Clapton was lowered into the ground and Ripley suffered its first incursion by ravening paparazzi. It's a measure of Clapton's love for the place that after that horrific accident in New York, he couldn't conceive of his only sons being laid to rest anywhere but here. In contrast with the ancient weathered headstones, a small, pure white lozenge nestles close to the church, flanked by pots of flowers, with a row of decorated pebbles in front. The inscription, in letters so fine as to be barely legible, reads, Connor Clapton, 1986 to 1991. Beloved son, sweet child of infinite beauty, you will live in our hearts forever. To supplement the church's groundsman, a gardener from Hurtwood Edge comes over regularly to cut the surrounding grass and keep the path tidy. After Connor's funeral, St Mary's churchyard was closed to any further interments, but Clapton has space booked in the adjacent parish burial ground. There's no real barrier between them, the vicar says. In 1944... Mr. Jelly's Blacksmith Forge stood on the corner site that one day would be occupied by Ripley Guitars. The village then seemed more like a small town, with three bakeries, a cinema, an abattoir, a telephone exchange and a police station. The traffic passing through the high street consisted largely of military trucks, whose khaki-clad personnel wore shoulder flashes saying Canada. This part of Surrey was the marshalling area for Canadian forces waiting to join the Allied invasion of Nazi-occupied Europe on 6th of June. Around the time of D-Day, 15-year-old Patricia Clapton from Ripley Green became pregnant by a 24-year-old Canadian serviceman named Edward Fryer, whom she'd met at a dance a few weeks earlier. Fryer refused to accept responsibility. There seemed no way to coerce him, and soon afterwards he faded from Pat's life, never to reappear. On 30th of March 1945, she gave birth to a son in the back bedroom of her mother's house, one the Green, attended only by the local midwife, whose first act was to wrap the baby in brown paper to keep him warm. He was given Pat's surname and baptised Eric Patrick. The story he would grow up with was that his father had been an airman with a wife back home in Canada, but actually Montreal-born Friar was a soldier and unmarried. Before the war, he'd been a musician, playing piano in clubs and bars, which he continued to do while on active service, hence his appeal for jazz-loving Pat. He'd also been a talented painter, though seemingly never turned it to any account. For a time, it was thought he might have joined the later waves of Canadians into France, but military records show he stayed on in Britain until 1946, receiving a dishonourable discharge for going AWOL just as his unit was about to return home. At a time when southern England teemed with soldiery from all over the world, thousands of young women had found themselves in Pat's predicament. But to be an unmarried mother remained the ultimate social stigma, especially one so young. She and her baby continued to live with her mother Rose, both painfully conscious of their disgrace in the village's eyes. Although the war was over, many Canadians remained in the district, and in 1947, Pat met a second soldier, Frank MacDonald, who proved altogether more stable and reliable than the elusive friar. They fell in love, and when MacDonald's tour of duty ended, he asked her to return home with him and get married. 
As amiable as Mac was, he balked at taking on another man's child, born out of wedlock. So, Pat had to choose between them. For an 18-year-old, offered a new life in a country with living standards far superior to grim post-war Britons, it was not such a hard choice. She departed for Canada, leaving Eric with his grandmother. Rose was a tiny, dark-haired, vivacious woman from one of Ripley's oldest clans, the Mitchells, one of nine sisters and two brothers. In her twenties, she had married Pat's father, Reginald, a.k.a. Rex, Clapton, the Oxford-educated son of an army officer, and thus well above her in the social scale. When Rex Clapton died of tuberculosis in 1932, she had despaired of finding another husband, for a botched surgical operation on her palate when she was 30 had made a scar like a deep crease below her left cheekbone. Nonetheless, in 1942 she had remarried to a local plasterer, four years her junior, with the oddly similar surname of Clapp. Pat was assumed to have gone for good, so the couple adopted two-year-old Eric in everything but name. To spare him the knowledge of his abandonment, they decided he should grow up believing Rose was his mother. It was not so implausible, for she was still only in her late thirties, and many of her contemporaries in the village had children just as young. Tall, dark, bushy-browed Jack Clapp was an old-school craftsman who seemed to live in paint-spattered overalls and smelt of sawdust, putty, and the pungent black beauty tobacco he rolled into his cigarettes. Despite appearances, he was a tender-hearted, romantic man who kissed his tiny wife in public as passionately as if they were still teenagers. Jack had never had children and felt some initial reluctance to try parenting this late in life for fear that it might intrude on his relationship with Rose, but he couldn't have been more loving to the toddler who'd suddenly changed from his step-grandson into his stepson. The small two-bedroom corner house which Jack rented from Ripley's Noakes family was crowded to its limits. Also in residence was Rose's other child by Rex Clapton, a teenage son named Adrian, but always known as Sonny, who had the second bedroom to himself. Eric slept on a camp bed in Rose and Jack's room or downstairs in the sitting room. The house had no electricity, only gas lamps, no bathroom and an outside toilet. Rose would wash him at the kitchen sink or sponge him down in a tin bath in front of the coal fire. When Jack's sister Audrey acquired one of the flats on the village's new estate, he would go there for a proper bath every Sunday. A master carpenter and bricklayer, as well as a plasterer, Jack always earned a good steady wage, which Rose supplemented by shifts at the village telephone exchange, cleaning houses, or working on the bottling line at Stansfield's Fizzy Drinks Factory in Newark Lane, only yards from her home and they both spoiled Eric more like grandparents than the mum and dad they were supposed to be. He had a huge number of toys, both shop-bought or painstakingly homemade by Jack. Rose got him all the weekly comic books he wanted, and, sugar still being rationed, gave him her weekly sweets allowance, even spreading granulated sugar on his bread and butter. She bought him special delicacies, for example canned mock turtle soup, costing considerably more than regular tomato or vegetable. She humoured the pernicketiness he showed even as a toddler when he'd refused to eat his breakfast cereal unless the milk was poured over it from a certain angle. Everything had been set up to give him the happy childhood his unwanted, inconvenient birth had never promised. Unfortunately, no one had bargained for his being unusually sensitive and observant, from the age of six or seven, he felt he was different from other children, and that his pampering represented some kind of atonement for it. The house was always full of relatives, for Rose was famously hospitable, especially at the Sunday high teas she served in her tiny living room. When the grown-ups talked, Rick was often the subject. The current question, have you heard from his mum lately, would float down to him as he played on the floor, and sometimes he overheard his supposed big brother Adrian jocularly refer to him as a little bastard. Finally, he wormed the truth out of Rose, that his real mother had left him, gone to Canada, and married a man with whom she'd since had two more children. That shattering discovery revealed his whole world to be full of deceptions. Not only was Rose his grandmother, but Adrian was really his uncle, 
His aunts were his great-aunts, and Rose's father, living round the corner in Newark Lane, wasn't his grandfather, but great-grandfather. Patty Boyd believes that moment determined his character until his mid-forties. He became the wounded child. From then on, everybody around him seemed to feel an obligation to take care of him and prop him up. His family, then managers, other musicians like Pete Townsend, girlfriends like poor Alice Ormsby Gore, who had to drive up to London and score his heroin for him. There was always someone to shield him from anything unpleasant, like taking a driving test or getting rid of a musician in the band that he didn't like. When we got married in America and he had to take a blood test, he didn't even have to do that. One of the roadies took it for him. He never hit the ground, never grazed his knees, never bumped into life. As little kids, Rick and I virtually lived in each other's houses, Guy Pullen recalls. They were only six doors apart and Guy's mother, Marguerite, known as Peg, was a friend of Rose's and equally small and busy. The two boys started at Ripley Church of England Primary School at the same time and were seated next to each other. The thing I remember about Rick was the brown ring he always seemed to have around his mouth. It was from that mock turtle soup Rose used to buy for him. Guy was impressed by all his toys. Fleets of metal dinky cars, numerous board games, a Hornby clockwork train set, a spectacular medieval knight sword and shield jack clapper beaten out of metal. Like other local children, Guy had always thought the paint-spattered beetle-browed plasterer rather scary, but at home Clap was very docile, happy to let Rose stuff their charge with sugar and buy him whatever new plaything took his fancy. Like most small boys of that era, Guy knew to expect a wallop from his father if he misbehaved. No such sanctions applied at one the green. Jack was a hard man, very firm, but I never once saw him lay a finger on Rick. At school, he was for the most part a shy, retiring character, adept at none of the sports at the centre of village life, as Guy was. I was always into my football and cricket, but Rick was no good at either of them though he loved watching. Whenever we'd pick up sides for a game, he was always the last one to get chosen. He has since recalled how much he disliked competing and always sought to be anonymous. I hated anything which would single me out and get me unwanted attention, he was to write in his autobiography. Even so, he and Guy Pullen were often in trouble with the headmaster, Mr Dixon, whose hearing aid emitted a piercing whistle for giggling and making jokes behind their teachers' backs. We had the same silly sense of humour, Pullen says. Still do today. In the music class, taken by Mr Dixon's sister, Mrs Lewis, he got no further than playing tinny tunes on a recorder, once winning a prize for his rendering of green sleeves. The only definite talent he seemed to possess, emulating the Canadian father he'd never known, was for drawing and painting. Outside school... He and Guy went around in a big group of boys, mostly from houses along the green, including the slightly younger Stuart Shoesmith and Gordon Perrin, both likewise destined to remain his friends for life. In those days, in a place like Ripley, children could disappear for hours without causing their families a moment's anxiety. Their main haunt was the Fuzzies, the belt of woodland beyond the green, where they could climb trees, construct dens and play cowboys and Indians. English and Germans, or English and Japs, perpetuating the hostilities of the recent World War, all blissfully free from adult interference. On the nearby River Way, under the tutelage of an older boy named Ivor Powell, Rick discovered what would be an enduring passion for fishing. When he returned home excitedly after their first outing, Rose immediately ordered him his own rod from a catalogue. The Green determined the village calendar, from summertime cricket to the huge Guy Fawkes celebration on 5th of November. Guy Pullen's father, Fred, a psychiatric nurse, had helped to originate the event and been responsible for bringing Tom Benson's funfair to add to its parade and the crowning of its bonfire night queen. Benson's formidable wife personally controlled the bumper cars, directing customers to just vacated vehicles with a shout of, One more car! One more rider! One day, when Rick was a superstar beyond computation, 
he would nostalgically title a double live album after Mrs. Benson's catchphrase. Ripley's de facto Lord of the Manor was the insurance magnate and pioneer aviator Charles Houston, whose Georgian mansion, Dunsborough Hall, adjoined the green where he was often to be seen riding on a white horse until he was well into his eighties. Houston was married to the film and stage actress Florence Desmond, and their legendary helicopter parties flew in celebrities from the Duke of Edinburgh and the ballerina Margot Fontaine to Marlena Dietrich and Elizabeth Taylor. As president of the cricket club, Houston often brought his guests to watch matches, sometimes even take part. One day, Guy and Rick spotted Tyrone Power, a huge Hollywood star for films like King of the Kyber Rifles, and they both managed to get his autograph. The pair cemented their friendship as comprehensively incompetent members of the first Ripley Boy Scouts. We were terrible scouts, Pullen recalls. The absolute despair of our scoutmaster, Stu Pace. I can still picture him, when we were trying and failing to put our tent up, gritting his teeth and going, Stone the crows! Once, we were supposed to read a map to get to his house about four miles away. It took us four and a half hours and that included thumbing a lift part of the way. Then we camped in his garden, where he had a real Native American totem pole. We nicknamed it Jeffrey. The scouting ethos of honour and fair play had little effect. As they grew older, they and their little gang became, in Pullen's words, the rogues of the village. Much of their time was spent at Ripley's cinema, converted from the old village hall and popularly known as the Bug Hutch watching British black-and-white war films starring Jack Hawkins and Michael Redgrave and American comedy shorts with the Three Stooges or the Bowery Boys. The projectionist would set the main film running, then retire to the anchor pub across the road, for which he'd have to be fetched if it broke down, as it often did. You got in by buying a card, which had no name or serial number on it. Two of us would buy cards, then go into the loo and pass them out to our friends through the window. You could do that any number of times. There was also petty larceny from the village sweet shop, kept by an elderly and short-sighted woman named Miss Farr. They would crowd into Miss Farr's, ask for something that made her turn her back, then grab handfuls of sherbet lemons or flying saucers and bolt. Rick usually went for Ovaltine or Horlicks tablets, solid versions of the bedtime drinks which he'd later identify as his very first addiction. Ripley's police station had a permanent strength of three or four under the popular Sergeant Locke, whose son also attended St. Mary's C of E primary. For minor juvenile offences, like scrumping apples from Dunsborough House's orchards or illegal entry of the bug hutch, the penalty from Lockie and his fellow officers was often no more than a clip round the ear with the full approval of the offender's parents. But, setting a lifelong pattern, Rick was never busted for anything. Sometimes he and his friends would just sit inside the bus shelter in the high street, watching the traffic to and from Portsmouth endlessly crawl by, hoping to spot something flash like a Ferrari. Little did he dream that one day he'd own fleets of them. He felt no qualms about singing in those days. At the Christmas family gathering, when everyone was expected to do some kind of turn, Rose would stand him in the sitting room's bay window, pull the curtains behind him, and he'd give them I Belong to Glasgow, Will Fife's music hall song about a Scottish drunk. I belong to Glasgow, dear old Glasgow town, but there's something the matter with Glasgow, because it's going round and round. Rose had a strong musical streak. In his early years, the furniture at One the Green included a harmonium on which he'd pump out hymns, and sentimental songs like Gracie Field's Now Is The Hour and Joseph Locke's Bless This House. Her son Adrian, Rick's former stepbrother, now uncle, played chromatic harmonica, owned the best record collection in Ripley, and danced the jitterbug with an abandon that made his brill cream flattened hair fly around in every direction. Adrian possessed what would later emerge as the Clapton addictive gene, though in his case he was hooked only on vinegar, which he sloshed over everything he ate, puddings included. I used to tell him, every bottle of sarsens ought to have your name on it, his widow Sylvia recalls. 
The nearest to a real musician in the family was Rose's father, Jack Mitchell, a huge man who'd formerly been a threshing contractor to local corn farmers and owned a traction engine that always featured prominently in Ripley's festivities. Mitchell played accordion and violin, and at summer fates on the green would perform with a local busker named Jack Townsend on guitar, violin and spoons. Rick thought he'd like to play the violin like his new great-grandfather, so Rose immediately got him one. But the curmudgeonly Mitchell, who was usually quite drunk, offered no help or encouragement, and his attempts to learn simply by copying soon petered out. With another stringed instrument, later, it would be a different story. As Rick grew older, Ripley seemed to be full of music, albeit largely confined to pubs whose thresholds he and his friends were forbidden to cross. At the ex-servicemen's British Legion Club in particular, Saturday nights always featured a succession of amateur vocalists, like the ebullient Sid Perrin, uncle of his friend Gordon, who specialised in Mario Lanza songs, like Because You're Mine and Cara Mia. Rose herself took a leading part in the entertainments that the ladies' section put on, assuming the roles of gypsies or mustachioed pirates with gusto. Three doors along from Jack and Rose's lived a man named Buller Collier, who liked to play his piano accordion outside his front door on summer evenings. Rick would eavesdrop on the recital, more fascinated by Buller's accordion than any music it made. It was red and black, he would recall, and it shimmered. At home, music poured more or less continuously from the family's one and only radio, then known as the wireless, provided solely by the BBC's light programme and mostly performed live by an immense range of in-house orchestras and bands. One of the very few concessions to recorded music was Children's Favourites, a request programme broadcast on Saturday mornings and hosted by Uncle Mac, in reality the BBC's head of children's broadcasting, a one-legged Great War veteran named Derek McCulloch. Every week, Rick would sit waiting for the nine o'clock pips, presaging an hour of seemingly infantile choices like the runaway train or Nelly the elephant. Then, one Saturday, some little clever dick sent in a request for Whoop in the Blues by Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee. The BBC had a long list of band songs and strictures about good taste, which kept just about the whole blues catalogue from the adult airwaves. But Uncle Mac, thinking this was a comedy number, played it without demur. So the boy in Ripley was introduced to the blues through one of its most captivating duets, a madcap mixture of chugging harmonica and exuberant falsetto whoops. It cut through me like a knife he would remember. After that, I never miss children's favourites just in case it came on again. As would soon become apparent, his was the last generation of Britain's young to grow up in a Garden of Eden. The notion that children should receive sex education before reaching puberty was still far in the future. The only sexual titillation he and his friends experienced were the well-covered bathing beauties in Reve or Titbits magazines. Their only glimpse of nudity was in the naturist's journal Health and Efficiency, whose seemingly clinical name carried a massive erotic charge. One day, playing alone on the green, he came upon a piece of real pornography, a homemade book whose stapled together pages had drawings of male and female genitalia. It was his first inkling there was any difference between them. He had recently discovered that Shag, could mean something other than the coarse tobacco smoked by workmen like Jack Clapp. So when a new girl joined his school class and was put at a desk in front of him, he casually asked her, Do you feel like a shag? An almighty row resulted. He was made to apologise to the victim and, by his later account, given six of the best by the headmaster, Mr Dixon. Though Guy Pullen has no recollection of Dixon ever using corporal punishment. From that point on, the future rock god would claim in his memoirs, I tended to associate sex with punishment, shame and embarrassment, feelings which coloured my sexual life for years. In June 
26-year-old Queen Elizabeth II ascended the British throne and Ripley celebrated with its usual gusto. An amateur colour film records the procession of decorated floats along the high street on Coronation Day, with toddlers dressed as beef eaters and big strong men dressed as hula hula girls, and the multiple festivities on the green. Eight-year-old Rick is there somewhere with Guy, Stuart and Scratcher in their short flannel trousers and porous cotton shirts. On the open-air stage, Mrs. Lewis, the primary school's music teacher, clad in an old raincoat, her wisps of grey hair floating in the breeze, thumps an upright piano as her pupils perform traditional country dances, bowing and curtsying to each other and skip around a maypole. Never again would English childhood have such innocence. 2. Pat In 1954, when Rick was nine, his mother suddenly re-entered his life, thereby doing infinitely more damage than she ever had by walking out of it. After seven years in Canada, the woman now called Pat MacDonald felt an urge to see the toddler she'd left behind in Ripley in 1947. Her husband Frank, who was still serving in the Canadian military, did not accompany her, but she brought along the two children they'd since had together, six-year-old Brian and one-year-old Cheryl. Transatlantic air travel then was only for the very rich, and Pat and the children made the journey by sea. When her ship arrived at Southampton, Rick was waiting on the dockside with Rose and Jack. He had no clear memory of her from his babyhood, so for him it was a 25-year-old stranger who came down the gangway. He later recalled that she seemed glamorous and charismatic, with her auburn hair piled up high in the fashion of the day. But he presciently felt a coldness in her looks, a sharpness. By now, he was well aware that she was his mother. However, to forestall any resurgence of gossip about his birth out of wedlock, his family had reverted to the story that she was his grown-up sister. He went along with it for the moment, certain in his own mind that at long last she'd return to claim him. He imagined her gathering him into an embrace that would blow away the clouds of mystery, shame and deception, and lead to some indeterminate golden future together. But nothing of the sort happened when he met her off the boat, nor at the grand family reunion back in Ripley. The occasion was all about the gifts Frank MacDonald had sent following a recent tour of duty in Korea, lacquered boxes and silk dressing gowns embroidered with dragons, somewhat incongruous in a house with no bathroom and a toilet in the garden. Finally plucking up his courage, he went up to Pat and asked, "'Can I call you Mummy now?' She replied that after all Rose and Jack had done for him, he'd better go on calling them Mum and Dad and pretending she was his sister. The coolness in her manner shocked even her own mother." as it did her new sister-in-law, Adrian's wife, Sylvia. I couldn't believe anyone could be so nasty to a child, Sylvia would recall. To make matters worse, he found he'd lost his accustomed place as the centre of attention. Now, everybody was all over his stepbrother Brian and stepsister Cheryl. Indeed, the whole of Ripley regarded them as stars with their Canadian accents and exotic-looking clothes and all the time he had to listen to both of them calling Pat Mommy. At one heartbreaking moment, she heard him tell Brian, whom he'd also been told not to call his brother, You see that lady over there in that bed? She's my mummy too. Any child psychologist, had there been one in mid-1950s rural Surrey, and had that era's working-class Britons held with such things, could have predicted the outcome. He became moody, and fractious, even turning on his beloved Rose. His revenge on Pat was refusing to make a playmate of six-year-old Brian, who had been temporarily enrolled at his school. Among his relations, only Jack Clapp's sister, Audrey, seemed able to get through to him and came to the house every week especially to see him, bringing him sweets and still more toys. In the end, Pat stayed for the best part of a year every day bringing her son reminders of the new distance she had put between them 
and his obligation to lie about their relationship. She was highly gregarious, fond of music, especially the big bands of Benny Goodman and Harry James, and of what the polite phraseology of that time called a tipple. As the months passed, she seemed less absorbed with her family than reconnecting with the friends she'd had as a teenager and drinking with them in one or other of Ripley's five pubs. In particular, she saw a lot of Sid Perrin, the bachelor uncle of Rick's friend Gordon Perrin, with whom she'd had a teenage romance. Local opinion was that the extrovert Sid, with his Saturday night Mario Lancer impressions at the British Legion Club, might have been the man for her all along. Towards the end of her visit, the rows between her and her disappointed son became increasingly bitter. She had decided he was a loner, a serious flaw in her book. One day, after an extended screaming match, he stormed out of the house onto the green, shouting, I wish you'd never come here! I wish you'd go away! This emotional turmoil could not have come at a worse moment. Soon after Pat's return to Canada, he took his 11+. plus. The state examination that sorted children into successes or failures at the age of 11, sending the brightest to high-quality grammar schools and the others to avowedly inferior secondary modern ones. Distracted and destabilized as he was, he failed the exam miserably, and so, instead of Woking or Guildford Grammar School, was relegated to St. Bede's secondary modern in Ripley's twin village of Send. The only consolation was that Guy Pullen and several more of his cronies from the Green accompanied him there. Despite its monastic sound, St. Bede's was a tough co-ed establishment whose headmaster, Bill Short, kept order through the liberal use of corporal punishment. He was a Geordie, one-time captain of Gateshead Football Club, a real hard man, Pullen remembers. He always wore shoes with steel caps. Anyone who got sent out of class and heard short steel cap shoes on the stone floor knew they were in for a slippering. You got hit with a gym shoe that he sent you to the changing room to fetch, and you got in more trouble if you didn't bring one that was big enough. Under the stimulus of St. Bede's, he and Eric and his fellow Ripley rogues became borderline juvenile delinquents. From pilfering Horlicks tablets at Old Miss Farr's sweet shop, they graduated to more ambitious shoplifting in Woking or Cobham. A favourite pastime was vandalising the trains that chugged slowly around Surrey's numerous branch lines. The carriages had no corridors, allowing upholstery to be ripped up and mirrors smashed without fear of interruption. Now they were risking penalties far graver than a thick ear from a Ripley village bobby, yet still Rick always got away with it. At other times, he retreated into himself, wanting no company but the family dog a black Labrador named Prince. The artistic streak he'd inherited from his vanished father grew stronger. He took to drawing obsessively, eye-catchingly skilled cowboys or spacemen copied from his many comic books, or the curly-crusted wares of the hot pie vendor who periodically visited the green. Like many children who find the adult world unreliable, he created imaginary companions he could count on never to betray him. A pony named Bush Branch and an alter ego called Johnny Malingo, who was part Wild West outlaw, part gangster. In those days, such reckless, raffish role models were usually Johnny's, but never Eric's. He was a couple of years too young for Britain's first wave of guitar mania in 1956, when Elvis Presley employed one in the sexiest vocal act ever known and transformed the character of an instrument that had previously never raised its voice above a murmur. The rock and roll fan at One the Green was his uncle Adrian, now converted from big band jazz to Presley, Bill Haley, Little Richard and Fats Domino, and from tweed jackets and baggy flannel trousers to drape suits, string ties and sideburns. To Rick, it was just something else weird from America, which, all the newspapers insisted, would be forgotten six months from now. At St. Bede's, he'd got to know a boy named John Constantine, whose well-to-do parents lived on the outskirts of Ripley. The Constantines possessed a radiogram, 
a bulky wooden cabinet combining the functions of radio and gramophone. It was on this domestic showpiece that Rick first heard Hound Dog, its electric solo by Presley's guitarist Scotty Moore, a masterclass in less is more for every player who came after, all but smothered by lacquered walnut. Surprisingly, he was also untouched by the concurrent craze for skiffle, folk music harking back to America's Depression years, when people could afford no instruments beyond cheap guitars, kazoos, and box and broomstick basses, and the only percussion came from serrated washboards swept up and down by thimble-shod fingers. Whereas rock and roll, played by professional session musicians like Sun Records' Scotty Moore, was impossible to deconstruct, Skiffle was made up of simple one- and two-finger chords, which any beginner could instantly master. In the heyday of its only national star, Lonnie Donegan, from 1957 to 59, hundreds of British boys who'd never played or sung a note of music formed skiffle groups in imitation of Donegan's, received their first taste of performing in public, and discovered the guitar's magical effect on the female sex. But somehow, all of it passed Rick Clapton by. Among the other disruptive voices now blowing across the Atlantic, he responded most strongly to Buddy Holly, who recorded both as a soloist and with the Crickets, the prototype rock band. Holly's songs were excitingly guitar-driven, yet almost as easy to play as skiffle, while his geekish spectacles made him seem normal and comprehensible, where Presley was exotic and remote. The teenage Rick continued to have better toys than any of his friends. On his 13th birthday in 1958, Rose and Jack gave him a portable record player, a Danset Cub, costing nine guineas, about £9.45. The first single he bought was When by the Carlin Twins. The first album was The Chirping Crickets, fully revealing the vocal, instrumental and songwriting talents of Buddy Holly. That year, Holly and the Crickets made their only British tour, culminating in an appearance on ATV's Sunday Night at the London Palladium show. Rose and Jack didn't own a television set, so he had to watch it at the home of the affluent Constantine family. Holly was revealed to play a strange, flat object with a lever and a streamlined tuning head, the first Fender Stratocaster ever seen in Britain. To Rick, it was like an instrument from outer space. I thought to myself, that's the future. That's what I want. Then, in February 1959, Holly died in a plane crash while touring the snowbound American Midwest. For the many young British guitar learners whom he'd helped make the transition from skiffle to rock, John Lennon, Paul McCartney and George Harrison in Liverpool to name but three, it felt like the loss of a personal friend. Though Rick wasn't part of that fraternity, he still shared in the general shock and disbelief at the news. He had expected nothing from his secondary education, but to his surprise, the St. Bede's art teacher, Mr. Swain, praised his work and encouraged him to develop in new directions, like calligraphy. Those who'd failed the 11-plus had now been given a second chance to rise in the state education system by sitting a new exam called the 13-plus. Largely to repay Mr. Swain, Rick worked hard, passed his 13-plus, and won a place at Hollyfield School in Surbiton, 12 miles away. Hollyfield was a conventional secondary modern but unusual in having a large visual arts department, encompassing subjects like glass engraving and graphics, as well as drawing, painting and sculpture. Rick was enrolled on a three-year course with art as its main subject. Surbiton and its neighbouring towns of Kingston, Richmond and Twickenham make up the most prosperous stretch of the River Thames, a waterside conurbation of expensive homes, posh restaurants, upmarket shops and department stores, its broad flowing highway crossed by stately stone bridges and lined with luxurious cabin cruises. In the late 50s, it was still redolent of Victorian straw hats, parasols and Jerome K. Jerome's three men in a boat. At the same time, the many colleges and schools in the area gave it a buzzy, youthful atmosphere. 
After the countrified Insula Ripley, Rick found it all dizzyingly glamorous and grown up. Though he still had to wear a school uniform, maroon blazers for juniors, black ones for seniors, Hollyfield's arts pupils worked in a separate building from the purely academic ones and were given a much envied extra measure of freedom. On Saturdays, they attended classes at Kingston Art College, to which it was assumed many of them would eventually graduate. In response to his new sophisticated milieu, he dropped the pet name by which he'd been known since babyhood and introduced himself to everyone at Hollyfield as Eric. It was how he signed his contribution to the next edition of the school's classily designed magazine, a poem called Battle Cry, giving some hint of the turbulence and confusion inside him. Forward into battle, men, the cry rings loud and clear, and on the field a thousandfold are armed with sword and spear. The foe approach with cunning eye the blood of men to seek, but underneath the bright breastplate a heart beats humble and meek. The sword is drawn, the spirit roused, the charge is swift and harsh. Cold steel and iron clash one on one as men die upon the marsh. And now the fight is really on, and death is everywhere. But men who fight for glory's sake have neither fear nor care. The dark black marsh is stained with red, the men are growing few. The blades strike home, the spears are launched, the arrows swift and true. At last the fight is over, the enemy have fled. But many of the warriors lie on their black deathbed. Eric Clapton, Third Art By now, rock and roll seemed to have burnt itself out, as the media had predicted, and the older generation fervently hoped. Buddy Holly was dead, Elvis Presley had been shorn of his sideburns and joined the army, a series of scandals involving major American artists and bribe-taking disc jockeys apparently confirmed the power of the rogue beat to incite depravity and corruption. As a reaction against sleazy rockers, the fashion was for bland boy crooners, mostly named Bobby, marketed on looks rather than talent and aimed squarely at pubescent girls. The notion of musical heroes for young men seemed to have vanished. But not for Eric. Not since hearing Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee perform Whoop in the Blues on Uncle Mac's BBC radio show, I had recognised it immediately, he would recall. It was as if I was being reintroduced to something I already knew, maybe from another, earlier life. For me, there was something primitively soothing about this music. It went straight through to my nervous system, making me feel ten feet tall. Its name could be found throughout popular music when the mood was melancholy. Traditional jazz had St. Louis blues, Jelly Roll blues, Yellow Dog blues, Basin Street blues, and West End blues. Balladry had the birth of the blues, learning the blues, and blues in the night. Rock had appropriated its immemorial 12-bar three-chord structure. Britain's first rock and roll star, Tommy Steele, reached number one with Singing the Blues, followed by Knee Deep in the Blues. Skiffle, above all, had ransacked its repertoire, most notably that of Huddy Leadbutter, a.k.a. Leadbelly, while the king of Skiffle, Lonnie Donegan, had changed his first name from Anthony in homage to the bluesman Lonnie Johnson. Its creators were rather more elusive. They had been active mainly in the American South of the 1920s and 30s, and comparatively few had ever become famous outside it. For some... Music had been a sideline to menial work of various kinds. Others had been little more than beggars, performing for small change on street corners. It was out of their hard lives but uncrushable spirit that the blues had been born. A cry of despair which at the same time was comforting and life-affirming. As a consequence of endemic childhood disease and malnutrition, many had been blind. Indeed, the likes of Blind Lemon Jefferson... Blind Blake, Blind Boy Fuller, and Blind Willie Johnson constituted a kind of elite with their special understanding of suffering unbowed. 
Those fortunate enough to record commercially had done so for a segregated market, known demeaningly as race music, seldom receiving anything like proper recompense. Some of the greatest might have been lost to posterity altogether, but for an enlightened white man named Alan Lomax, who in the 1940s travelled thousands of miles through the South, recording them in their homes, in work gangs, sometimes even prisons, like a naturalist conserving some threatened species of fauna. In late 1950s Britain, they were to be found only in the loneliest aisles of specialist record shops, most often lumped together in cheaply packaged compilations. Brilliant, instinctive musicians who in their own time had not been known as African Americans, but Negroes, or worse, were dimly outlined in sepia, in their dusty suits or dungarees, holding ancient acoustic guitars that looked as malnourished as they did. Yet, collectively, they had reached out to a diffident, insecure white schoolboy in Ripley, Surrey. I felt through most of my youth that my back was against the wall, he would one day reflect. I felt the only way to survive that was with dignity, courage, and with pride. I heard that in certain forms of music. I heard it most of all in the blues, because it was always one man with his guitar versus the world. He had no option but to sing and play to ease his pain. Instead of cowboys and spacemen, he began to draw blues musicians, skilled pen portraits with as much care lavished on their instruments as on their faces. He also read everything he could about them, learning how many had come from a region not shown in his school geography book, the 7,000-square-mile delta region between the Mississippi and Yazoo rivers, the deepest deep south. From his cold-weather world of neatly trimmed hedges, red telephone kiosks, and green line buses, he envied their heat-soaked one of cotton fields, wood cabins, juke joints, and antique Coca-Cola signs. Knowing nothing as he did of the poverty and persecution from which only a lucky few had escaped, that seemed like paradise to me. Each morning, on the long uphill walk to Hollyfield School's art annex, he passed, and increasingly lingered outside, Bell's Music Shop. Bell's had formerly specialised in piano accordions, but, with the skiffle craze, had gone over to the instrument almost every British boy suddenly lusted after. Now, two years behind the pack, Eric found himself lusting after one too. The guitar he'd picked out in Bell's window was far from the most expensive there. A German-made Hoyer, like an acoustic Spanish model but with steel strings instead of gut or nylon ones, priced at only two pounds. As ever, his wish was Rose's command. But after he brought the Hoya home, it became progressively less thrilling. It was too large to hold comfortably in a standing position and had a gap between its fretboard and strings, making them hard to press down and painful as their steel bit into his virgin fingertips. He broke a string almost immediately, but not knowing how to change it, had to carry on with only five. He never had a formal teacher, even though Ripley's guitar-playing busker Jack Townsend could have shown him the basics. Instead, he sat listening to records and trying to copy their guitar playing by ear. The first was Harry Belafonte's quasi-spiritual Scarlet Ribbons, which he'd encountered in a more bluesy version by Josh White. The ever-indulgent Rose and Jack also bought him a small Grundig tape recorder on which he could hear himself playing along with his models and judge how close to them he sounded. Initially, he fantasized that his ungainly, steel-strung instrument might metamorphose him into an American-style rock-and-roll wild man, as much as it went against his innate dislike of attracting attention. One day, alone at home, he was kneeling on the sitting-room floor in front of a mirror, miming to a Gene Vincent record on his dancette cub, when one of his mates passed the house, looked in through the bay window, and saw him. The incredulous grin that spread over the mate's face and his own churning embarrassment almost made him give up then and there. Not every bluesman of the old school had fallen victim to blindness, disease, racism, alcoholism, and mendacious record companies. But in a few cases, 
had lived to a reasonable age and earned a decent living from their music. The most notable example was Big Bill Brunsey, who enjoyed a substantial following in Britain and throughout Europe and gave periodic concerts at London's Royal Albert Hall under the sponsorship of the traditional jazz band leader Humphrey Littleton. Brunsey died from throat cancer in 1958, before Eric could see him on stage, but a film clip of him shown later on grainy black and white TV proved as instructive as any one-to-one masterclass. The Big Bill had suggested some mountainous, ebullient character, but Brunsey, while admittedly very tall, was delicate of feature and wonderfully light of touch. He was playing a blues instrumental called Hey Hey, without a plectrum, his thumb beating a rhythm on the bass strings while his fingers flicked the treble ones in an ever-changing descant. With no means of visually recording it, Eric had to learn the technique in just a couple of minutes. Brunsey was his main man after that, his childhood friend Guy Pullen remembers. He'd listen to the riffs over and over again, copy and copy. Then he'd sit me down on the green, play them on that old guitar, and ask, Do I sound like the record? The answer was always, yes. 3. Troubadour At Hollyfield, He'd expected to be an outsider for prizing ancient sepia bluesmen so far beyond shiny new pop sensations like Cliff Richard and The Shadows, even though they used a Fender Stratocaster imported by Richard directly from its American makers. Instead, he found classmates who not only shared his passion, but were often considerably more knowledgeable on the subject. One to whom he would owe a particular debt was Clive Bluchamp, in later years a well-known designer of stained glass and record album covers. Bluchamp set him off on a musical voyage of discovery that had as much to do with modern American history and continuing racial prejudice and social justice. He learnt how some Delta bluesmen had joined the post-war mass migration of black people from the impoverished rural South to northern cities where work was more plentiful and racism less naked. How? Under the stimulus of urban life, especially in Chicago, they had exchanged plaintive acoustic guitars for strident amplified ones, inventing rock and roll in all but name. How electric blues had still been stigmatized as race music and fenced off from white ears until the astute Chuck Berry changed its subject matter from sex to high schools and hot rods, though Berry was already past 30, so creating a formula acceptable across the racial divide. It was now that he first encountered three electrifying new names, suggesting respectively a pirate, a cut of meat, and the villain of Walt Disney's Three Little Pigs, John Lee Hooker, T-Bone Walker, and Howlin' Wolf, whose voices were steeped in sex as rock and roll never dared, and who didn't finger a guitar fretboard respectfully like he did, but reduced it to shivers with a sliding metal bar or broken bottleneck. He also discovered the undisputed king of the Chicago electric blues, Muddy Waters, raised in Mississippi as McKinley Morganfield, a supreme stylist whose versions of Willie Dixon's Hoochie Coochie Man and Preston Foster's Got My Mojo Working had no trace of mud, still less angst, but rather twinkled with benevolent self-mockery. Another milestone moment for Eric was reproducing Muddy's Honey Bee with its treble three-string riff like a glimpse of Hawaiian grass skirts and lays. At the opposite extreme was Jimmy Reed, a sometime worker at the Armour Meatpacking Plant, whose voice held a built-in sneer where Muddy's did a chuckle and whose lion's share of life's misfortunes included periods of epilepsy. Eric listened to Reed's Bright Lights Big City and Big Boss Man, played along with them, and finally played them so many times that they became part of my metabolism. And now this wasn't just boys' stuff. Many of Hollyfield's female students sported the beatnik look that had just arrived simultaneously from America and super chic France, as well as shapeless black clothes, long hair, heavy eye makeup and somber talk of Sartre and existentialism, 
Being a beatnik at demanded a contrarian approach to everything, music above all. So here were girls who didn't scream for Cliff, but hearkened to Muddy or Howling Wolf just as reverentially as he did. In such surroundings, a passably good-looking 13-year-old with a guitar ought to have had the time of his life, but the business with Pat had left him horribly uncomfortable with any woman outside his family circle, bereft of self-confidence and terrified of suffering another such rejection. Though he had continual wild crushes on girls, he shrank from getting too close to any particular one. Though his libido was healthily hyperactive, he found the thought of actual sex terrifying. In his first term, he began dating a fellow pupil named Diane Coleman, who lived in Kingston. He later described it as a short but intense little fling, for all that their dates usually consisted of playing records in the sitting room of Diane's house. He saw himself now as a troubadour or wandering minstrel, as so many Delta blues men had been, to say nothing of his unknown father, Edward Fryer, playing piano around Montreal clubs and bars before the Second World War. His debut, he decided, would be at a coffee bar named L'Auberge, a popular student hangout at the bottom of Richmond Hill. Rather than fix it with the management in advance, he planned just to turn up with his admiring beatnik girl, Diane, in tow, then suddenly get to his feet and start playing. To take the weight of the Hoyer, he threaded a string around it and in a vaguely medieval touch, printed Lord Eric in ballpoint pen on his face. Three times he and Diane acted out their entrance into L'Auberge, but always at the moment he was supposed to burst into minstrelsy, his nerve failed and he stayed rooted to his seat. The relationship with Diane ended, as he would later put it, when sex reared its head, and he began a less demanding one with Sue Cullen, another Hollyfielder, a year his junior. Sue was a beatnik with ribbons, often adding a black tarantella skirt, purloined from her mother, to her regulation black duffel coat, sloppy jumper, tights and pixie boots. She lived in Richmond, and again for Eric, a typical date would be going to the girl's home to listen to records, usually with her mother in earshot. Sue was seriously into the blues and had managed to find a record of Blind Lemon Jefferson's Black Snake Moan, a piece of blatant sexual imagery dating from the 1920s. Both of us would lie on the floor, but not for anything naughty, she recalls. We were trying to get as close as possible to the record player to catch all the words. He also took her home to Ripley to meet Rose, whom she found very welcoming but a bit formal. I remember Eric telling me what had happened with his mother, how she'd gone away when he was nine, then come back and gone away again. He was obviously still very pained about it. Despite his new bohemian life, he still followed the Ripley calendar, which in winter meant regularly joining the beaters on local pheasant shoots. He often said he was going out beating next weekend, but I had no idea what he meant. Blues music may have been his obsession but it was by no means the only one. Anything that caught his interest tended to become an obsession. Clothes had been one since he was 11 or 12, the time when British adolescents first took to wearing jeans. While his friends had been content with regular blue denim, he insisted on black, with three rows of green stitching down the side seams. There had to be three, and only green would do. At Hollyfield, as Sue Cullen recalls, he became a beatnik, but one as meticulous over his khaki combat jacket, band the bomb t-shirts and slip-on moccasins as a guardsman over a dress uniform. At the same time, he was infatuated with the traditional English bespoke tailoring of London Savile Row, which only the very wealthy, like Ripley's squire, Charlie Houston, and his helicopter-born house guests, could afford. If he couldn't yet aspire to city gent suit, he could at least simulate shirts which had stiff white collars but were otherwise dark coloured or striped. Every new shirt he bought, I had to take its collar off and sew on a white one, Rose would recall. David Holt lived in Clandon, a small village a couple of miles from Ripley. He'd been in the class below Eric 
at St. Bede's and arrived at Holyfield a year after him. Having previously been not that friendly, they now discovered a bond. Eric and I wore the same clothes size, medium, so he'd borrow mine and I'd borrow his. Not things like suits. I don't think either of us possessed such a thing in those days, mainly jumpers and cardigans. As modest as Eric's home was, it seemed luxurious compared with David's. His place had a toilet in the back garden, but at least it was one you could flush. At our house, we just had an Elson chemical toilet that a truck came and emptied every Tuesday. I remember him being totally spoilt by his grandmother. She was working at the soft drinks factory behind the house, so their little kitchen was always full of lemonade, cream soda and cola in cans, which was still quite a rarity. Eric was never made to do anything he didn't want to. Even basic things like cleaning his teeth. He had quite black teeth in those days. David, too, was infatuated with guitars, but at the time possessed only a plastic toy one, a souvenir of Tommy Steele mania in 1957-58, whose shaming existence he kept secret from Eric. He was hugely impressed by the problematic Hoya, which he recalls as having Eric Clapton Troubadour, printed around it in large black letters. Eric had by now inherited the house's second bedroom, after his uncle Adrian left home to get married. Here, David Holt watched various other obsessions come and go. We'd seen the film The Magnificent Seven, and Eric loved the scene when James Coburn throws the knife. So he bought himself a knife and used to practice throwing it in his room, using the door as a target. And he'd put on clothes as close as he could to the ones Coburn had worn. He also got heavily into cycling, there was a special racing bike called a Gerard you could get by mail order which came in a kit and you had to assemble yourself. Eric had one of those and he got cycling shorts and all the other proper kit. He even shaved his legs because that was what cycling champions did. Eric had long been seeking a better guitar but nothing else in Bell's window display was in his, or rather, his grandmother's price range. Then one Saturday in a Kingston flea market he happened on a treasure. It was another Spanish-style acoustic model, but with a narrow rosewood body, like something a medieval troubadour might actually have used. In fact, it was American, made by the George Washburn Company of Chicago in the 1930s or 40s. Possibly, it had been left behind by some wartime GI, which might explain the image of a nude woman pasted on his back. All that mattered was that after the Hoya, it was a dream to play. Eric bought it by selling the Hoya to David Holt for almost five pounds, more than twice what Rose had paid. The flaws which had so irked him mattered little to David. It was way better than a plastic guitar with a picture of Tommy Steele. In the year below David's at Hollyfield were two other blues lovers and Tyro guitarists, Anthony Topham, known as Top, and Chris Dreha. Now, properly equipped, he started practicing with Topham and Dreha. Often I'd be in Ripley watching Eric. Then I'd cycle over to meet Top and Chris and show them what I'd learned from him. Though both David's new classmates were two years Eric's junior, he soon realized they were worth knowing. Top, in particular, was the son of a well-known painter, John Topham, a rare instance in their circle of an older person who appreciated the blues. Wartime service with Royal Navy had taken Topham Sr. to the American South, and he'd visited New Orleans where jazz and blues were all but inseparable. He'd passed on the interest to his son, who owned an impressive collection of records by Slim Harpo, Tampa Red, Lonnie Johnson and others. Many on ancient breakable shellac discs with labels like Vocalion and OK. Eric often used to come to our house in Norberton on Saturdays, Top recalls. We'd listen to records, then my mum would make him lunch. He wasn't an easy person. On some days, he could be absolutely charming, and on others, absolutely foul, moody, with an unkindness about him. My grandmother had bought me an acoustic guitar, and Eric was always incredibly rude about it, even though his wasn't much better but you could see what an extraordinary connection he had with the blues. It seemed to go directly to his soul because of some pain that was in him. In his final year at Hollyfield, 
Clive Bluechomp lent him an album which sparked the greatest obsession of all. It was titled King of the Delta Blues Singers and contained 16 tracks by Robert Johnson. Johnson is the most mysterious and mythologized figure in blues or any other music. When that album appeared, he had been dead for 23 years and no images or film footage of him were known to exist. Since then, only two still photographs have come to light. Other Delta bluesmen seem to have been born old and careworn, but Johnson is young, good-looking, brimming with vitality. One photo shows him in a snazzy three-piece suit and a hat worn at a rakish slant. In the other, he's in close-up, wearing a white shirt or sweater with a modern-looking roll collar, smoking a cigarette so fat that it could be a spliff. His fragmentary life story has him born in Hazelhurst, Mississippi in 1911 and raised around cotton plantations till only a few steps beyond slavery. The dazzling virtuosity on guitar he suddenly attained at an early age, having initially struggled with it every bit as much as his future disciple in Surrey, gave rise to popular music's darkest legend. The story goes that he was told to go to a certain crossroads at midnight. There he found the devil, who offered a Faustian bargain, genius as a blues man, in exchange for his soul. Most of his short life was spent as an itinerant musician, a troubadour, around Mississippi, Tennessee, and Arkansas. The only recordings he ever made were in Dallas, Texas in 1936 and 37, not even in a regular studio, but a hotel bedroom fitted with recording equipment. During the sessions, he sometimes preferred to face the wall, seeming evidence of his shyness and humility, though possibly the acoustics were better that way. He died in 1938, aged 27, after drinking whiskey, poisoned by the jealous husband of a woman he'd flirted with. In the future, similar musical prodigies such as Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, and Jim Morrison would be killed off at that same age by alcohol or drugs, making death at 27 almost a prerequisite of immortality. The King of the Delta Blues Singers album resurrected a revolutionary talent for which a soul mightn't have been so bad a trade. The voice had a raw intensity which plumbed the blues to its depths, while still retaining the buoyancy and impudence of youth. The lone, unamplified guitar had a modern electric sound, switching back and forth from complex treble riffs to a bass beat that was rock 20 years too soon. Where other blues singers in the recording studio simply regurgitated their street repertoire, Johnson's songs were structured and tailored to the three-minute length of an old 78 single. He had been a superstar stillborn. Like some Tibetan monk poring over an ancient scroll, Eric dedicated himself to the study of Johnson's technique on tracks like Kind-Hearted Woman Blues, Terraplane Blues, Walking Blues, Milk Cows Calf Blues, especially Crossroad Blues, a seeming reference to that diabolic midnight tryst. For him, their vocals were, and would always remain, the most powerful cry you can find in the human voice. With hindsight, a trainee Lama was very much what he considered himself. I realized that on some level, I had found the master, he would write in his autobiography, and that following this man's example would be my life's work. He shared the revelation with everyone he knew, and also, inadvertently, with a complete stranger, the next time he visited Top Topham's house, he decided to take the album with him. Waiting for the Norberton bus, he put it down on the pavement, then absent-mindedly boarded the bus without it. Before he'd gone very far, he realized what he'd done and raced back, but it had gone. Those three years at Hollyfield School proved transformative in other directions too. In 1961, age 16, he passed the state GCE examination in art at advanced level and English at ordinary level, the latter with a distinction, and was rewarded with a place at Kingston Art College, 
for a probationary one year. There is scarcely a major British rock star of the 1960s and 70s who did not spend some time at an art school or college, from John Lennon, Keith Richards, Pete Townsend, Ray Davies, Sid Barrett and Jimmy Page to David Bowie, Brian Ferry, Ian Jury and Freddie Mercury. All were broadly the same kind of working-class boy in whom obsession with guitars and rock and roll coexisted with strong aesthetic impulses, one day to come out in album cover and stage design, and a rebellious spirit that resisted formal learning of any kind. For others, art college was the place where they met vital future collaborators and honed their craft at student hops and in empty lecture rooms. But this was to be Eric's experience only in a roundabout way. At Kingston, the first musician he met had the dual distinction of being American and a woman. She was a folk singer named Gina Glazer, who did occasional nude modelling for the life-drawing class. She was as skilled an instrumentalist as any man he'd seen, playing fingerstyle guitar, five-string banjo, or dulcimer, while performing American Civil War songs like Pretty Peggio and Marble Town in a beautiful, clear voice. A single mother with a young child, Gina said little about her impressive musical pedigree back in the States. She'd been a part of the Greenwich Village folk revival that later fostered Bob Dylan and had made field trips to the Appalachian Mountains, collecting folk songs much as earlier oral conservationists had collected the blues. Eric was smitten, always to be his word for his instantaneous crushes, by Gina's gamine, crop-haired look, while her willingness to take off her clothes, even if only for artistic purposes, had an exciting whiff of nude mags like razzle and health and efficiency. He thought she might be attracted to him too, but her much greater age, she was in her late twenties, inhibited him from trying anything. He became everything he thought an artist should be, wearing a stripy scarf, cultivating the requisite italic handwriting, developing an interest in continental and Japanese cinema, reading authors like Baudelaire and Kerouac. But rather than in college, he practiced his growing guitar skills around Kingston, at its main student pub, The Crown, in coffee bars where stage fright no longer paralyzed him, occasionally, just like a real troubadour, in the open air. He never joined any kind of band, preferring to play on his own or else jam with kindred spirits he met on Saturday nights at the Crown's open mic sessions. One whom he'd have special cause to remember, and not just for music, was Dutch Mills, a fellow Hollyfield alumnus who'd gone on to become an apprentice toolmaker but remained a passionate performer on the blues harmonica. There was no compromise with Eric, Mills recalls. He didn't want to learn to play the guitar. He wanted to own it, to be the best of the best. He'd worked out that he could fingerpick to the old blues classic Nobody Knows You When You're Down and Out, which was a favourite of Bessie Smith, and I'll never forget the night I egged him on to play it on the wall outside Old Saints Church, where a group of us often sat. When he played at the Crown, it was always alone with his George Washburn acoustic, tucked away in a corner next to the bar billiards table. From there he always noticed a certain superior-looking little clique, the boys in black leather jackets and the new elastic-sided Chelsea boots, the girls in tight-slit skirts and black stockings with headscarves pushed back on their bouffant hair and knotted high on their chins. He thought the latter seemed very exotic, very fast, very well-educated, but assumed they'd never want anything to do with a working-class boy like him. Then one night, during his set, he realised the group had stopped talking among themselves to listen, the chin-knotted headscarf girls especially, and realised what a social equaliser he held in his hands. It was the first sign I'd had of anything that was in my being that could garner some respect, he would remember, that made people stop and got their attention and admiration. Just over the threshold to the sixties, there was little sign of what was to come. In Britain, the hottest commercial sound was trad, a homogenised version of traditional or Dixieland jazz, 
It stars the beery jazz men that rock and roll had once threatened to obliterate. Now they enjoyed the sweetest revenge in their fancy dress of faux Victorian bowler hats and waistcoats or Confederate army uniforms. The guitar was driven into exile and the bleating banjo ruled. Trad found a special home on that stretch of the River Thames that was now Eric's main habitat. A few yards from the Twickenham shore lay the privately owned Eel Pie Island, accessed by a footbridge and dominated by an old hotel whose cavernous ballroom had been popular with fashionable boating folk during the 20s. Latterly, this had been used for weekly jazz sessions featuring top bands like Kenny Balls and Acker Bilks. On Friday nights, it seemed the whole juvenile population of the Thames Valley crossed the footbridge, paying a toll of four old pennies per head, not just to listen, but also dance the prancing, half-ironic beatnik step known as the stomp. Eric and Sue Cullen were no longer seeing each other. The cautious Sue decided he was becoming altogether too important to her when they were reading a fashion magazine one day and he couldn't stop looking at one of the models. It was Patty Boyd, she recalls. He kept admiring her and I felt this surge of jealousy. With a vague idea of hedging her bets, Sue allowed herself to be chatted up by another member of their circle at L'Auberge Coffee Bar. Though it never got as far as an actual date, Eric found out about it when he and the chatter-up separately arrived at L'Auberge when Sue was there. Afterwards, he was very upset and hurt, she remembers. No point, is there? he said. Casual though their relationship had been, the experience of chucking somebody was a revelation. For it showed that in his dealings with women, he needn't be the same passive victim who had borne his mother's rejection and neglect. I realised I was capable of doing exactly the same to the opposite sex, and worse than she ever did to me. He'd grown up in a village where life revolved around pubs, and popularity and personal charisma were synonymous with the consumption of alcohol. Ripley's celebrated Sid Perrin being the paramount example. So now he viewed drink, or rather drunkenness, as an essential part of courtship, either to impress girls to whom he was attracted or dull the pain or shame of being chucked. At college, he developed a mad crush on a stunning girl named Gail, the daughter of a local politician, who was both high class and pretty wild, a combination that increasingly fascinated him. He decided the way to win her was to get blind drunk, alternating ten pints of beer with gin and tonic, gin and orange, and rum and blackcurrant juice, and stopping just short of passing out. That summer, with three friends, including a potential girlfriend, he went to the annual jazz festival in the grounds of Bewley Abbey in Hampshire. At that time, only jazz-inspired festivals. On the way, they stopped off at a pub, where Eric got blind drunk in the way he believed made him irresistible to females, and at some point later, he passed out completely. When he awoke... He was lying in the woods where he and his friends were to have camped and found that they'd abandoned him. While unconscious, he had vomited over himself, which might have killed him if he'd ingested any and both urinated and defecated in his underpants. He had no money for his return train fare and got home only by persuading a kindly railway official to accept an IOU. The really insane thing, he would recall, was that I couldn't wait to do it all again. There's no telling how long he might have continued to guard his virginity, but for Dutch mills. To reward Dutch for having become an industrial apprentice rather than a blues musician, his parents allowed him to have regular parties at the family home in Kingston after the crown closed. A large, tipsy crowd always pitched up, and sometime after midnight, the lights went out and a sexual free-for-all would begin. At one such moment... Eric found himself paired with a girl named Lucy, whose regular boyfriend was out of town, and found himself going all the way. As he would recall, he was terrified and fumbly. He hadn't thought to use contraception, so in case the experience should recur, hastened to equip himself with what in those days were not called condoms, but Durex, their most visible brand name, Johnny's, or FL's, French letters, 
Since they were available only from barbers' shops or chemists, whose counter staff were often female, their purchase was an ordeal for any 17-year-old. None more so than this one. Not long afterwards, he returned to the house with Dutch and two girls for a more private afternoon session. This time, as he fumbled, the sheath broke. His companion reacted with fury and disgust, and a couple of weeks later told him she thought she was pregnant and demanded money for an abortion. He could be forgiven for wondering if there was any more to sex than this cycle of embarrassment, humiliation and guilt. 4. Rooster to Engineer By 1962, trad was passé, and blues music was spreading through London's southwestern suburbs, as if the Thames had developed its own delta region, albeit one with cotton fields replaced by privet hedges, alligator-infested swamps by duck ponds, and juke joints by ancient low-ceilinged pubs, which no jukebox had yet defiled. The surge began in March, when Britain's only dedicated blues club opened in hitherto rather dull and stuffy Ealing. Its founder, Alexis Corner, had started out as a jazz banjo player, but during the late 1950s had converted to the guitar and formed the country's first dedicated blues band, Blues Incorporated. However, London jazz clubs still refused to acknowledge the music's legitimacy and considered Corner a traitor. Disillusioned by repeated rejections from key venues like the Marquee in Oxford Street, he had turned to Ealing in search of more open minds. The new club, situated under an ABC bakery, attracted a huge membership that was by no means limited to Ealing and adjoining river towns like Richmond, Kingston and Surbiton. It included two friends who were struggling to launch a band called Little Boy Blue and the Blue Boys in far-off Dartford, Kent. One was a student at the London School of Economics, Mick Jagger, the other a habitual malingerer at Sidcup Art College, Keith Richards. At the Ealing Club, they met Brian Jones from even further off Cheltenham, Gloucestershire, a multi-talented musician who could play slide guitar like Elmore James. Alexis Corner saw something in the non-guitarist of the trio, and Jagger became Blues Incorporated's first featured vocalist, singing in a way that no blues artiste ever had before. Corner was a generous-spirited man, and over the following weeks gave a similar chance to several other aspiring performers among his clientele. Blues Incorporated's fluid lineup came to include a pink-faced blonde beanpole known as Long John Baldry, an Oxford University undergraduate named Paul Pond, later Paul Jones of Manfred Mann, a former child skiffler named Jimmy Page, later of Led Zeppelin, a diminutive Scot who played upright bass named Jack Bruce, and an unruly red-haired drummer named Ginger Baker, both later of Cream. But for the present, Cream's future third member stayed in the audience, studying the technique of whichever guitarist was on stage, his capacious memory now stored the intros of dozens of blues songs, and he could tell which was coming from the very first note or chord. News of Corner's Ealing coup soon leaked back to Soho and showed the anti-blues marquee club what a revenue stream it was missing. As a result, Blues Incorporated began appearing regularly at the marquee, and in July 1962 were booked to appear on BBC Radio's Jazz Club programme. However, the BBC's fee would not stretch to a vocalist, so to console Mick Jagger, Corner arranged for him to appear at the marquee on the same night, fronting an ad hoc band including Richards and Brian Jones during the intermission between Long John Baldry sets. They named themselves the Rolling Stones, after a Muddy Waters song, Rolling Stone, and played material by Waters, Jimmy Reed, Elmore James and Robert Johnson. Eric, meanwhile, was coming up for assessment at the end of his probationary year at Kingston College of Art. Because of his skill at drawing, he'd been put on the graphics course, which he soon came to hate. For while fine art students were painting or sculpting, he spent his time designing packaging or ad campaigns for things like soap or cornflakes. 
The one part he enjoyed was a spell in the stained glass department alongside his blues-savvy friend, Clive Bluechamp. As the guitar increasingly took over his life, he'd taken to cutting classes and leaving many exercises undone or half-finished. His portfolio was consequently rather meagre, but still he felt of sufficient quality to get him into the full three-year course. It thus came as a great shock to learn he was one of only two probationers among fifty whose courses were to be terminated. When he called at the college to pick up the various pieces of work he'd left there, he found they'd all been thrown away. Rejection seemed set to be the theme of his life. He delayed breaking the news to Rose and Jack, remembering how often they'd seen him supposedly set off for college when his only objective was to lounge in pubs and play guitar on All Saints Church's wall. When he finally found the courage to tell them, he later recalled, They were bitterly disappointed because they found out that I was a liar as well as a failure. Jack Clapp, usually so taciturn and indulgent, took an unwantedly firm line. You've had your chance, Rick, his step-grandfather told him, and you chucked it away. If he wanted to go on living at home, he'd have to start contributing to the household expenses, which meant getting a proper job. Nothing whatever to do with art, nor, it went without saying, music. Such a job was readily available, and in the circumstances impossible to refuse. He would go to work alongside Jack as a plasterer and bricklayer's mate. Despite Rose's disappointment, he still knew how to get round her. At Bell's Music Shop in Surbiton, he had found a guitar to replace his George Washburn and raise him to a new level of playing altogether. It was an American-made K, thin-bodied with a double cutaway, that could be played electrically or acoustically, though clearly a knockoff of the hugely expensive and prestigious Gibson ES-355, its blues pedigree couldn't be faulted. K guitars were favoured by one of his greatest idols, Jimmy Reed, while Alexis Corner used this same model and endorsed the brand in advertisements in the music press. The price tag of £99 was far more than Rose could afford, but it seemed the only thing capable of filling the void in his life at present. So she put down a deposit and contracted to pay off the balance in instalments. But once the K was his, just like his first guitar from Bell's, it revealed faults he'd brushed aside in his eagerness to possess it. The sunburst finish, normally gold shading to mahogany at the edges, was yellowish, shading to pink. As with his old Hoyer, the strings were too high off the fretboard, so an effort to hold down. It also had a weak neck which soon began to bend under the pressure he put on it. It was still an impressive-looking instrument, but something that he'd thought he couldn't live without seemed to lose all attraction now it was actually his. In the future, other such objects of obsessive desire would leave him with the same feeling. Surprisingly, the former indolent art student took naturally to being a builder's labourer, even recalled later that he loved it. C. Neal and Sons, the West Horsley firm for which Jack worked, had several major construction projects in the area, including a school in Camberley. Eric received what was then a generous wage of £15 a week. No skill was required of him, just physical strength and a head for heights. His main duty to carry buckets of semi-liquid mortar or hods of bricks up ladders to feed to Jack. As a result, he became more physically fit than he ever would be again in his life. For the first time, he came to appreciate Jack's multifarious skills in building work and to see that plastering a wall in a few deft strokes or laying bricks in a perfect line could be every bit as creative in their own way as music or art. He would always say it was from Jack that he learnt the importance of always trying to do one's best and finishing what one started. Yet he never regarded his job as other than a temporary stopgap and was ready to abandon it without a qualm when something else came along, as he was sure something would. The winter of 1962-63 is remembered in Britain for two events above all, the first outbreaks of Beatlemania and Arctic blizzards which snowed up the whole country for almost four months, bringing chaos to road and rail transport 
and, among other things, paralyzing the construction industry. With all Neil's outdoor sites frozen solid, Eric found himself spending days as idle as any at art college. One of the Thames Delta's less compelling music venues was the Station Hotel, a rather characterless pub across the road from Richmond Underground Station. The pub had a spacious back room with a professional-sized canopied stage, but its resident attraction, the Dave Hunt Group, were an uneasy mixture of trad jazz and Louis Jordan jump band music. Here, one icy Sunday night in January 1963, Eric ran into an acquaintance from Kingston College of Art, a fashion student named Jennifer Dolan. With her was her boyfriend Tom McGuinness, a bespectacled 21-year-old from Wimbledon, whose Jesuit education and day job with the Norwich Union Insurance Company had not stopped him turning into a passionate blues fan and guitarist. McGuinness, in fact, had brought along his guitar and amplifier with a view to joining the Dave Hunt lineup but one look at their trombones told me they weren't for me. Then Eric and I started talking about the blues in the usual name-dropping way. I said, John Lee Hooker. He said, Muddy Waters. I said, Howlin' Wolf. McGuinness longed to be in a blues band, but was beginning to despair of finding the right companions. The previous year, he'd managed to connect with two in the Oxford area, sometime undergraduate vocalist Paul Pond, later Jones, and a woodcarver come pianist named Robin Benwell Palmer. But as they'd been unable to find any further kindred spirits, the project had stalled. Now Eric agreed to join up with McGuinness, enabling him to lure Ben Palmer back from woodcarving in Oxford. Two further recruits quickly materialised, a Barclays bank employee named Robin Mason to play drums, and a painter and decorator named Terry Brennan to handle vocals. There were no auditions, McGuinness recalls. The fact that we all loved the music was qualification enough. They called themselves the Roosters, and their first rehearsal took place on a March Saturday morning in a room above a pub in New Malden. Eric's clothes-sharing arrangement with his friend David Holt still continued, and he was currently borrowing one of David's sweaters, jumpers, as the British cosily call them, which its owner was due to reclaim from Ripley the following Wednesday but a surprise follow-up rehearsal obliged Eric to cancel their meeting and hold on to David's jumper for a little longer. In an apologetic note, he reported that the rehearsal went like a bomb. The quintet were woefully underpowered, with only Tom McGuinness's little 20-watt amplifier for two guitars and the vocalist's microphone. Now, for the first time, Eric's K spoke in an electrified voice, and the result impressed no one. Its tone was terrible, McGuinness recalls. Then, in the adjoining room, they discovered a set of far superior amps belonging to another band that rehearsed at the pub at different times from themselves. So we started using those until one day the other band came in unexpectedly and caught us. Quite a lot of diplomacy was needed to get out of a very awkward situation. The Roosters were to develop none of the internal tensions that bedeviled Eric's later bands. From day one... He was punctilious about rehearsing, sometimes coming straight from construction sites in clothes spattered with paint or plaster. Though he always got along with Tom McGuinness, he was initially uncertain about the vocalist Terry Brennan, who sported an elaborate teddy boy cockade and sideburns, suggesting archaic rock and roll tendencies. For all that, Brennan was a blues connoisseur whom he had to thank for pointing him to another glorious original. This was Freddie King, one of the so-called Three Kings of Electric Blues, along with B.B. and Albert, and the most youthful and extrovert of the triumvirate. His I Love the Woman and finger-picked instrumental Hideaway were two more tracks that Eric would never stop loving. A powerful stabilising influence was Ben Palmer, the woodcarver-turned-pianist, who was eight years older than Eric and married with two children. It seems a bit obvious to say that Ben became a father figure to Eric, McGuinness says. But he did, and to me and a lot of other people too. While the Roosters huddled around one feeble amp in New Malden, the Beatles were becoming a national talking point in the wake of their first number one single, Please Please Me. 
British newspapers, which hitherto had scarcely noticed pop music, gave ever-increasing coverage to their eccentric hair, eccentric clothes, and the juvenile female hysteria at their live shows, which all but obliterated every song they played. Eric at this stage saw the Beatles as no more than an extreme version of the generally mindless commercial pop, for which all true blues musicians felt nothing but disdain. To him, it seemed monstrous that they could earn this vast adulation with such apparent ease when so many of his sepia heroes had spent their lives in obscurity and died penniless. He could not know that the Beatles were huge fans of R&B, electric blues and modern offspring, and it had formed a large part of their stage act before John Lennon and Paul McCartney's songwriting became their energy source and the screams took over. As the media surrendered to Beatlemania and the other pro-pop bands hurriedly ceased imitating Cliff Richard's shadows and took to fringes, round-collared suits, chirpy smiles and winsome harmonies, continuing to like the blues, let alone play it, felt to Eric like a form of insurrection, which was even more reason to give it his undying loyalty. London's Marquee Club, so long the blues sworn enemy, had become a safe haven where the names John, Paul, George and Ringo were anathema, and the smoky air was guaranteed unpolluted by adolescent shrieks. He never missed the Marquis's Thursday blues nights, even though they ended long after the last train back to Surrey, and knowing no one who lived in the city, he often ended up wandering its streets until dawn. Among the performers to whom the Marquis had latterly opened its doors were three who would later play an important part in his career, as he would in theirs. The first was John Mayle, who had only just quit a job as a commercial artist to form a pro-blues band, giving himself a year to make it before he went back to regular employment. The other two, who had appeared with Alexis Corner in Ealing before teaming with keyboard player Graham Bond, were Ginger Baker and Jack Bruce. He regularly encountered the Rolling Stones, by this time a sextet consisting of Mick Jagger, Keith Richards and Brian Jones, plus bass player Bill Wyman, drummer Charlie Watts and a pianist Ian Stewart. Following their debut at the club almost a year earlier, not too much had happened for the Stones and Jagger. Richards and Jones were living together in squalor in Chelsea, dependent on the charity of their bandmates, the only ones with regular jobs. Over the following months, Eric felt he became quite close to Mick Jagger, who in those days seemed a comparable blue zealot, dedicated solely to preserving and spreading the music. However, a possible other agenda was hinted at by the personal hand microphone he always carried in his pocket. Eric still did the occasional troubadour gig outside the Roosters, and for one of these, back in Richmond, he was allowed to borrow Mick's mic. He knew he'd be unable to cope with it at the same time as playing, but presumed the venue would have a stand he could clip it to. This turned out not to be the case, so he had to improvise by piling up two chairs and taping the microphone to the top one. The Roosters stayed together only from the early spring to the summer of 1963. Eric would later say they rehearsed more than they performed, but Tom McGuinness contradicts this. We did about a dozen gigs and took it very seriously. We even advertised in the Melody Maker with the slogan, Can't Be Beat. They started in a modest way with appearances at the Kingston Jazz Cellar, actually located up two flights of stairs, the Wooden Bridge Hotel, Guildford, and the St. John Ambulance Hall, Reading, but eventually made it into a hot new London club, The Scene in Ham Yard, just off Great Windmill Street. On their first visit, they found themselves sharing the bill with Bo Diddley, an R&B artist distinct from all others for creating a totally new rhythm, then writing a song to launch it named after himself. A couple of times, they played the marquee as support for the Man Hug Blues Brothers, featuring Paul Jones on vocals and harmonica, who were soon to rename themselves after their chin-bearded South African-born leader, Manfred Mann. The fee was £5 for the four of us, which I told Paul was hardly enough to pay for Ben Palmer's petrol from Oxford and back, Tom McGuinness recalls. But Manfred said, Don't you realise some people would pay us for this opportunity? Looking back, it all seems incredibly innocent. We didn't take drugs, 
We hardly drank. The greatest self-indulgence I can remember was a donut eating contest Eric and I once had on Brighton Pier. McGuinness remains unsure just why the Roosters broke up, though an appearance at Uncle Bonnie's Chinese Jazz Club in Brighton, immediately after the donut eating contest, may have been a factor. The place was full of French students, all looking incredibly chic, and from the first moment it was obvious that they hated us. They all crowded to the front of the stage and started chanting, Le jazz oh, Le jazz oh. However, the Roosters had made enough of an impression for both Eric and McGuinness to be offered jobs in a professional band named Casey Jones and the Engineers. Its leader, Brian Casser, had fronted a leading Liverpool band, Cass and the Casanovas, when the Beatles were still barely known in the city, and had given them many tips about presentation and stagecraft. He'd subsequently moved to London to manage a nightclub, the Blue Gardenia, and score a solo recording contract with the Columbia label. Being one of Casey Jones's engineers gave Eric his first real experience of Britain outside the home counties, for the gigs he played with them were mostly in the north, beginning with the Civic Hall in Macclesfield, then moving on to Manchester's Oasis Club and Bellevue Open Air Amusement Park. One of the guys had a girlfriend who was a prostitute, Tom McGuinness recalls. The van used to start out from her flat in Westbourne Grove, and sometimes while we were waiting there, one of her clients would turn up, and we'd all have to go outside and wait for 20 minutes. The engineers wore matching black uniforms, topped off by Confederate caps, according to Eric, though McGuinness has no memory of any such headgear. They played some R&B, but the main fare was pop cover versions, including Casey's own current single, One Way Ticket. At the two Manchester gigs, they also had to back a cabaret singer named Polly Perkins. Though Eric liked Casey, and later said he gained much valuable experience with the engineers, he soon developed the itchy feet for which he would become so famous. When the band were booked to appear at the scene in London, he failed to turn up and they never saw him again. McGuinness quit a day later, soon afterwards switching from guitar to playing bass in Manfred Mann. Unlike some other musicians who have worked with Eric over the years, he has only positive memories of their partnership. Did I think he was a great guitarist? Not at the time. And I was never aware of the demons he's supposed to have had. What comes back to me is the amount of time we spent laughing. I remember the two of us walking away from that pub in New Malden after a rehearsal. Both of us were still holding our guitars because we didn't have any carrying cases, and Eric started playing the Beatles song, Misery. Even in a dark and crowded cinema, I could always instantly recognise that laugh of his. 5. Yardbird Like Bluto with an Italian accent, was how Eric would remember Giorgio Gomelsky. His first manager's black beard, stocky build and excitable temperament undeniably had something of the cartoon heavy who always loses out to Popeye the sailor. And the music world had not seen such a loser since Sam Phillips had sold Elvis Presley's contract for $50,000. There were many sides to Gamelsky, perhaps too many for his own good. He was born in the old Soviet Russian state of Georgia, brought up in Switzerland by way of Syria and Egypt, and educated in Italy. Though not yet 30, when Eric first met him, he spoke in the effusive yet distracted style of some elderly Italian movie mogul, addressing all the boy musicians in his care indiscriminately as Baby. He had arrived in London in 1955 as a journalist and would-be filmmaker, but soon diversified into launching one of the city's first espresso bars, the Olympic in Chelsea's King's Road, and publicising then organising jazz concerts and festivals. This brought him into contact with Chris Barber, one of the few jazz celebrities to value the blues and bring its surviving pioneers across the Atlantic as honoured co-performers. Gomelsky became as passionate an advocate for the music as Barber and their mutual friend Alexis Corner, while still pursuing a career as a film director and editor and also attending classes in method acting. He had opened an R&B club named the Piccadilly in London's West End, booking the Rolling Stones for an early, unimpressive appearance. But, like Corner, 
had been frozen out by the jazz community and gone seeking a new young audience in the suburbs. As Corner had found his Ealing Bakery basement, so Gomelsky lit on Richmond's Station Hotel, whose large rear function room he rented as a Sunday night R&B club with the last five pounds he had in the world. Rather than book a rotor of groups, he had the idea of keeping one on a retainer and building a rapport between them and their audience. His first incumbents were the Dave Hunt group, but then one day during the Arctic winter of 1962-63, Hunt's band got snowed in, and having nowhere else to turn, Gomelsky reluctantly gave a second chance to the Rolling Stones. After a shaky start, in part thanks to posters misprinting their category of music as rhythm and bulse, the Station Hotel became to the Stones what Liverpool's Cavern Club had been to the Beatles. Indeed, the Beatles themselves were seen there after Gomelsky managed to contact their manager, Brian Epstein, and arrange for them to drop in one Sunday after a TV appearance in nearby Teddington. Eric was among the audience when they arrived, all four in identical long black leather overcoats. Amid the resulting kerfuffle, he little suspected the presence of a future best friend. They appeared to be wearing their stage outfits, and for some reason that bothered me, he would recall. There was obviously a mutual admiration thing going on between the Stones and them, so I suppose it was only natural that I would be jealous and think of them as a bunch of wankers. Gomelsky was the Rolling Stones manager every way but on paper when in April 1963 he was summoned back to his family home in Switzerland by the death of his father. During his absence, a 19-year-old freelance PR man named Andrew Lug Oldham, who'd been working for Brian Epstein, caught the Stones' performance after a tip-off from a music journalist. Oldham cared nothing for the blues, but in this group of its missionaries, especially the lead singer, he saw an instant appeal to young record buyers for whom the Beatles were becoming a bit too tuneful, a bit too attractive to older people, altogether a bit too safe. When Gomelsky returned from Switzerland, he found the Stones had signed a management deal with Oldham and were on their way to releasing their first single, a cover of Chuck Berry's Come On. Having no written contract with them, he received nothing from what would be the second biggest band of all time. Immediate concern was finding a new resident attraction for his Sunday nightclub at its new venue. Although the Stone Station Hotel performances were entirely free of bad behaviour, unlike their later ones, the brewery that owned the pub had become alarmed by the size of the crowds they attracted and banned any further R&B on its premises. Gomelsky was forced to transfer operations across the road to the Richmond Athletic Ground which had a spacious bar and meeting room in the lee of its grandstand. This now became the Crawdaddy Club, after the deep southern nickname for Crayfish, and Bo Diddley's song, Doing the Crawdaddy. The band given the task of following the Rolling Stones had come out of Eric's secondary school, Hollyfield, and The Crown, the pub where he used to busk while at Kingston College of Art. Lead guitarist Anthony Topham, known as Top, and rhythm player Chris Trehar had both been two years behind him at Hollyfield and he'd spent long hours listening to blues records at the Topham family home in Norberton. The vocalist and harmonica player, Keith Relf, had been a contemporary of his at college. The only unfamiliar faces were bass player Paul Samuel Smith, who'd played with Relf in a previous band, the Metropolitan Blues Quartet, and drummer Jim McCarty who'd attended Hampton Grammar School with Samuel Smith. The name the five had chosen was a Depression-era term for hobos who haunted train yards to catch free rides, and the full nickname of the bebop genius usually known as Charlie Bird Parker. They were the Yardbirds. In a few months, they had become the most talked-about local blues band, winning the approval of the great harmonica player Cyril Davis, co-founder of Blues Incorporated with Alexis Corner, after serving as Davies' interval act on Eel Pie Island. They had come to Gomelsky's notice just before the Rolling Stones' defection, and it was some comfort now to pour his energies into them, this time with the safeguard of a proper contract. When he assured his Crawdaddy membership the Yardbirds were as good as the Stones, he seemed, 
for once, not to be exaggerating. The singer and harmonica player, Keith Relf, blonde-haired and wide-lipped, was like a cross between Mick Jagger and Brian Jones. Lead guitarist, Top Topham, though still only 15, was more than a match for either Jones or Keith Richards. Where the Stones had roused their Saturday night audiences to stomping frenzy with Bo Diddley's Doing the Craw Daddy, the Yardbirds ended their sets with long instrumental rave-ups to equally potent effect. But then, a couple of months into their residency, they gave Gamelski a headache of a different kind. Top Topham, a precociously gifted artist since childhood, was about to leave school and go to Epsom Art College. For his father, John, whose renown as a painter had never brought any great affluence, it was to be the culmination of years of preparation and sacrifice. Now Top was starting to think that playing guitar in the Yardbirds offered an altogether more attractive future, but John Topham, huge blues enthusiast though he was, vetoed the idea, and 15-year-old Top had to accept the paternal edict. The issue was still unresolved when Eric bumped into Keith Ralph, his old Kingston student acquaintance, at a party and Ralph sounded him out about taking Top Topham's place. He was far from certain he wanted to be in another band after his Casey Jones experience, but was won over by the quality of the Yardbirds playing, still more by an assurance that their entire reason for existence was to honour the tradition of the blues. Top, at the time, was away on holiday with his family, and returned to find himself ousted from the band he felt he'd created, it came as a particular blow, remembering all the educative hours Eric had spent listening to his and his father's blues record collection. I was very badly affected, he recalls. For about six months afterwards, I couldn't even pick up a guitar. To make matters even more awkward, the far-from-wealthy John Topham had recently bought the Yardbirds an expensive amplifier, for which he was still paying in instalments and which the band had turned over to Eric. After a month of fruitless requests, the Tophams had to resort to a lawyer's letter to get it back. Eric was only just 18, so he, too, needed parental permission for a step that few British parents in 1964 would have welcomed. However, in his case, only Rose's consent had to be obtained, and as always, whatever he wanted was all right with her. Jack Clapp, he recalled, was quietly amused evidently feeling it would be just a matter of time before he returned to plastering and bricklaying. But even Jack was impressed that he'd be receiving a weekly wage of £20. In October 1963, there was a meeting of the group and their respective guardians at Keith Ralph's home, at which Rose countersigned the contract that turned Eric into a professional musician, later admitting that she'd had no idea what she was signing. Its provisions were the same as for the other Yardbirds, save in one particular. He had to be given a week's holiday that following Christmas. Why was not explained, and his new bandmates thought it rather odd, since Christmas would be an especially busy time, and only two months after his arrival they'd need to hire a temporary stand-in. The answer was that, in her usual sudden and disruptive way, his real mother had again re-entered his life. Pat by now was no longer living in Canada, but West Germany, where her soldier husband, Frank MacDonald, had been posted with NATO's Canadian contingent. Although Ripley was in comparatively easy reach, she made no ceremonial homecoming this time. Instead, she'd asked Rose to bring Eric to spend Christmas on the base near Bremerhaven, where MacDonald was stationed. Otherwise, the new yard bird seemed an effortless fit. He made his debut on the 20th of October 1963 at the Studio 51 Club in Soho, playing a set that included Howlin' Wolf's Smokestat Lightning, John Lee Hooker's Boom Boom, Chuck Berry's Little Queenie, and Bo Diddley's You Can't Judge a Book by the Cover. He seemed reserved, quiet, slightly nervous, bass player Paul Samuel Smith remembers. His stance was very contained, upright and precise, Though the nerves would improve, the stance would always stay much the same. From then on, he found himself working almost every night. Gomelski by this time operated a circuit of crawdaddies, 
with another at the Star Hotel in Croydon and another at Ed Wiener's Club in Finsbury Park. Like Richmond, these new territories were deluged with press advertisements, fly posters and handbills in typically brash Giorgio style, offering free admission to anyone who brought along two friends. Often, crowds of Richmond members would be ferried in by bus to pump up the enthusiasm of the locals. For Eric, having a manager brought one immediate major benefit. A few days after he'd signed his contract, Gamelski gave him the use of a red Fender Telecaster, a single cutaway version of the two-horn Stratocaster that had so thrilled him in Buddy Holly's hands. It was goodbye to the old unsatisfactory K which Rose was still paying for in instalments. Conscious of the financial burden on her, Eric had tried to contribute by signing up as a temporary postman during the snowbound Christmas season of 1962, but this only other attempt at a normal job in his whole life had not gone well and had been prematurely terminated. Rose would not take the three pounds he'd earned, so he spent it on a bottle of perfume for her. When he got his Telecaster, the K was taken over by Roger Pierce, his soon-to-be Christmas substitute in the Yardbirds, as were the remaining payments on it. Each week, Pierce would go to Ripley and hand another instalment in cash to Rose, who would enter it punctiliously in a notebook. At the end of 1963, the growing passion for electric blues among young people across Europe brought several hallowed names across the Atlantic, to take part in West Germany's American Folk and Blues Festival, then make individual appearances in France, the Netherlands, and Britain. Among them was Sonny Boy Williamson, whom Giorgio Gomelski had met and befriended during his jazz-promoting days. As a means of raising the Yardbirds another notch, he arranged for them to back Sonny Boy in an appearance on the Crawdaddy circuit, during which they would make a live album together. This was not, however, the Sonny Boy Williamson who'd been a pioneer of the blues harmonica and written Good Morning Little Schoolgirl, originally just Good Morning Schoolgirl. He had been murdered during a Chicago street crime in 1948, and his name had been appropriated by another harp player, born Alec or Alex Miller, and also known professionally as Little Boy Blue and Rice Miller. In contrast with elegant blues masters like Big Bill Brunsey and Muddy Waters, Sonny Boy Williamson II was chunky and crop-headed, with a straggly goatee beard. Years on from his identity theft, he remained extremely touchy on the subject, as the Yardbirds discovered at their very first encounter. Seeking to impress as the blues historian of the band, Eric asked him, "'Isn't your real name Rice Miller?' At this, Sonny Boy, too, pulled out a small penknife and glared at me. It went downhill from there. His consumption of alcohol was far beyond any the English boys had ever seen. He always carried a briefcase with him, drummer Jim McCarty recalls, but all he ever had in it were his harmonicas and a bottle of Johnny Walker. As he couldn't be trusted in a hotel room, having recently set one alight while trying to cook a rabbit on the hot plate of a coffee percolator, Gamelski heroically invited him home for a stay that ended up lasting three months. His performances with the Yardbirds, portions of which were taped for their projected live album, took place between the 7th and 9th of December at the Richmond and Croydon Crawdaddies. Sonny Boy clone or not, he was still a harp virtuoso who'd played with the likes of Elmore James and Arthur Big Boy Crudup, and both venues were crammed to the rafters. But what was supposed to be a career-enhancing honour for his young sidemen instead proved something of a trial. On stage, Sonny Boy wore a garish pink and green suit he'd bought specially for the tour, one leg of which was pink, the other green. The show included a bizarre moment when they had to kneel while he did a Chuck Berry-style duck walk round them. We'd gone through the whole set that afternoon, but when we got on stage, he was so drunk that he did completely different things from what we'd rehearsed. Jim McCarty recalls. He didn't even tell us which key they were in, so we could only try to follow him as best we could. In time, blues masters would rhapsodise about the experience of playing with Eric, 
But about the yard birds, Sonny Boy Williamson II was scathing. These English boys want to play the blues so bad, he said. And they play them so bad. Between the 23rd of December and New Year, as Eric's contract had stipulated, he was on the NATO military base just outside Bremerhaven, visiting his mother. This reunion did not go any more smoothly than the earlier one when he was nine. By now, Pat had had three children with Frank MacDonald, Brian and Cheryl, to whom Eric had been introduced on the previous occasion, and a second daughter, Heather. So someone else was entitled to call her Mummy, as he had never been. Living with Rose and Jack, he'd grown accustomed to doing exactly what he liked with never a breath of criticism. But with Pat and his stepfather, in their rigidly conventional service life, things were very different. His beatnik phase was long past, his turnout these days as immaculate as any soldier's, but his hair committed the serious military offence of partially covering his ears. The usually affable MacDonald told him bluntly that he wouldn't be allowed to join the family in the officer's mess unless he had it cut. His older half-siblings, Brian and Cheryl, to whom he appealed for support, both took their father's side, and even Rose, usually his staunch defender, pleaded with him not to make a fuss. He had no choice but to submit to the base barber, emerging with the same drastic crew cut that was given to new recruits. Having rejected him as a baby, Pat had now rejected who he was. His first look at himself in the mirror made him cry. Worse was to come. He'd been allowed to bring his still-much-loved George Washburn acoustic guitar with him, and two days later, Brian accidentally sat on it and snapped its slender neck in half. Though he forgave the contrite Brian, whom he thought a sweet kid, the incident plunged him into one of the moods that had made his mother mark him down as a loner. There and then, he would recall, I vowed internally that she and her family could go to hell. I didn't lose my temper, I just withdrew. Not only had my identity been ripped away, but my most treasured possession had been destroyed. I went inside of myself and decided that from there on, I would trust nobody. As many another aggrieved child will know, it's easy to say one washes one's hands of a parent, but not so easy to do. He returned to the Yardbirds with his shaming crew cut to find he hadn't been particularly missed. Indeed, Roger Pierce had done so well in his place, playing his old troublesome K, that the others were half wondering if they wanted him back at all. And now even the gorgeous Fender Telecaster with which Gamelski had provided him began to reveal flaws as he got used to it. In particular, the lighter-gauge strings he preferred were quite unsuitable for the band's extended instrumental rave-ups. Repeatedly bending them, as the blues demanded, often caused one to break, and the music had to grind to a stop while he changed it. When Eric changed a guitar string, it was with the same care and deliberation that his step-grandfather Jack Clapp laid a line of bricks. He seemed so oblivious of the crawdaddy stompers, waiting in suspended animation, that some would break into an impatient, slow hand clap. After this happened several times, Gomelski dubbed him Slow Hand Clapton. As it stood, it was not a nickname any musician would want. But Eric's luck would even extend to etymology. Its last two syllables soon fell away, leaving Slow Hand, the former jibe now a tribute to leisurely virtuosity in more ways than one, the memory of that maddeningly deliberate teenager was superseded by the Pointer's sister's vision of a lover with an easy touch, as skilled at finding G-spots as G-7s. We shall discover other such discrepancies between the public's vision of his life and its actuality. 6. Journeyman Despite the very different characters in their lineup, the Yardbirds were remarkably free of internal personality problems when Eric arrived. The most pressing was the health of their vocalist harmonica player, Keith Relf, a sufferer from acute asthma who nonetheless smoked 40 cigarettes or more per day. 
For much of the time, this lethal combination seemed not to affect his singing nor the breath control demanded by his instrument. And the frail-looking Ralph was nothing if not a trooper. In his worst paroxysms of coughing and wheezing, Giorgio Gomelsky encouraged Ralph with a bellow of, You can do it, baby! Then, suddenly, Ralph would develop pulmonary complications that put him in hospital for days, even weeks at a time, and a stand-in would have to be used. There was quite a pool of these, including a Kingston art student who usually fronted an ensemble known as Hogsnort Rupert's famous Porkestra. Although the Yardbirds had recently turned professional, they were still in music primarily for fun, whereas Eric had already been in one pro band and was utterly serious about the job. He was a journeyman, recalls rhythm guitarist Dreha, using the centuries-old word for a craftsman who's completed his apprenticeship but hires out to others rather than being in business for himself. He worked at every aspect of his performance, not just his solos, but his posture on stage and his whole look. The Yardbird's look hitherto had not greatly bothered its two principals, Ralph and bass player Paul Samuel Smith, both of whom considered the most appropriate garb for celebrating the blues a lived-in denim jacket. Eric, by contrast, was heavily into the Ivy League style of square-cut, high-button jackets, thin ties and round shirt collars fastened with a pin. Topped off by the Canadian military crew cut, he decided to keep, it fitted him perfectly into the mod movement, whose members were dedicated to fastidious tailoring, R&B music, and making war on their stylistic opposites, the black leather-clad, rock-and-roll-loving rockers. With Eric, it was more than a question of just liking clothes, says Samuel Smith. Clothes were an essential part of his being. The drummer, Jim McCarty, disliked him at first for being too cocksure of himself, but warm to his sense of humour. He'd put on all kinds of funny voices, then pull faces to match them, which we'd all copy. He'd usually hitchhike from Ripley to Richmond, where our van started from, and he'd tell us all these stories about being picked up by gay guys who tried to seduce him. His strongest rapport was with Chris Dreha, a gentle character who'd been feeling somewhat lost since the departure of his old school friend, Top Topham. Eric got me into being a mod just like him, Dreha says. We'd go up to London on shopping trips, and he'd take me to a place in Shaftesbury Avenue that imported American clothes. He seemed to know people all over the West End, which really used to impress me. Paradoxically, as Eric later recalled, what he liked about Dreha was his only very moderate guitar skills, his lack of ambition, and his ability to enjoy the moment. He was quiet, shy and kind, and I trusted him completely. A rare thing for me. But with Paul Samuel Smith, he found no empathy whatsoever. The two of us just never clicked, Samuel Smith admits. British pop musicians in that era were not immune from the country's deep-rooted class system, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones included, and it seems that the bass player's double-barreled name was part of the problem. Paul's mother's maiden name had been Samwell, but she'd married a man named Smith, Jim McCarty remembers. She didn't want to be Mrs. Smith, so she'd hyphenated the two. They weren't at all posh. Paul's dad was an electrician, and they lived in an ordinary semi-detached house. But Eric didn't like the hyphen, because in those days he always aligned himself with the workers. Another factor may have been that Samuel Smith owned a Fender Stratocaster, with three electrical pickups rather than the two on a Telecaster. Any nice guitar Eric saw, he wanted, Chris Dreha recalls. And the more out of his reach it was, the more he wanted it. In February 1964 the Beatles arrived in New York, ending America's immemorial resistance to British popular music and opening the door to an invasion of this massive new market by their main rivals back home. But Britain had already been invaded by American musicians of an earlier generation, some corporeally, others only in spirit. While pop was at an unparalleled shrieking zenith, the sound of cool was the blues in its electric form, the names to conjure with not John, Paul, George and Ringo, 
but Muddy, Bo, John Lee, T-Bone, and Howlin, unless one was meant to call him Mr. Wolf. Whereas it had formerly seemed to belong only to the sophisticated South, authentic yet highly distinctive blues bands were emerging from the Midlands and North, such as Birmingham's Spencer Davis Group and the Animals from Newcastle-on-Tyne. The music that had for so long been segregated and disparaged in its own country had received the freedom of the British Isles. The Yardbirds seemed made for the moment, as well as the Crawdaddy Circuit and the Blues Clubs proliferating throughout the Thames Delta, they had a regular spot at the Marquis in its new Wardour Street premises and the nearby Flamingo Club. Keith Ralph's father, Bill, gave up his plumbing business to act as their driver, Rody. On the 28th of February, Ralph was back in hospital with a collapsed lung, but recovered sufficiently to appear with the others in an R&B festival at Birmingham Town Hall, also featuring Long John Baldry, the Spencer Davis Group, and Sonny Boy Williamson. There they rejoined Sonny Boy to live record further material for the projected album they'd begun at the Crawdaddy before Christmas. It proved an easier experience this time around, though the album wasn't to see the light of day until 1966, by which time Eric's name, rather than Sonny Boy's, would be its main selling point. The night ended with an all-star jam session in which the Spencer Davis Group's 15-year-old singer-guitarist Stevie Winwood demonstrated his astonishingly mature talent. To save time lost in commuting between their Richmond base and their various family homes, Gamelski rented a small top-floor flat in Kew, near the famous Botanical Gardens, where Eric, Keith Ralph and Chris Dreha took up residence and Samuel Smith and McCarty could crash when they needed to. Dreha was waiting for his American girlfriend to join him there, and in the meantime, he and Eric shared a room. The first experience of living away from home and from Rose's coddling care had one great advantage. He could have sex with girls in a bed rather than in the back of a van or still more uncomfortable al fresco situations. Chris Dreha's presence in the other bed a few feet away did not inhibit this. Dreha grew accustomed to eavesdropping on Eric's favourite seduction line, invoking the Cuban Missile Crisis, which had almost started a Third World War in 1962. I heard it so many times. Oh, come on, we could all be blown up by Cuba tomorrow. Like most new-school British blues bands, the Yardbirds stuck to the old pop formula of a singer who claimed most of the audience's attention and gave way to the lead guitarist usually in only one spot per song. Keith Ralph was doubly prominent since the harmonica he played with such brio, for all his fragile respiration, was as much a lead instrument as Eric's guitar. Yet, at gigs where the spectators massed in front of the stage, it became increasingly noticeable that separate little crowds were collecting to watch Eric, and that, unprecedentedly, they consisted of boys more than girls. Clapton's clique, Chris Dreha took to calling them. Ralph might have been expected to resent this, as might his closest friend in the lineup, but Paul Samuel Smith says it never crossed either of their minds. We never had that kind of jealousy in the Yardbirds. We just looked on it as another good thing for the band. Gamelski's urgent priority in his campaign to prove them every bit as good as the Rolling Stones was to secure them a recording contract. And here, luck seemed to have returned to him. The Richmond Crawdaddy had recently begun to sell a new fanzine named R&B Monthly, one of whose founders, 18-year-old Mike Vernon, had recently become a trainee producer at Decca Records, the label which had signed The Stolen Stones. Such was his enthusiasm for the Yardbirds that R&B Monthly devoted a whole issue to each of them in turn, significantly beginning with Eric rather than with Keith Ralph. Vernon agreed to try to help get the Yardbirds signed to Decca, and as a first step, suggested helping them make an audition tape at the independent R.G. Jones studio in Morden. It was a step not wholeheartedly welcomed by Eric, purist that he was. He thought the blues should only be played live, and that any connection with buying and selling must taint it irrevocably. A ridiculously pompous attitude, his adult self would admit, considering that all the music I was learning from was on record. 
At R.G. Jones' studio, with Mike Vernon as producer, the Yardbirds cut two tracks, Jimmy Reed's Baby What's Wrong and Honey In Your Hips, written by Keith Relf. Though Vernon loved the performance overall, Eric's contribution didn't particularly impress him. There wasn't a solo in either track, just the odd riff that sounded like Jimmy Reed or Billy Boy Arnold. They were competent and in the groove, but nothing that took your breath away. As always, no one could think less of Eric than Eric did. I was just embarrassed because in the studio my inadequacy was there for all to see, he would recall. But it wasn't just me. As exciting as it was to be actually making a record, when we listened to it back and compared it to the stuff we were supposedly modelling ourselves on, it seemed pretty lame. We just sounded young and white. Despite Vernon's enthusiastic endorsement, his bosses at Decca rejected the tape. I was never told why. I gather that they felt they'd already got the stones, and Keith didn't have the same power as a frontman that Mick Jagger did. He stayed on good terms with the Yardbirds nonetheless, even joining the pool of ad hoc vocalists they could call on when Keith Ralph was ill. The obvious next target was Decca's arch rival, the huge multi label EMI Corporation which had had the incalculable good fortune to sign the Beatles after Decca turned them down. This time, Gamelski made the pitch in person, taking care to drop the name of Brian Epstein at every opportunity. As a result, the Yardbirds were offered a contract with EMI's Columbia label. Their debut single, released in May 1964, was a cover of Billy Boy Arnold's I Wish You Would, heavy on echo, and with no guitar solo by Eric. Columbia's promotional campaign focused on Keith Relf's omnipresent harmonica. Do you suffer from an incredible urge to let loose and shake away all your frustrations? Then listen to the Yardbirds' most blues-wailing record, I Wish You Would. It managed to climb only to number 26 in the New Musical Express chart, and was rejected by EMI's American affiliate, Capital. The best US deal that could be found was with the small Epic label, under a contract paying only half the already minuscule standard royalty rate. On its release by Epic, mistakenly titled I Wish You Could, it received no measurable radio play and did not appear on any chart. The best thing that Columbia did for the Yardbirds was let them make an album before achieving a hit single and also to recognise how much energy their blues wailing might lose in a sterile recording studio. The album, therefore, was recorded in front of a live audience at the Marquee, where their following had become as ardent as back in Richmond. Released later in the year as five live Yardbirds, it honoured the tradition of the blues, as devotedly as Eric could wish, with tracks including Bo Diddley's Pretty Girl, Slim Harpo's I Got Love If You Want It, and the first Sonny Boy Williamson's Good Morning Little Schoolgirl. Gamelski assumed the title of producer, assisted by Bill Relf, who held a boom microphone over the spectator's head to catch as much of the cheering and whooping as possible. While more and more of the world fell in love with the Beatles, so in Britain revulsion mounted against the Rolling Stones, those formerly blameless blues purists whom Andrew Lug Oldham had brilliantly marketed as tangle-haired, sneering, disrespectful, anti-Beatles. The Yardbirds came to national notice as something midway between the two. They could do so mainly thanks to a major expansion in British television coverage of popular music. The BBC's new arty second channel, BBC Two, was the first to take it seriously in all its forms, jazz, folk and blues, and transmit live performances in shadowy settings as intimate as clubs. At the opposite extreme, on the sole commercial network, Ready Steady Go was a non-stop review in an undisguised hangar of a studio, mixing top British acts with visiting American ones, many from the blues and soul sphere, like James Brown and the Famous Flames, Little Stevie Wonder, the Miracles and Martha and the Vandellas. The Yardbirds were highly telegenic, offering a touch of the Stones' edginess without the slightest offensiveness. A later era might have turned them Rolling Stones light. This was overwhelmingly down to Keith Ralph, whose hyperactive harmonica 
and brooding poetic air gave no clue to his terrible health. Eric, apart from arraying himself in some or other crisp new high-collared button-down shirt, made no attempt to play to the camera, and studio audiences as yet contain no Clapton cliques. Ready Steady Go's legendary producer Vicky Wickham, who chose the band to be the first to play live on her programme, retains no memory of him whatsoever from that occasion. The lack of a hit single remained a serious handicap, and Gamelski had to work hard to maintain their profile in an ever more crowded and competitive field. Overextended as he now was as their producer as well as manager, he took on a young PR man named Greg Teller, who quickly proved to be in the Andrew Lug Oldham mould. In May 1964, the Labour peer Lord Willis, who as Ted Willis had scripted the long-running TV police drama Dixon of Doc Green, made a speech in the House of Lords, condemning the music of the Beatles and the Rolling Stones as a cheap candy-floss substitute for culture. Though the Yardbirds had not been included in the attack, Teller conceived the idea of a staged confrontation between them and Willis at his home in Chislehurst, Kent, with the press in attendance. They, Gamelski and several Fleet Street photographers, arrived to find the pier on a sun lounger in his garden, and at first not at all keen to receive them. His daughter, Sally, having persuaded him, the Yardbirds performed Big Bill Brunsey's Louise, standing on a low garden wall. Willis offered them beer, and conceded that what he'd heard wasn't candy floss, but real folk music in the modern idiom. The next day's coverage was everything that could be desired, even if the Daily Mirror's expansive spread referred to them throughout as the yard sticks. Sally Willis later remembered that, unsurprisingly, Gomelski had done most of the talking, and that of all the band, Eric had said least, though he was the only one to request a tour of her father's extremely large and luxurious house. At moments like this, Gomelski was brilliant, but in the practicalities of running a band, he was shambolic. His haphazard scheduling of the Yardbirds out of London gigs, as far to the west as Red Ruth Cornwall, and to the north as Liverpool's famous Cavern Club, meant frequent round trips of hundreds of miles, crammed into their single van. It was awful, Paul Samwell Smith recalls, like being married. Life on the road bore little resemblance to what it would soon become, especially not with Keith Ralph's father as the driver, Rody. I don't remember any drugs, not of any kind, Samwell Smith says. It was just alcohol. In that regard, the addictive one was not Eric, but Keith, who smoked, coughed, wheezed and drank beer more or less continuously. For hour after hour, the others would hear the alternate puffing of his asthma inhaler and the hiss of a fresh can being opened. There was always much griping about Gamelski and how it could be that after ten months of virtually non-stop gigs at ever-rising rates, so little money was coming through to them. We were in a logistical nightmare, Samuel Smith says, soon to turn into a financial nightmare. On the 9th of August, they were due to appear in what had formerly been the Richmond Jazz Festival, but was now the National Jazz and Blues Festival, with the Rolling Stones making their last appearance as hometown boys at the head of a massive bill from both camps, including Memphis Slim, Jimmy Witherspoon, Mose Allison, Chris Barber, Humphrey Littleton, Long John Baldry, Georgie Fame, and the Graham Bond organisation. The day before, during the recording of a spot for BBC Two, Keith Ralph again suffered a collapsed lung and had to be rushed to hospital. He almost died, underwent the removal of the fallible lung, and was told he would never sing again. Although this proved too pessimistic a forecast, he was to be out of circulation for six weeks. The Yardbirds closed the festival with Mike Vernon standing in for Ralph, after which they were joined on stage for a jam session by Georgie Fame and Graham Bond's rhythm section. So for the first time, Eric shared a stage with Ginger Baker and Jack Bruce. After this, the Yardbirds' 136th gig of the year, Gamelski announced that they needed a rest, and so he was giving them a two-week, all-expenses-paid holiday at a luxury hotel in Lugano, Switzerland, where he had grown up. 
On the 10th of August, they set off in their van, followed by a second vehicle carrying a number of their female supporters from the Crawdaddy, a detail that aroused no one's suspicion at the time. We should have known, says Jim McCarty, because Giorgio was always bussing our fans from gig to gig. After a hair-raising journey across the Alps, they arrived in Lugano to find the hotel was only half-built and that they'd been allocated one room between them. Gamelski then informed them that far from it being a holiday, Bill Ralph was following behind with their equipment and that in exchange for room and board, they would be expected to perform every evening beside the hotel pool. They were also booked to appear at the jazz festival he'd founded in nearby Ascona and at the opening of a record store in Lugano's town centre. Any other manager who exploited his musicians so shamelessly would have faced wholesale mutiny, but Gomelski managed to persuade the Yardbirds, Eric included, that it was all for their own good, and they put in the full two weeks at the half-finished hotel, playing to an audience largely consisting of their own portable fan club. Another Gomelski deal from which they seemed to derive no income came from his determination that they should emulate the Rolling Stones in everything. The Stones had just made a television commercial for Rice Krispies, so he contracted the Yardbirds to make one for Railbrook Drip Dry Shirts. Again, the band fell into line, albeit one of them this time with visible ill grace. The ad showed Ralph, Samuel Smith, McCarty and Dreha in Railbrook Toplin shirts, no different from what they wore every day, and looking dapperly at ease. But Eric, usually the biggest shirt enthusiast of them all, wore a sweater, setting off a fresh mown crew cut, and glowered like a skinhead before his time. The second Yardbird single was Good Morning Little Schoolgirl, a title no more questionable in October 1964 than when the original Sonny Boy Williamson had recorded it in 1937. This version, however, followed a recent pop-oriented one by the Chicago R&B duo Don and Bob, mentioning innocent trysts with the schoolgirl concerned in a soda shop and modern dance crazes like The Twist and The Stroll. It had double-tracked vocals, a cutesy o o o harmony, even an outbreak of beetle-like whooping, it also contained the first guitar solo by Eric to reveal a distinctive voice. In this case, a note-bending swoop and slide, totally at odds with the rest of the production and very clearly intended to be so. The single fared no better than its predecessor, I Wish You Would, reaching only number 45 in the UK and failing to secure an American release. That October, the Yardbirds joined a national package tour headlined by Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas, another hugely successful Brian Epstein discovery, which also mustered Cliff Bennett and the Rebel Rousers, the Nashville Teens and the Kinks. Such tours usually combined British artists with imported American ones and played a different city or large town every night, usually at cinemas in the Odeon or ABC chains, whose sound systems were rudimentary or non-existent. Even for the biggest names, performances were seldom longer than 20 minutes. Since the Beatles, every act, whether or not they had a hit record behind them, was greeted by demented shrieks. Eric would later recall his bewilderment the first time it happened to the Yardbirds. I mean, at one moment you were at school and you were pimply and no one wanted to know you, and then suddenly there you were on stage with thousands of girls screaming their heads off. Second on the bill to Kramer were the Ronettes, whose Be My Baby, produced by the famously neurotic Phil Spector with his wall of sound technique, had brought a new sexiness to female African-American vocal groups. During the tour, Eric developed one of his all-consuming crushes on their lead singer, Ronnie, a.k.a. Veronica Bennett after what he interpreted as encouraging signals from her. Too shy to attempt anything on the road, he hung around outside the Ronette's London Hotel, hoping for a word with her alone. His hopes were dashed when Ronnie came out on the arm of Mick Jagger, followed by another Ronette with Keith Richards. But he'd get his own back on Jagger one day. The Yardbirds had acquitted themselves so well on the Billy J. Kramer tour 
that Brian Epstein booked them for the Beatles' Christmas show, alongside Freddie and the Dreamers, and sounds incorporated at the 3,500-seat Hammersmith Odeon in West London, from Christmas Eve through to January the 16th. The experience was a thankless one since the audiences were there solely to see the headliners, who appeared in comedy sketches and routines, as well as playing music, and everyone else on the programme had their performances blotted out by impatient, warring screams of John, Paul, George, or Ringo. The Yardbird's name appeared at the bottom of the poster, lumped together with Elkie Brooks, Michael Haslam, and the Mike Cotton sound. In a group photograph taken on the stage during rehearsals, Eric is barely visible. However, the Beatles at close quarters proved not to be the wankers he'd thought when they came to see the Stones at the Crawdaddy. Huge as they were, they treated even this least important of their support bands as equals. Paul McCartney was especially friendly, playing the Surrey Boys a new song he was working on with the working title Scrambled Eggs, later changed to Yesterday. John Lennon was generally amiable, but could be devastatingly rude, sometimes to those least able to retaliate. One evening, en route to Hammersmith by tube, Eric fell into conversation with an American woman and mentioned he was appearing in the Beatles show. She got so excited that he took her with him to the Odeon and smuggled her into their dressing room. They were all impressively polite to her except John, who made a face of mock boredom and started doing wanking movements under his coat. Eric naturally had most in common with George Harrison as the Beatles' lead guitarist, though his role had less of its usual importance in the face of Lennon and McCartney's phenomenal creative axis. The pair had already written dozens of songs together against George's handful and monopolised the attention of their producer, George Martin, in the recording studio. Few people in those days suspected to what extent one of the four most adored young men in history felt overshadowed and underappreciated. Talking shop about their common instrument broke down George's usual shyness and reserve. He showed Eric his collection of Gretsch guitars. Eric introduced him to lighter gauge strings and told him where to buy them. So one of Rock's strangest friendships was born. At the end of 1964, the British blues boom reached its zenith when the Rolling Stones cover version of Willie Dixon's Little Red Rooster featuring the most sexually charged lyrics since Blind Lemon Jefferson's Black Snake Moan, became the first blues song to reach number one in the UK singles charts. Yet in truth, it was now no longer a blues number so much as a Stones one, whose performance on television first revealed, to the horror of all British parents with young daughters, the size and suggestiveness of Mick Jagger's lips. Despite the Yardbird's reputation as a live band, Giorgio Gomelski had been unable to bring them anywhere near the Stones in record sales. Neither of their singles had made the top 20, and their album, Five Live Yardbirds, despite generally positive reviews, had not sold much better. So early in 1965, Gomelski told them they had to stop being such blues purists and try to reach the mainstream pop audience. Two major British bands had already gone the same way, with spectacular rewards. The formerly cerebral Manfred Mann had released Do Wa Diddy Diddy, originally by an American vocal group called The Exciters, while The Animals had transformed an ancient folk song, The House of the Rising Sun, with a blisteringly modern rock arrangement. Both singles had shot to number one in both Britain and America. The idea of selling out his cherished blues for commercial gain could not have been more repugnant to Eric. But, according to bass player Paul Samuel Smith, he wasn't alone. None of us felt comfortable about being pushed towards becoming a pop group. We were all equally pissed off about it. As Gomelski pointed out, America still held a vast store of blues and soul that could be turned into comparably rewarding cover versions. Each yard bird, therefore, was to pick a candidate, and then a vote would be taken on the most promising one. This air of competition only added insult to injury where Eric was concerned. Yet he not only went along with it, but did his best to win. I was still afraid of fucking everything up, 
he later recalled, and finding myself back plastering walls with my grandfather. Coincidentally, a fellow EMI signing, Manfred Mann, the person not the band, had expressed interest in producing records with the Yardbirds, so was gratefully co-opted as a proven expert in crossing over from blues to pop. He made two demos with them, Sweet Music, a major Lance B-side, with backing vocals by his own band's lead singer Paul Jones, and the Shirelles' Putty in Your Hands. But neither had the instant, mindless magic of do wah diddy diddy Eric, meanwhile, looked around for something commercial, yet not ruinously compromising, and found an Otis Redding track, Your One and Only Man. When the others didn't care for it, he went to the opposite extreme and suggested Hang On Sloopy, then only a minor hit on the American R&B charts for the vibrations. That, too, was voted down, and a few months afterwards became an American number one, an all-time dance floor favourite, by the McCoys. He hardly needed to have bothered. His least favourite bandmate, Paul Samuel Smith, had developed ambitions to become a record producer, and was seen by Gamelski as the Yardbirds' de facto musical director. Samuel Smith therefore chose the make-or-break next single over the others' heads. It was not, after all, an American import, but For Your Love, an angst-ridden ballad by an unknown songwriter from Manchester named Graham Gouldman, later one of the influential 70s band 10CC. Samuel Smith produced it in his own arrangement, which bore no resemblance to the band's usual blues-wailing style, and, whether by accident or design, reduced the guitar to a minimum. The lead instrument was a harpsichord, played by an outside session musician, Brian Auger, supported by Keith Relf's bongo drums. Apart from a subdued bass riff in the middle eight, Eric was inaudible. By way of a consolation prize, he was given the B-side, an instrumental entitled Got to Hurry, somewhat like Booker T and the MG's Green Onions. Gamelski had hummed its basic structure to him, and so claimed the composer's credit, under the name Oscar Rasputin. To compensate for his burial on the A-side, Got to Hurry was credited to the Yardbirds, featuring Eric Slowhand Clapton. Nonetheless, the For Your Love session was the beginning of the end for him and the band. Henceforward, he became a grizzled and discontented individual, who deliberately made himself as unpopular as possible. His attitude was hardened still further after the biggest sellout of the blues to date. In February, the Rolling Stones released The Last Time by Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, a piece of pure pop that further enlarged Jagger's terrifying mouthiness and ignited a writing partnership that ultimately would be second only to Lennon and McCartney's. There was a horrible atmosphere, drummer Jim McCarty recalls. At band meetings, it was always Eric against the four of us. On the way to and from gigs, he'd sit in the van with a long face, lost in his own little world. He himself readily concedes, I was a nasty piece of work in those days. I was unreliable, dogmatic, antisocial for a lot of the time. Finally, Gomelski told him that if he wanted to leave the Yardbirds, nobody would stand in his way. Sure enough, nobody did. Less than a month after his departure, For Your Love reached number one in the New Musical Express Top 30. 7. Blues Breaker All this, and what soon followed, may look like a supremely arrogant 20-year-old using a so-called matter of principle as an excuse for bad behaviour, as 20-year-olds are apt to do, then strolling into a new band without a backward glance. In reality, finding himself out of the Yardbirds hit Eric as hard as being forced to leave Kingston College of Art had two years earlier. Thanks to the childhood trauma with his mother, rejection always devastated him and always would, however much he seemed to ask for it. His immediate response was to head home to Ripley, to Rose and Jack, the little corner house with the outside toilet and his ever-dependable old school friends around the green. He was totally disillusioned, he would recall, and 
ready to quit the music business altogether. It hardly helped his mood to hear what little trouble the Yardbirds had had in replacing him. Their first choice was the baby-faced Jimmy Page, a friend since Ealing Blues Club days who'd since become one of London's top session musicians. But Page, unwilling to give up that steady income, steered them to Jeff Beck, formerly of Wimbledon College of Arts, now lead guitar in the Tridents. Later, Page would cease session work and join Beck in the Yardbirds en route to Led Zeppelin. Eric had therefore unwittingly opened the way to two of his strongest future competitors. Now, he could only sit beside Rose and Jack in the tiny living room at One the Green, watching the new Yardbirds on television with For Your Love at the Top of the Charts. Keith Ralph, seemingly the healthiest of mortals with his shades and bongo drums, the provokingly hyphenated Paul Samuel Smith, so triumphantly right in his unilateral song choice, the snakily handsome Jeff Beck, looking like he'd always been there, Jack Clapp's words after the art college disgrace seem doubly applicable now. You've had your chance, Rick, and you've chucked it away. After the Roosters fell apart in 1963, he had stayed in touch with Ben Palmer, the piano player whose day job was furniture restorer and woodcarver. Palmer, eight years his senior, was an incredibly charismatic man, very funny, very intelligent and very worldly wise, with strong aristocratic features that made him look as if he came from the 18th century. He was a creative man of great depth who could turn his skill in any direction. In other words a father figure tailor-made for this particular father-seeker. At a loose end as he now was, Eric thought the two of them might make a guitar and piano blues record together, and he got a friend named June Child, later the wife of Mark Bolan, to drive him to Oxford, where Palmer worked and lived alone above some old stables. Palmer couldn't be tempted to abandon his workbench for music again, at least not at present, but Eric ended up staying for several weeks in what amounted to a convalescence from the Yardbirds. Palmer looked after him almost like a second rose, cooking him appetizing meals, listening to his troubles, and dispensing advice as solidly trustworthy as good oak or teak. For additional therapy, his host introduced him to a fantasy epic by an Oxford professor of Anglo-Saxon, as yet still little known outside American college campuses. J.R.R. R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. It was while he was immersed in the adventures of Bilbo Baggins, Frodo and Gollum, still unsure whether he had a future in music, that out of the blue he was invited to join John Mayle's Blues Breakers. Mayle had long been watching his development at the Marquis and had been impressed by his playing on Got to Hurry, the instrumental B-side of For Your Love. So that hated harpsichord fest hadn't been such a waste of time after all. Coincidentally, Mayle wanted rid of the Blues Breakers' present lead guitarist, Roger Dean, for not being bluesy enough. Hearing that Eric was available, he contacted June Child, who gave him Ben Palmer's telephone number. John Mayle is the daddy of British blues, or at least those many blues musicians nurtured by art colleges. He was born in Macclesfield, Cheshire in 1933, and at age 14 went to Manchester Junior Art School, where he combined his studies with learning piano, guitar, and harmonica. Unlike the great majority who were to follow the same path, he built a successful career in commercial art, working as an illustrator and photographer before forming the Blues Breakers and turning fully professional in 1963. Eric was first in a long line of younger instrumentalists he recruited who would go on to form or join major rock bands, among them Peter Green and Mick Fleetwood, later of Fleetwood Mac, Mick Taylor, later of the Rolling Stones, Ainsley Dunbar, later of the Mothers of Invention, Jefferson Starship and Whitesnake, and Andy Fraser, later of Free. Mail became renowned for giving his protégés room to develop, and for firing almost as many as left him to go on to greater things. Off stage, he bore little resemblance to the stereotypical hard-drinking, tobacco-addicted, feckless, footloose bluesman. A teetotaler? 
non-smoker, vegetarian and health nut, married with three children and living in a substantial Victorian house in Lee Green, south-east London. Eric had not cared much for the Blues Breakers' only album to date, and briefly wondered how he might fare in a band with a leader twelve years his senior. What mattered more was that, while others were selling out the blues on every hand, Mail's band remained incorruptible, sticking to the sacred muddy John Lee Howlin' songbook and playing only live, everything, in fact, that Eric had expected from the Yardbirds. He joined the Blues Breakers in April 1965 on a salary of £35 per week, with no formal audition or even rehearsal. Mail had played Got to Hurry to his other two sidemen, bass player John McVie, later of Fleetwood Mac, and drummer Huey Flint, later of McGuinness Flint, both of whom accepted it as more than sufficient entrance exam. We just got into the van and went off to the first gig, Flint recalls, and Eric just played like Eric plays. Mail and the Blues Breakers were managed by Rick Gunnell, a former boxer who ran both an artiste's agency and Soho's Flamingo Club, best known as the home of Georgie Fame and the Blue Flames. It differed from the nearby Marquis in having a large black clientele, drawn from American Air Force bases and West London's Caribbean community. The 1963 Profumo scandal, which toppled Harold Macmillan's conservative government, had started with the two West Indian boyfriends of a topless dancer named Christine Keeler fighting over her at the Flamingo. Gunnell and his scar-faced younger brother Johnny, who acted as his assistant, had fearsome reputations as tough guys both in the club and with their agency clients. When Georgie Fame became nationally popular and wanted to change managers, Rick looked thoughtfully at Fame's hands and said, Clive, his real first name, you do want to go on playing the piano, don't you? The Gunnels kept mail on a work schedule that made the Yardbirds under Kamelski seem leisurely. If there had been eight nights a week, we would have played them, Eric recalls, with two shows on a Sunday. The Blues Breakers travelled in a single van fitted with a bed for their leader's exclusive use. The others shared a mattress on the floor. We'd leave Newcastle sometime after midnight, their drummer, Huey Flint, recalls, and John would be snoring by the time we reached Gateshead just across the River Tyne. London gigs like their regular one at a pub club named Kluke's Clique in West Hampstead would be followed by an all-nighter back at the Flamingo amid wreathing clouds of marijuana smoke. There were notices all round the place saying, anyone smoking reefers will be prosecuted, Flint says, but you could buy the stuff from the office. Eric's impact on the blues breakers was immediate. Nowhere more noticeably than with the Flamingo crowd whose racial makeup made it particularly demanding. Before that, we'd always felt a bit overshadowed by people like Georgie Fame and Zoot Money. We'd been accepted, but not in a great way. As soon as Eric came in, everybody dug us just as much. Even the Gunnell's punishing work rate could not satiate his hunger to perform, and he made numerous one off appearances at other Soho venues like The Scene. One night, he accepted a gig at a Mayfair club named Esmeralda's Barn, unaware that it belonged to the East End's notorious twin crime bosses, Ronnie and Reggie Cray. He fronted the house musicians, and the only audience were the lethal twins themselves, seated at a table at the back as if conducting an audition. He also made an auspicious start as a session musician, although hardly conscious of it at the time, a month after taking him on, Mail seconded him to record some tracks with Bob Dylan, who was currently in Britain on the tour chronicled in D. A. Pennebaker's classic documentary, Don't Look Back. Dylan, at that point, was still the unignorable voice of America's civil rights movement, through quasi-religious anthems like Blowing in the Wind and A Hard Rain's Gonna Fall. So in Eric's book, Just a Folky, his main bugbear in the Yardbirds, Paul Samuel Smith, had been a passionate early Dylan fan, and Eric on principle hated everything that Samuel Smith liked. Dylan on this tour made friends with many young British blues musicians, as the Pennebaker film shows. Eric wasn't among them, 
although one scene shows Dylan watching the Blues Breakers on television, asking who their young lead guitarist is, then going, wow. Even so, recording with him proved a severe letdown. Ever unpredictable, he barely spoke to anyone in the studio. Then, with the tracks only half finished, he flew to Madrid, never to return. Not until the advent of Electric Dylan and albums like Blonde on Blonde would Eric realise he'd been in the presence of greatness. Despite the splash he was making with John Mayle, the music press knew him mainly for having been unlucky or foolish enough to leave a band just when it rocketed into the charts. His first substantial interview, in the trade paper Disc and Music Echo, was headlined, The Yard Bird Who Got Left Behind, and portrayed a dejected, pessimistic figure, although the writer, Dawn James, was struck by his super eyes. He said he still thought nostalgically about nights with the Yardbirds at the Marquee, even found himself worrying about Keith Ralph's asthma. By contrast, the future seemed to hold little promise. I don't expect I'll be a great success. I'm not that sort of a bloke. I never expect good things to happen to me. A 20-year-old earning £35 per week in 1965 could easily afford a luxurious flat in one of the choicest areas of newly identified swinging London. But throughout his career in the Bluesbreakers, Eric would continue billeting himself with other people in the same way he had at Ben Palmer's. It was sometimes whispered that he was a bit of a freeloader. But he had never had any trouble in finding people willing to take him in. The next such crash was offered by a friend of males named Charles Radcliffe a radical political activist and magazine editor with the looks of a pop star. Meeting Radcliffe and his girlfriend Diana at a Blues Breakers gig, Eric happened to mention he currently had nowhere to live. They immediately offered him a room at their flat in the Fulham Road. These months with Radcliffe expanded his literary horizons far beyond Tolkien. He read American beat poets like Allen Ginsberg and Lawrence Ferlinghetti, even esoteric tracts like Kenneth Patchen's The Journal of Albion Moonlight, which he loved, despite not understanding a word of it. From Radcliffe, too, he learned about Dadaism, the use of absurdity to make a satirical or political point, which culminated in Marcel Duchamp's solemn exhibition of a plain white toilet bowl. I remember him telling an interviewer from Rave magazine that he was in a da-da kind of mood, Radcliffe says, but we never had any serious discussions about politics. He made it clear that he wasn't interested. He was a very good guest, although it never occurred to him to make any contribution to the household expenses. Finally, Diana said something to him about it, and he brought us a strawberry gatto and some Matthias Rosé. Fulham was a great deal more central than Ripley, Yet still, Eric often had problems in getting to John Mayle's house in Lee Green, south-east London, in time to board the van for the night's gig. So, for the sake of efficiency, Mayle invited him to stay for as long as he liked. This being a more formal boarding arrangement, he could not accept until Mayle's wife, Pamela, had been down to Ripley to meet Rose. She was definitely checking us out, Pamela recalls. I took along my little daughter, Tracy, and while we were there, Tracy needed to go to the loo. Out in the garden, there was a fairy path to this little shed, and I remember her hopping and skipping all the way down it. Anyway, the upshot was that his grandma agreed to let him go. Eric spent almost the next year living with the males and their three children, occupying an attic room little wider than its single bed. Pamela remembers him as a sweetheart, very young, very naive. Once, I even had to sign a paper as his legal guardian. It might have become an imposition, as Pamela, too, was an art school graduate, now teaching at Goldsmiths College. But she recalls, He was never any trouble. He ate everything that was put in front of him. He was always very thoughtful, too. Whenever he went away with the band, he always brought Tracy back a little gift. Once, he bought her a dress, which was an unusual thing for a young boy to do. The main attraction of the house for Eric was Mayle's huge and Catholic record collection, ranging from field recordings of Delta bluesmen in the 1930s 
to avant-garde jazz by the likes of Ornette Coleman. The two would spend hours playing tracks and discussing their suitability for the blues breakers. Then Eric would take the record up to his garret and stay there with his guitar until he could reproduce it. When I'd leave for Goldsmiths in the morning, he'd already be playing, Pamela remembers. And when I came home at night, he'd still be up there. In many ways, the age gap between his band leader and himself counted for little. Mail shared his literary bent, in particular his current side obsession with Harold Pinter's play The Caretaker, recently filmed with Donald Pleasance as the down-and-out Davies. Eric had seen the film numerous times and even bought a copy of the script so could recite whole scenes by heart. It has a cast of only three, and he, male, and bass player John McVie would act it out, rotating the roles of Davies, Aston, and Mick, and convulsed with hysterical laughter the playwright never intended. Relationships within the Blues Breakers were generally amicable, even though Mail could sometimes resemble a schoolteacher with his class mocking him behind his back. The reward of his clean living ways was an impressive physique, which he liked to show off by performing stripped to the waist, a spectacle that always reduced Eric and McVie to ill-suppressed giggles. He was tolerant up to a point, Eric recalls, but we knew there was a limit and we did our best to push him to it. We liked to see just how far we could go before he lost his temper. The worst argument Eric and I ever had was about jazz, which I loved and he didn't, Huey Flint recalls. He said it was just a three-minute melody followed by long, meandering solos. I reminded him about that later when he was in Cream. Eric naturally gravitated towards John McVie, who'd come to bass playing after training as an income tax inspector and was currently dating Pamela Mayle's much younger sister. John was very funny, very bright, and very hard to control, says Flint. I think he was fired from the band three times altogether. Mayle, the total abstainer, disapproved of drinking at gigs, but McVie always managed a large surreptitious intake. Lovable though he was, there were times when his drinking made him aggressive, Eric recalls. He would either be left behind or sometimes turfed out of the van onto the side of the road. During performances, McVie kept a large glass of scotch and coke at the side of the stage, from which he would gulp when Mail wasn't looking. One night, when he went to take a drink, the level in the glass was much less than he'd left it at the last time, Huey Flint recalls. Someone in the audience was helping himself to it. So he took the glass away, peed into it, and put it back. The next time he looked, the level had gone down even more. So whoever it was, was drinking his pee. With Eric at that time, the overindulgence was not yet in alcohol. He has admitted how, almost every night, he would chat up some pretty young blues enthusiast before the show, have a fully clothed quickie with her somewhere backstage in the 30-minute interval between the Blues Breakers' two sets, then go back on again with the knees of my jeans covered in dust from the floor. It wasn't a girl in every port, but a girl at every gig. These were months in which young heterosexual Britons were adopting clothes and coiffures, which a few years earlier would have stigmatised them as pansies or puffs. And as always, Eric reflected every twist and turn in fashion, however radical. He now had side whiskers of a length not seen since the age of the Victorian paterfamilias and a thin moustache, like a pantomime villain's which came and went as if responding to inaudible boos. Once, he turned up for a gig in a fur coat, Huey Flint remembers. Another time, his fingernails were painted. John Mayle's bare torso might be fair game for mockery, but Eric's fashion choices never. McVie and I giggled among ourselves, Flint says, but we didn't let him see. He was someone you didn't take the piss out of. The autumn of 1965 brought a bizarre episode showing both the irresponsibility of which Eric was capable and the quixotic loyalty and selflessness. Oxford University had been in the vanguard of the British blues revival, and through Ben Palmer he had met a trio of recent graduates, now living in London, for whom it remained a consuming passion. John Bailey was an anthropologist, an aspiring vocalist, 
who'd once booked the Roosters for a college dance. Bernie Greenwood was a newly qualified doctor who worked at a Notting Hill clinic by day and played sax with Chris Farlow and the Thunderbirds at the Flamingo After Dark. Ted Milton was an aspiring poet who'd been at a Quaker school with Bailey. Milton's girlfriend, Clarissa, also recently down from Oxford, rented a flat in Longacre, above a fruit wholesaler's, serving the nearby Covent Garden produce market, still in full swing with porters carrying piles of empty baskets on their heads, like ambulatory towers of Pisa. In the adjacent flat lived two Cambridge graduates, Peter Jenner and Andrew King, soon to begin managing a new and entirely ex-art school band named Pink Floyd. While still officially lodging with John and Pamela Mayle, Eric took to spending long periods with Milton, Greenwood, Bailey, and often Ben Palmer at the Longacre flat, finally even renting a room there. For someone whose education had stopped at age 16, it was intoxicating to be around these clever people who nonetheless spoke the same musical language he did, drinking newly fashionable Batia's rosé and smoking cannabis. He developed a particular admiration for the poet Ted Milton, who, rather than singing or playing the blues, expressed it in mime. Never a good mover himself, he was fascinated by the way Milton could physically interpret a howling wolf song. Dancing and employing facial gestures, I understood for the first time how you could listen to music and bring it completely to life. That summer, Bailey and Greenwood decided to form a band and drive overland to Australia, paying their way with performances en route. Ben Palmer signed up as pianist and Milton as drummer. For Eric, this was troubadouring on a grand scale, and with Palmer's presence and added inducement, he agreed to join them. It seemed bafflingly perverse, just as he was beginning to make a name for himself with the Blues Breakers. It was also gross ingratitude to John Mayle, who had rescued him from despair, housed and fed him for months, and could expect a steep decline in bookings without him. But Mail, showing extraordinary forbearance, put no obstacle in his way and promised to keep his job open. As the late September departure date neared, Ted Milton dropped out and Eric, with even less consideration for John Mail, asked the Blues Breakers drummer, Huey Flint, to take his place. However, Flint was then newly married to the Mail's former au pair girl, so Milton's student brother, Jake, was enrolled instead, along with the trumpet player, Bob Ray. Their name, chosen by Bernie Greenwood in a nod to his daytime medical practice, was The Glands. The original plan had been to make the journey in a red double-decker London bus, converted to allow one side to open out as a stage. This proving impracticable, Greenwood bought an American station wagon, a 1953 model Ford Fairline country sedan, like a battleship with fins. John Bailey went ahead by air to Athens, a city he knew well, to try to arrange some gigs. The other five drove through France, Belgium and West Germany, stopping off for Munich's Oktoberfest, the annual two weeks devoted to mass beer swilling. The party duly got roaring drunk, all but Eric. He was very abstemious, Bernie Greenwood recalls. He didn't drink too much and didn't smoke at all. Tensions within the glands were already starting to develop, particularly between Greenwood and the trumpeter Bob Ray. At the Oktoberfest, the two came to blows after Greenwood objected to Ray ostentatiously lighting a cigarette with a five-pound note. The others voted to abandon the trip then and there, and all the gear was unloaded so that those who wished could take homeward trains. The combatants having sobered up and made up, it was agreed to keep going, but from that point, mishaps occurred on an almost Marx Brothers level. At a stop for fuel, Greenwood had his hand badly bitten by a dog he tried to stroke. In their haste to drive him to hospital, the others forgot that all their passports and travel documents had been spread out on the country sedan's roof, and were now lying in a page-fluttering trail behind them. In Yugoslavia, the cobbled road between Zagreb and Belgrade 
jolted the country sedan so severely that its bodywork parted company with its chassis. With no garage to hand, they could only tie it back on with rope and pray that it held. When they reached Thessaloniki, they were so broken hungry that they bought meat from a butcher's and ate it raw in the street. One of them was so desperate to be rid of his companions that he went to the beach and began collecting driftwood to build a raft on which to sail back to England, Contiki style. Amid all the bickering and backbiting, only Eric, normally that least tolerant and self-sufficient of beings, never lost his temper or seemed downhearted. He was nice and sweet the whole time, Bernie Greenwood recalls. With the country sedan's bodywork still miraculously holding on to its chassis, the Glans arrived in Athens to find that John Bailey had successfully pitched them to a club named the Igloo. However, the manager, George Karamusalis, whom Bailey had not informed of their lead guitarist's identity, insisted that they audition first. Changing their name to The Faces, this was years before Rod Stewart's band of the same name, they gave him Chuck Berry's Johnny B. Good and were pleased to learn that they'd passed. For the late boy wonder of John Mayall's Blues Breakers, this was a come-down indeed. The Faces would merely be a support to the Igloo's Greek house band, the Juniors, who specialised in Beatles and Kinks cover versions. They would appear six nights a week for no pay, only board and lodging at a nearby hotel. Just before opening night, Jake Milton dropped out to return to his college studies in Britain, and they had to use a Greek drummer named Makis Saliaris, who was also an airline pilot, and consequently sometimes delayed by bad weather. Saliaris later remembered Eric as a shy, sober, serious guy, even if he was the leader of the band. The faces went over well enough at the Igloo, though never to the extent of their Greek headliners, the Juniors. They soon discovered that the club's waiters controlled its music in the same way as its air conditioning, shouting at them to play faster or play slower. They developed their own ways of teasing their wealthy and rather dim-witted audience. For example, at a single rim shot from the drummer, usually during the kinks you really got me, they would repeat the same phrase over and over, like a record stuck on a turntable. Then, just three days into the engagement, juniors were involved in a horrific car crash that killed their leader and keyboard player, Sugiol Thanos, and his 18-year-old fiancé, and seriously injured their lead guitarist, Alekos Karakantos. The Igloo's manager, George Karamusalis, who had been secretly in love with Thanos, went berserk with grief and trashed the place. Eric had grown to like the juniors, and now showed a solidarity with them that few of his British bandmates would ever know. He volunteered to fill the injured Karakantos' spot while continuing to play with the faces, which meant he was on stage for around six hours every night. Meantime, his companions were growing anxious to be on the move again, a rival club had discovered they were working without the necessary permits and had informed the police, while their hotel had received no payment for their accommodation from Karamusalis and was threatening to evict them. But Karamusalis had finally realised he was employing one of the Yardbirds, whose For Your Love had topped the Greek charts and was determined to capitalise on it. He insisted on giving Eric a room in his own home, house arrest masquerading as Hellenic hospitality, and impounded the face's equipment at the igloo. The junior's drummer tipped Eric the wink that, like Rick Gunnell back in Soho, Karamusalis had underworld connections. If he tried to leave, nasty people might come after him and cut off his hands. It was decided to do a runner after a two-concert memorial for the junior's dead leader, in which Eric had volunteered to perform with the band's survivors. This took place at a cinema in Piraeus and attracted an audience of 10,000, by far his largest to date. It ended in a near riot which almost capsized the escape plan as the police would not allow him to leave the premises until they'd restored order and he was temporarily locked in an office. The group then split up, with Eric, Ben Palmer and Bob Ray returning to London by train 
while the others valiantly drove the country sedan onward towards Australia. Miraculously, it would get as far as Karachi, Pakistan. Eric had managed to keep hold of his precious Gibson guitar, although his amplifier had to be left behind at the igloo. Terrified that Karamasulis's heavies or the police might appear at any moment, he and his co-fugitives hid in the station toilets until their train left. On arrival back at Victoria, he borrowed some money from Palmer, went into a phone box and rang John Mayle to say he was home and wanted to resume his old job in the Blues Breakers. It just struck him as perfectly natural. He was back in England and should be back in the band, Palmer recalled. It never crossed his mind that Mayle might have said no. He got into a taxi round to John's and left me there. 8. Just Like Freddy It wasn't as if Mayle had been stuck for a suitable replacement. In the process of trying out various other lead guitarists, he chanced on Peter Green from Bethnal Green, East London, who at 20 was already a player of fluid mastery. But a promise was a promise. After appearing with the Blues Breakers only three times, Green found himself elbowed aside by Eric. He would be back sooner than he knew. Nor was this the only personnel change during Eric's Greek adventure. John McVie had been fired as bass player yet again and been replaced by Jack Bruce, formerly of the Graham Bond organisation. Bruce was one of the uncommon breed who came to rock from a classical music background. Born in Lanarkshire, Scotland in 1943, he had studied cello, piano and musical composition at the Royal Scottish Academy of Music before switching to stand-up bass and traditional jazz. That milieu first brought him together with South London-born Peter Ginger Baker, four years his senior, whose hair was flaming red and who played drums, one early bandmate noted, like a wild animal. Bruce and Baker were both in Alexis Corner's Blues Incorporated, the seminary for young British bluesmen. Their graduation was to team with Corner's pudgy keyboard player, Graham Bond in what became the Graham Bond Organisation. Augmented by a fourth Corner alumnus, saxophonist Dick Hextel-Smith, the GBO played a jazz-blues fusion that never scored commercially but was highly regarded within the profession. In particular, Bruce, now on bass guitar, and Baker were regarded as a rhythm section without peer. The trouble was that they detested each other. That one was a truculent pocket-sized Scot, the other an Irish cockney with a hair-trigger temper, had guaranteed conflict from the start. In all rhythm sections before, save the Beatles, the drummer had been the focus of attention, the bass player simply a vague background thud. But Bruce, to whom a bass guitar was a doddle after the stand-up variety, never mind the cello, showed an increasing tendency to play it as if it were a lead instrument. Open warfare frequently broke out on stage, with Baker firing off drumsticks like guided missiles at the back of Bruce's head, and Bruce hurling his bass, not just the guitar but the stand-up one, at Baker. The worst eruption came one night in Golders Green, North London, during the climactic Baker drum solo that closed the GBO's set. According to Baker, Bruce kept playing along with his bass drum, then screamed into the mic, you're playing too fucking loud, man. So I offloaded a right-hander on him and he goes down on the ground and I'm kicking him and going, get up, you little cunt. I just let go and I was going to kick him to death. Bruce, at the time, was newly married and his wife, Janet, who ran the Graham Bond organization's fan club, so attended most gigs, doughtily took her husband's part. The battles in the band room often rivaled those witnessed by the audience. Baker, along with Graham Bond himself, had become a heroin addict, at a time when few British musicians had yet ventured beyond marijuana. He took to carrying a knife, and in the grip of the drug, was apt not only to pull it during altercations with Bruce, but actually throw it. I got the same thing once, Janet Bruce recalls. In the band room one night I said, 
hello to him in the wrong way, and suddenly there was a knife sticking in the wall behind my head. Bond had by now lost control of his own band, thanks to massive drug use and an equally mind-addling fixation on the occult. Despite his pioneering talent on the organ and mellotron, he would never achieve success and would die under the wheels of a London tube train in 1974. Baker became de facto leader and lost no time in firing Bruce at the point of his knife. Bruce's presence gave Eric's return to the Blues Breakers an extra Philip. Jack was a jazz musician and a very, very avant-garde jazz musician, into people like Charlie Mingus and Miles Davis. He tore up the rule book and took me along with him. He found an equal rapport with drummer Huey Flint, who shared his passion for jazz and had none of Ginger Baker's terrifying touchiness. Often, indeed, Clapton, Bruce and Flint seemed like a self-contained trio ahead of its time. We did a lot of improvising, Flint recalls. Jack and I would be playing in 6-8 or 12-8 and then suddenly double the tempo. Eric loved all that. But after about a month... Bruce found he couldn't survive on Blues Break of Wages and left to join the by now hugely successful Manfred Mann, whose leader, rather embarrassingly, lived just up the street from Mail. A fellow musician commented that using him to play the elementary bass riffs the Manfreds required was like doing your shopping at Sainsbury's in a Lamborghini. It is related of Eric's hero of heroes, Robert Johnson, that at the start of his career he showed only modest talent on the guitar and had little about him that compelled attention. At a certain point, he dropped out of sight for a period of time, then reappeared in full possession of his astonishing brilliance. The same was true of Eric when he returned to John Mayles' Blues Breakers, also after having dropped out of sight for a while. At one moment, it seemed, he was just really good. At the next, he was great. With Johnson, there was at least some explanation. He had bartered his soul. But in Eric's case, the gift seemed to have come with no strings attached. Not after a midnight tryst with Satan at a Mississippi crossroads, but somewhere between a woodworker's shop near Oxford, the attic of a suburban house in southeast London, and an obscure club in Athens. Nor had Satan figured in the transaction, apparently for it was around now that Clapton is God appeared on a corrugated iron fence in Islington, North London, spray-painted by an anonymous, but inevitably male, disciple. In the London of 1966, graffiti were still relatively rare, especially as a medium of exaltation rather than execration, and this one achieved the aerosol equivalent of going viral. Not even the Beatles had been elevated to such a level, at least, not yet. And it left Eric characteristically conflicted. On the one hand, he could not have received a bigger boost after being edged out of the Yardbirds and seeing them go on to glory without him. Those splattery black letters were worth more than the most rapturous trade review, because they came from the street, and, as he reflected, there's something about word of mouth you cannot undo. At the same time, he could reel off a long list of guitarists, British and American, whom he thought capable of outplaying him. Reggie Young, from the Bill Black combo that had backed the Ronettes, or James Burton, who'd contributed dazzling solos to early Ricky Nelson singles, or Bernie Watson from Screaming Lord Such as Savages, or even Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page, his present and future successors in the Yardbirds. Half of him felt triumph that the music he'd championed for so long was receiving recognition beyond anything he could have imagined. The other half felt guilty because people like the anonymous worshipper on that North London wall seemed to regard him as its creator. If anyone deserved credit for spreading the gospel, it was Mike Vernon the Decca Records producer who had made some early demos with the Yardbirds and been among their occasional stand-in vocalists. Vernon had since lost touch with Eric, but had followed the trade press drama of his departure from the Yardbirds and recruitment by John Mayle from a sympathetic distance. 
Then, one day in March 1966, he saw that Mail and the Blues Breakers were to play a one-nighter at Kluke's Clique, the West Hampstead pub club located right next door to Decca Records' studio complex. On an impulse, he decided to drop in at the club after work. It was a pure Robert Johnson moment. Vernon hardly recognised the capable but not so far above average lead guitarist with whom he'd once shared a stage. Eric had a Gibson Les Paul and a huge stack of an amp. He was playing in this really strong, aggressive style like Freddie King. In fact, he might have been Freddie King. Decker had already released a John Mayall album without much success, but Vernon urged his superiors to give Mayall another shot, augmented by Eric's volcanic new talent. In the end, I was grudgingly told to go ahead. But I only had a few days, and if it didn't work out, my ass would be on the line. The initial plan was for a live album, and one was duly recorded in its entirety at the Flamingo Club, just before Jack Bruce's departure to Manfred Mann. Unfortunately, the sound quality was so poor that it had to be redone at Decker's West Hampstead Studios, with John McVie back on bass. As Vernon soon discovered, the parallels between Robert Johnson and Eric only went so far. For here was no prodigy so humble and overawed by the mysteries of recording that he kept his face turned to the wall. Whatever the deal struck for his talent, a new self-assertiveness seemed to have been thrown in. The transfixing new sound derived from the marriage of his vintage Gibson Les Paul with one of the whopping Marshall amplifiers that had been specially developed for The Who, then acknowledged to be the world's loudest band. At all recording sessions, it was standard practice for producers to reduce the decibel level in the interest of giving the finished disc a professional sheen. However, Eric wanted to be heard at the same volume on the album as he was on stage. Sympathetic old chum that Vernon was, he agreed to this unprecedented demand. But his young engineer, Gus Dudgeon, later a distinguished producer for Elton John and David Bowie, was totally unprepared for the result. The first time Gus went onto the studio floor and Eric hit a chord, a kind of cockeyed look came over Gus's face. After that, he always went out there wearing headphones, with the lead hanging loose. He looked like one of those people you see on airport tarmac, directing planes to their parking stands. To protect the ears of everyone else, a special booth was built to house Eric's mighty marshal, with extra insulation provided by a grand piano cover, sound-softening wooden baffles, blankets and pillows. Even then, his playing made everything in the studio rattle, Vernon recalls. It had two double-insulated doors with several feet of space between them, but still people in other parts of the building started complaining about the noise. The album was entitled Blues Breakers, with John Mayall's name in large red letters and Eric's in smaller white-on-grey ones. Mayall played piano, Hammond organ and harmonica, performed all but one of the vocals and scattered four of his own compositions through the 12-song track list but everyone, male included, knew whose showcase it really was. In truth, despite its obeisance to Otis Rush, Freddie King, Mose Allison, and even Ray Charles, Blues Breakers counted as only half a blues album. There was scarcely a track where Eric's serious little sunburst Les Paul and Mighty Mouth Marshall didn't seduce him into playing the rawest rock yet to be caught on vinyl. It also contained his first recorded lead vocal, a Robert Johnson song with an unwitting warning to mail, rambling on my mind. The cover image was a straightforward portrait of Mail, Eric, Huey Flint and John McVie, seated side by side on a low wall in London's Old Kent Road. Eric was pretending to be engrossed in a copy of The Beano, one of the weekly comics with which his grandmother, Rose, had deluged his childhood. He later said he'd wanted to be totally uncooperative with the photographer, although such faux naivete was common amongst British pop musicians in the later 60s, Ramblin' certainly was on his mind. 
albeit with no firm destination yet in prospect. In an interview with Melody Maker's Nick Jones, he let drop that he was thinking of emigrating to America because forming a blues band in England is like banging your head against a brick wall. He also made the first of many efforts to deal with the hair shirt burden of Clapton is God. I think I have a power, and my guitar is a medium for expressing that power. I don't need people to say how good I am. I've worked it out by myself. It's nothing to do with technique and rehearsing. It has to do with the person behind that guitar. It's a medium through which I can make contact to myself. It's pretty lonely. A more suspicious man than John Mayle might have felt unease over the amount of session work Eric was managing to do outside the Blues Breakers. At times, indeed, he seemed more drawn to the life of an anonymous studio musician on whom no one could pin a god tag. The bookings coming his way nowadays were a definite improvement on that aborted collaboration with Bob Dylan a year earlier. Among Mike Vernon's other current projects was an album with the American blues pianist Otis Spann. After Blues Breakers, Vernon asked Eric to play on a session with Spann that was to include one of his earliest musical gods, Muddy Waters. He was very sheepish about it, Vernon recalls. Are you sure you really want me? He kept saying. For contractual reasons, Waters appeared on the album under a pseudonym, Brother, and the master of Chicago electric blues furnished only rhythm to Eric's lead. Muddy and Otis both loved his playing, and they liked him, Vernon says. In my experience, he was never other than completely likable. He was also approached by the American producer Joe Boyd to join a London-based studio band for the new Electra label, largely recruited from Manfred Mann and the Spencer Davis group, and known as the Powerhouse. What resulted was a supergroup in all but name, with Paul Jones on vocals, Stevie Winwood on guitar, Pete York on drums, Ben Palmer on piano, and Jack Bruce on bass. Though the project came to nothing, it deepened Eric's respect for Bruce's musicianship, and they found the same easy rapport they had had as colleagues under John Mayle. While all this, and more, was going on, Mayle continued to believe Eric's wanderlust had been satisfied by his Greek adventure, and to treat him almost like a son. The birth of a fourth child had obliged the males to take back the attic room at their house that he'd been occupying for almost a year. Yet, with continuing open-heartedness, they threw a party there for his 21st birthday on 20th of March. Such an enormous crowd turned up that when Pamela Mayle returned from teaching her evening class, she was unable to get in via the front door and had to climb through a downstairs window. Among the leavening of Eric's intellectual friends was a rising young poet named Pete Brown, who'd recently found himself sharing a bill with the Blues Breakers at an arts festival at Southampton University. It also included a beauty contest, which John Mayle, Eric and I were asked to judge, Brown recalls. Eric may have thought there could be some sexual perks involved, but at the end, the winner made a quick exit, unscathed. The party was in fancy dress, fulfilling a fantasy of Eric since he used to stare into the windows of Berman's theatrical costumiers in his dawn wanderings around the West End after the marquee closed. He wore a gorilla suit, Pete Brown says. I think it was partly to dodge a certain female singer who was after him, but he wasn't keen on. I better not say who it was because she's still around. John Mayle's costume, ironically, was that of a cyclops, the mythical being with a single eye in the centre of its forehead. Yet the trusting male still did not think to keep even one eye on Eric. Until then, he had barely smoked, but to mark his coming of age, he opened a pack of 20 Benson and Hedges gold cigarettes, crammed everyone into his mouth, and lit them up simultaneously. It was the start of a 30-year addiction that would eventually reach 60 per day. Eric had been in Oxford when John Mayle recruited him, and it was in Oxford that Mayle lost him. One May night in 1966, when the Blues Breakers were appearing at the city's town hall, Ginger Baker unexpectedly dropped by. 
Like most people who came into Baker's orbit, Eric had always been a little afraid of him. Although only 26, he seemed preternaturally aged, or rather, ageless, his long frame emaciated, his cheeks hollow, his eyes glaring through a constellation of freckles, his flaming hair tied back in an undersized bun like a small detonation on its own. All in all, nature had constructed so perfect an image of a heroin addict that it hardly seemed worth the trouble of actually becoming one. He sat in with the Blues Breakers for a single number that brought Huey Flint's drum kit to the brink of destruction, then offered Eric a lift back to London in his rather impressive Rover 3000. After his display on the skins, it was no surprise to his passenger that he drove like a maniac. While beating up the A40, he explained how, owing to the disintegration of Graham Bond, it had fallen to him, as the lesser of the Bond organization's two junkies, to take the reins of leadership. Now, after three years of running someone else's band, he'd decided to form one of his own, and the first name he'd thought of was Eric's. He saw something in me that I never saw before, Eric would recall. Ginger was pretty dismissive and antisocial, seriously antisocial, but he had the gift, the spark, the flair, the panache. He had it in spades. As it happened, Eric had recently watched one of his younger blues heroes, the effervescent buddy guy, give a memorable performance at the marquee. In place of the usual three or four strong backing band, Guy worked only with a drummer and bass player, yet still generated such showmanship and sheer volume that no spectator could feel shortchanged. He'd also seen Baker and Jack Bruce play together in the Graham Bond organization, like a well-oiled machine, on nights when Baker chanced not to be throwing his double bass at Baker, nor Baker trying to kick Bruce to death. To him, they seemed the ideal partners in a Buddy Guy-style trio, a configuration until then almost unknown in commercial rock or pop. He therefore agreed to join up with Baker on condition that Bruce was also invited. Merely the mention of that name, he recalls, made Baker almost crash the car. It was a measure of Eric's potential value that Baker did not dismiss the idea out of hand, but agreed to go away and think about it. A few days later, he reluctantly acquiesced, muttering, it'll never work, and providing Eric with a lengthy inventory of Jack Bruce's character defects. A man not best known for his diplomatic skills then had to woo the bandmate he'd recently fired from the Graham Bond organization at Knife Point. Astonishingly, Bruce did not dismiss the idea out of hand. He had already become disillusioned with Manfred Mann and was delighted by the prospect of working with Eric once again. They met on neutral ground, my parents' flat in St. John's Wood, Janet Bruce says. In my memory, Eric and Jack both said they'd only work with Ginger if he came off the smack, which, being Ginger, he did in about a week. With the lineup complete, Baker contacted the melody maker journalist Chris Welch to impart what he expected to be a front page story in MM's imminent next issue. Much to his annoyance, the front page had already gone to press, but a small inside piece announced Eric's defection from the Blues Breakers and Jack Bruce's from Manfred Mann to join him in a sensational groups group, as yet unnamed. That was the first John Mayle heard of it. The ensuing confrontation with Mayle, Eric would later say with some understatement, was not a happy experience. Leaving aside questions of ingratitude and underhandedness, an album was soon to come out by John Mayle and the Blues Breakers with Eric Clapton, which now would be out of date before it hit the turntables. The only consolation was that a successor, the brilliant Peter Green, was already waiting in the wings. In June 1966, the trio had a first, acoustic-only rehearsal at Ginger Baker's home. Not a cave on some wild moor, as might possibly have been expected, but a maisonette on Brymar Avenue in the crushingly ordinary London suburb of Neasden, where he lived with his totally calm and normal wife Liz. Beyond his back garden lay the huge Brent Reservoir, known as the Welsh Harp, 
on whose raised grass embankment children from the neighbourhood were playing in the sun. The arguing started almost immediately. Like Eric, Bruce had had no chance to inform his present band he was quitting and was furious with Baker for rushing the story into Melody Maker without consulting him. At intervals, like parents warring in front of a child, each of them called on Eric to bear witness to the truth of their grim forewarnings about the other. That's typical of him, and, you see, he always does that. Then they began to play together. Baker and Bruce both stopped looking daggers and broke into smiles. And through the window, on the Welsh Harp's grass embankment, the neighbourhood children could be seen boogieing along. 9. Stiggy Another dispute quickly blew up about the management of the still unnamed trio. Ginger Baker wanted to give the job to the Graham Bond organization's Australian manager, Robert Stigwood. Stigboot, as Baker called him. Bruce resisted the idea, saying that a good booking agent was all they needed, so Eric, in effect, had the casting vote. Stigwood, then aged 32, had barely started on the road to becoming pop music's first multimedia showman. Born in Adelaide, reputedly Australia's most straight-laced city, he had felt an early vocation for the Catholic priesthood, but had instead chosen training as an advertising copywriter. In 1955, he'd made his way to Britain overland via India, arriving with a severe dose of dysentery and just three pounds in his pocket. To begin with, the only work he could find was as a supervisor in an institution for what were then termed backward teenage boys. More useful preparation for his future in pop could hardly be imagined. By 1961, he was a partner in a small theatrical agency, which not entirely coincidentally specialised in good-looking young male actors. One of them, John Layton, possessed a singing voice of sorts and Stigwood paid for him to cut a single, Johnny Remember Me, with the independent producer Joe Meek. The record made no impression until Stigwood fixed for Leighton to perform it in a TV soap opera, whereupon it went to number one. It was the first example of the cross-media marketing of pop at which he would later excel. As a manager and promoter, Stiggy grew famous for constantly teetering on the edge of insolvency which somehow never inhibited his opulent lifestyle, and for the hefty cut he took from his artists. After a Rolling Stones UK tour he organised, the musicians ended up with so little that an enraged Keith Richards beat him up in a club full of people. He got the knee for every grandiodus, Richards later recalled. Sixteen of them. Still more extreme physical retribution followed his attempt to entice the small faces away from their manager, Don Arden, a terrifying figure justifiably nicknamed the Al Capone of Pop. Turning up unannounced at Stigwood's office accompanied by four heavies, Arden scooped him from behind his desk and dangled him out of the fourth-floor window by his ankles. Stigwood's real skill lay not in spotting and developing new talent, but diversifying into areas that managers normally left to others, such as music publishing, concert promotion, and record production. In March 1966, he set up his own record company, Reaction, quickly scoring a huge British hit with Substitute by The Who, whom he'd lured away from Brunswick by dint of already being their booking agent. Like many of the first generation of British pop managers, including its two best-known figures, Larry Parnes and Brian Epstein, Stigwood was gay. At a time when homosexuality was still illegal, the fact had to be carefully concealed, nowhere more so than in a business whose raw material overwhelmingly consisted of pretty young men. Even now that male fashions were becoming increasingly feminised, nothing in Stiggy's appearance or manner gave the slightest hint of his perilous secret. What Eric saw at their first meeting was a seemingly conventional executive type in a flared suit and platformed heeled boots, his hair clouding his ears, 
his eyes slightly protruding, his Australian accent determinedly low-key, his expansive smile a little too full of teeth to seem quite trustworthy. They talked in Stigwood's office at his luxurious flat in New Cavendish Street, Marleybone. As he sat behind his ornate desk, expatiating on his plans for the new threesome, Eric thought it mostly a lot of flannel, but he was impressed that Stigwood seemed to understand and utterly sympathise with their musical mission. In fact, it was all a lot of flannel. Stigwood had little interest in the blues and how it might be refashioned, but a great deal of interest in Eric. For a time, it looked as if the threesome would take the superlatively embarrassing name Sweet and Sour Rock and Roll. Then Eric thought of calling themselves Cream, for the very simple reason that we were the cream of the crop, the elite in our respective domains. It was also a nod to the new hedonism which the swinging 60s had brought to Britain, epitomised by the lavish use of double cream by fashionable cooks like Robert Carrier and in recipes in the glossy Sunday coloured supplements. Plain cream without a the was as radical a step as being only three, not four, or five. In fact, Eric's former keenness on the guitar, bass, drums format was giving way to anxiety that it might be altogether too non-conformist, and in particular that he'd be unable to cope with playing both rhythm and lead. His anxiety increased at Cream's first full electric rehearsal in a church hall in Kensal Rise where a troop of brownies also happened to be convening. Without a fourth member, preferably on keyboards, he thought they sounded too thin and proposed getting Stevie Winwood from the Spencer Davis group as reinforcement, but neither Baker nor Bruce would hear of it. The only journalist invited to the rehearsals was Chris Welch from The Melody Maker. Welch found Baker and Bruce somewhat at cross-purposes with Eric, in viewing Cream as a new medium for the jazz they both still loved. In another surprising show of harmony, Bruce characterised the two of them as fugitives from Ornette Coleman, for whom the blues was unfamiliar, even unsympathetic terrain. However, Eric defined the band's objective firmly as blues, ancient and modern. I'd say jazz is definitely out and sweet and sour rock and roll is in. The erstwhile art student came to the fore as he outlined some of his Dada-esque ideas for stage presentation. We want to have turkeys on stage while we're playing. We all like turkeys, and it's nice to have them around. Another Dada thing. I was going to have this hat made from a brim with a cage and a live frog inside. It would be very nice to have stuffed bears on stage, too. Robert Stigwood was hovering in the background clearly at a loss as to what to make of all this and wondering whether his new acquisition stood any chance of commercial success. "'Are they any good?' he asked Chris Welch anxiously. Welch reassured him fervently that they were. July saw John Mayle's Bluesbreaker album with Eric Clapton's billing, now almost three months out of date. It gave Mayle the biggest commercial success of his career, reaching number six in the UK chart, and staying in the top 20 for 17 weeks, despite the pressure of heavyweight pop albums like the Beach Boys' Pet Sounds and the Beatles' Revolver. The reviews all paid tribute to Mayle's dedication to the blues, but in truth, his thankless surrogate son had hijacked the whole thing, even unto its unofficial title, The Beano Album. Among Eric's professional rivals, there was awed discussion of the Clapton sound, that Freddie King fieriness shading into rock with a martial amp at full throttle. Many believed a first step to replicating it was to equip themselves similarly with sunburst Gibson Les Pauls. No easy matter, as Eric's particular model, henceforward dubbed the Beano guitar, had ceased production in 1960. Such was the clamour for second-hand instruments that Gibson eventually had to reintroduce it. In the future, vintage specimens would fetch as much as £250,000. John Mayall and the Blues Breakers without Eric Clapton would go on, giving a first platform to many other brilliant young players, though none ever surpassing him. 
the seemingly indestructible male would still be gigging in his 80s, just as Eric still would be in his 70s. Cream were to make their official debut at the Windsor Jazz and Blues Festival, which was the old Richmond Jazz and Blues Festival transferred to Windsor's Royal Racecourse on the 31st of July 1966. The night before, they did a warm-up gig at the Twisted Wheel Club in Manchester, a familiar venue to Eric since his days with the Roosters, deputising at the last minute for the American soul singer Joe Tex. They made the journey, not in the usual cramped van, but an Austin Westminster saloon car, just a couple of notches below a limo, purchased for their exclusive use by Robert Stigwood. At the wheel was Eric's friend and fellow rooster, Ben Palmer, acting as their chauffeur just this once, as he naively thought, and looking forward to watching the performance at his leisure. Only after delivering them did the kindly woodcarver find he was also expected to carry in their equipment and set up the stage, despite possessing barely enough technical expertise to stick a jack plug into an amp. He realised he'd been appointed Cream's roadie, and, as always, found it impossible to say no to Eric. The timing of this sneak preview could hardly have been worse. A few hours earlier, England had won the Soccer World Cup after a thrilling final against West Germany amid national jubilation, tinged by memories of the recent Second World War, which would still be resonating half a century on. Even the most besotted Mancunian music fans that night were more preoccupied with the makeup of a football eleven than a rock trio. Eric, Bruce and Baker played blues covers to an almost empty club, treating it as little more than an extra rehearsal. But when the Windsor Jazz and Blues Festival kicked off the next day, World Cup euphoria turned into an advantage. A 15,000-strong crowd cheerfully braved the squally weather for The Who, the Spencer Davis Group, The Move, the ever-decreasing sprinkle of jazz combos, and a struggling band named Bluesology whose podgy organ player Reggie Dwight was not yet remotely recognisable as the future Elton John. The three-day programme should also have included the Yardbirds, now with two further hit singles, Shape of Things and Over Under Sideways Down, to their credit since Eric's departure. However, they pulled out because of illness, not Keith Relf's for once. Jeff Beck had tonsillitis. A backstage encounter might have been awkward as Eric, still bitter, had told a music paper they habitually use Ralph's bad health as an excuse to Welsh on bookings. The festival's undisputed headliners were The Who, who concluded their set by smashing their equipment to pieces, a ritual characterised by their former art student, guitarist Pete Townsend, as an auto-destructive art event, but regarded by most of the audience as straightforward, joyous vandalism, while their joint managers, Kit Lambert and Chris Stamp, tossed smoke bombs among the broken guitar necks and kicked in amps. Cream's name, having been decided on too late to appear in the programme, were simply billed as Eric Clapton, Jack Bruce and Ginger Baker, a running order that would become as immutable as John, Paul, George and Ringo. Theirs was hardly a star spot halfway through the concluding Sunday evening with the Harry South big band standing by to follow them. It had already been raining intermittently, but before they were announced, a heavy shower began. They elected to go on nevertheless. Despite all the rehearsing, they only had about four songs which they thought ready to unveil to a live audience. At one point, Ginger Baker found himself in the unusual position of apologising because they were playing everything twice over and hugely elongated. Still, the crowd stayed put amid the downpour, sustained by something more than post-World Cup good spirits. Eric's incredible guitar induced the audience to shout and scream for more, wrote melody makers Chris Welch, even while he was playing more. Apart from riding to gigs in an Austin Westminster, Eric at first found life under Robert Stigwood's management little different than before. Stigwood was booking cream into much the same club, pub and college venues they were long accustomed to playing with their respective previous bands and charging only £5 more for them 
than he did for the Graham Bond organization. It was several weeks before the various promoters could be dissuaded from billing them as the cream. Then, in a seeming ill omen for the new regime, Eric's cherished Gibson Les Paul was stolen from a rehearsal room. The Record Mirror published a description as detailed as a missing person bulletin. Cigarette burns on the front, shoulder strap carved with the names of Buddy Guy, Big Maceo and Otis Rush on the inside, but it never came back. A week later at Kluke's Clique, its carrying case was also stolen, evidently by the same faithful fan. Actually, Stigwood was investing heavily in a band that hadn't yet released a hit single, or even entered the recording studio together. If they didn't have much extra cash to spend, they were now represented by a West End PR firm, Mayfair Public Relations, which operated out of a muse house in Bruton Place and sounded as if it had been there forever. Mayfair was in fact a brand new company whose youngest partner, Ray Williams, in true swinging London style, was only 19. Golden-haired and angelically handsome enough to have been a pop star himself, a fact that did not escape Stigwood's attention, Williams took on the cream account. He already knew Eric vaguely from his early days as an unpaid dancing extra on the Ready Steady Go television show. Whenever the Yardbirds appeared, I always noticed him as the most friendly one, even though they were the big stars and I was nobody. Cream proved anything but a tough sell for their teenage PR man. When Stiggy gave Mayfair the account, there was already a tremendous buzz about them, Williams recalls. At the sound of those three names, every pop journalist in Fleet Street took notice. Many went along expecting the on-stage slugging matches for which Bruce and Baker had been famous in the Graham Bond organisation. But after their opening exchange of volleys, they observed an unspoken armistice. The conflict between them didn't go away, but it was shelved, at least for a time, recalls Pete Brown, who was soon to become an indispensable element in Cream's rise. They just settled down and got on with it. There was, however, one pressing problem that threatened to scupper the supergroup before it had begun. Fleet Street's grubbiest Sunday scandal sheet, The News of the World, had discovered Ginger Baker's history as a heroin addict and was about to splash a story that still could do great harm even though Baker was now clean. This was averted in a manner unimaginable today. Williams and Mayfair co-director Simon Hayes met the journalist concerned in a pub and managed to persuade him the story was untrue and should be killed. A lesser but vexing problem for a publicist was Cream's seemingly contradictory ingredients of rock, blues and jazz. Jack Bruce, more articulate than most journalists ever bothered to discover, offered the clearest mission statement. We want to be ourselves and take the fabulous language of the blues and apply it to rock music. But for Eric, whose only motivation had once been to honour the tradition of the blues, the very word now seemed almost a stigma. A year ago, I used to listen to all blues bands, but I wouldn't now because they're just playing blues, not developing their own style, he told Record Mirror's Richard Green. Chris Farlow and Zoot Money are just churning out Tamla Motown and stuff. I'm no longer trying to play like anything but a white man. The time is overdue when people should play like they are and what colour they are. At the time... The only other sole guitarist in a prominent band was the Who's windmill-armed, instrument-bashing Pete Townsend. And for a brief space, Eric seemed to be heading in Townsend's direction. During an appearance at Leeds University, in another scene unimaginable today, he brought an outsized firework on stage, announcing that it was a bomb capable of blowing up the whole band, and if anyone cared to light it, they could. Cream were non-conformist, above all in their lead vocals, which, save on the few occasions when Eric could be persuaded, would be Jack Bruce's department. For the truculent little Scott, with the delicate poet's face, possessed a pure, clear tenor which soared high above the guitar and drums, devoid of rock's obligatory raunch, yet nonetheless suffused with ardour or angst. At that time, 
the only remotely comparable voice belonged to Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. In the 70s, the same air of a fallen angel or ruined choir boy would be manifested by Freddie Mercury of Queen. Undaunted by all these diverse elements, Ray Williams came up with a tagline of almost biblical portentousness. The first is last, and the last is first, but the first, the second, and the last are cream. Trios currently dominated Eric's life, as he was living with three young women in a flat in Ladbroke Square, Notting Hill Gate. They were Americans, part of the transatlantic pilgrimage to what Time magazine that summer had dubbed the style capital of Europe. He had met them after a show, at a moment when he was once again temporarily homeless, and, surprise, surprise, had immediately been offered lodging with them. Despite their foggy-eyed adulation, his relationship with all three was purely platonic. The experience of simply being friends with attractive females, he later recalled, made him feel very grown up, though it would seldom recur in his life. Given the demands of his sex life away from the flat, it was also rather a relief. The style capital of Europe's latest trend, in the ubiquitous word of the moment, was to look back with irony on the Victorian age, still enshrined by its palaces, monuments and monarchical pageantry. Young men who preached the ideals of love and peace and railed against American colonial oppression in Vietnam saw no contradiction in sporting antique military tunics of the same bully red with which the British Empire used to colour the globe. The zeitgeist was perfectly caught in a new shop in the Portobello Road called I Was Lord Kitchener's Valet, pastiching the mustachioed commander-in-chief whose pointing finger had summoned millions to slaughter in the Great War. Eric was among its best customers, and his collection of braided and buttoned scarlet tunics, like all his crazes, bordering on the obsessive, was renowned. For his numerous shopping expeditions, he discovered a sympathetic companion in Jack Bruce's wife Janet. We were in the tube one day, coming up the escalator, she recalls. Suddenly, some people on the down escalator recognised him and shouted, Look, there's God! Eric didn't know where to put himself. He had also acquired a car, despite being still unable to drive and unequal to the exertion of learning and taking a test. It was a bulbous 1938 Cadillac, with running boards and white-walled tyres that he'd seen on a used car lot in Seven Sisters Road and impulsively purchased for £750. The dealer drove it to Ladbrook Square, where it remained, like an abandoned getaway vehicle in a pre-war gangster film, gradually obscured by a carapace of leaves from the plane trees above. Having a homosexual manager, albeit one so discreet and outwardly undetectable as Robert Stigwood, was something to which Eric had quickly adjusted. Tolerance had little to do with it. The word gay was still barely used outside the theatrical profession, and working-class boys like himself and his bandmates spoke of queers, puffs, nances, or fruits, without an iota of understanding. They regarded Stigwood's sexuality as an occupational hazard, each fervently hoping he'd never be put in the position of having to thump the man who'd promised to make their fortune. At the outset, Stigwood had had designs on Eric, and to a lesser degree, Jack Bruce. There was a certain amount of pursuit of both of them, says Pete Brown. Eric was very pretty in those days. He was the sex interest. But, as Robert discovered, you couldn't have found two more heterosexual guys. Eric's fending off of Stigwood had no adverse effects on their professional relationship, as it might easily have done. When the American teen star Fabian rejected his manager's advances, his career ended in that moment. There was never any doubt about his favourite member of Cream, recalls Neville Chesters, who'd recently quit as the Who's roadie to become Stigwood's driver, PA. Ginger was a great drummer, but he frightened everyone and Jack was very quiet, Robert recognised Eric had something special that he could build on. Proof of this most favoured status was that while Bruce and Baker were expected to make their own way to Stigwood's office apartment in DeWalden Court, New Cavendish Street, 
just as would be sent to fetch Eric in the manager's white Bentley Continental. I think it was the first time he'd played the part of a rock star, being chauffeur-driven around town. He used to sit in the back and count the number of stairs he got. Stigwood, at the time, was seeing a great deal of Brian Epstein, whose gay life was far less under control. As it happened, Cream's publicists, Mayfair Public Relations, also represented the Seville Theatre in Shaftesbury Avenue, which Epstein owned and had latterly turned into a venue for top American rock and soul acts. Simon, my business partner, and I lived above our office in Bruton Place, Ray Williams recalls. Late one night, there's a ring at the door, and it's Stiggy, Brian, and Eric. They'd been out for dinner, drunk a lot of wine, and were very giggly. In my office, I had a record turntable and a stack of records, the little vinyl 45s. Stiggy picked one up and threw it across the room, and in no time we were having a 45s fight. It was all great fun until I threw one at Stiggy, which hit him on the forehead, opened a cut and blood started pouring out. On the 1st of October 1966, Cream were playing another rather small-scale college gig at the Central London Polytechnic in Great Titchfield Street. In the adjacent pub, Jack Bruce ran into a fellow bass player, Chaz Chandler, formerly of The Animals, a podgy Paul McCartney lookalike who had lately branched out into management. With Chandler was a discovery he'd just signed in New York, a young black singer-guitarist of extraordinary beauty, wearing a many-buttoned military tunic and the first Afro haircut Eric had ever seen. His name was Jimi Hendrix. In the way familiar in jazz and blues, but not yet in rock, Chandler asked if his protégé could sit in with Cream for a number. Both Eric and Bruce were amenable, having already heard rumours that the protégé was rather good. Baker muttered, but was overruled. By an unlucky coincidence, the number was Howling Wolf's Killing Floor, which Eric had mastered only with some difficulty. Now he saw it performed with almost contemptuous ease by the gorgeous Black Wraith in British Empire Scarlet, whose voice veered from blues roar to lullaby tender, and who used feedback and distortion to produce swooping, swooning sounds no electric guitar ever had before all with showmanship and breathtaking provocativeness. The Who's guitar massacres seemed tame indeed as Hendrix played his behind his head without fluffing a note, fellated its strings with a serpentine tongue that seemed immune to electric shock, or laid it flat on the stage and practically raped it. Halfway through the song, Eric stopped playing, Charles Chandler would recall. Both his hands dropped down to his sides, then he walked off stage. I ran back to the dressing room and he was standing there, trying to light a cigarette with his hand shaking. He said, You never told me he was that fucking good. 10. NSU A week later, Cream's first single, Wrapping Paper, was released on Robert Stigwood's reaction label, to widespread disappointment and puzzlement. Expecting a thunderbolt... The music press instead got a sleepy lullaby, with Jack Bruce singing in an unaccustomed, low, whispery tone, as well as playing honky-tonk piano and bowing a cello, with a sound like whales distantly calling to each other. Little was heard from Eric and Ginger Baker, but background harmonies vaguely reminiscent of a barbershop quartet. After the instrumental tracks were recorded, Bruce had summoned the beat poet Pete Brown to Ray Rick Studios in Chalk Farm to improvise some lyrics about wrapping paper in the gutter, awakening memories of lost love in a house by the shore. Not blues, not rock, not jazz, but nostalgia? The reviewers bent over backwards to be charitable. Melody Maker's influential columnist, The Raver, almost apologising that it's too weird for us. It managed to reach only number 34 in the UK chart and did not find an American release. Stigwood sought to save face by claiming that 10,000 copies had had to be withdrawn from sale because of pressing problems. Baker loathed wrapping paper, ever afterwards calling it the most appalling piece of shit I've ever heard in my life. By his account, Eric felt the same, but the two of them had been outmaneuvered by the entity that henceforward he would refer to with increasing rancour as Bruce Brown. 
Eric and I hated it, but they went and formed their little club and got it released. Eric, however, expressed himself perfectly happy with wrapping paper and firmly stamped on the idea that it, or anything else, had caused dissent within cream. It's the only group where we all work to knock each other out as well as the... Their debut album, released just eight days after I Feel Free, the first to appear on Stigwood's reaction label, offered a different, though not much more, revealing image. Its cover was a shadowy photograph of Eric and Bruce wearing outsized goggles like old-fashioned aviators or racing drivers, while Baker sported a military tunic in blue rather than the usual scarlet, lined with its former owner's campaign ribbons. The title, Fresh Cream, was drop-shaped as if poised to fall into a goblet of Irish coffee. The ten tracks, which did not include I Feel Free or Wrapping Paper, were divided between regular blues from their stage act, Willie Dixon's Spoonful, Muddy Waters' Rollin' and Tumblin', Skip James' I'm So Glad, and original songs from their various hands which did not easily fit into any category. Dreaming, NSU, Sleepy Time Time, Sweet Wine, Toad. The collection was above all a showcase for Jack Bruce's lead voice, its purity, agility and passion. Eric's only solo lead vocal amounted to a musical comfort blanket, Robert Johnson's Four Until Late. Fresh Cream received unanimous praise in the British trades. Melody Maker typifying a general note of relief that they'd finally come good. These, then, are the men of cream, the group they said would never work, wrote Chris Welch. Three exceptional and confident young musicians, successful and free to play what they want. It couldn't happen a few years ago, it's happening now. It augurs well for 1967 and music. By January, the album was at number six. It was no less a breakthrough for Ray Williams, the gold-topped young PR who'd handled Cream's Press. Two years later, as head of Liberty Records' London office, he would be responsible for bringing together another songwriting team of performer and poet-lyricist in the Bruce Brown mode, Elton John and Bernie Taupin. Robert Stigwood had promised to reward Williams with an all-expenses-paid foreign jaunt if Cream became a hit. Accordingly, he now found himself spirited away to Antibes in the south of France, where Stigwood had been lent a yacht belonging to his financial backer, David Shaw. We had dinner on shore, then I very firmly said, Good night, Robert, and went to my cabin, Williams recalls. About three minutes later, there's a knock at the door. It's Stiggy, saying he loves me. The most important dividend of the album's success was to send Cream to the country from which all their eclectic musical inspiration derived. In March 1967, Stigwood negotiated a deal for Fresh Cream to come out on New York's Atco label, a subsidiary of Atlantic Records. For once, a managerial decision provoked no argument in the ranks. Baker being just as chuffed as the other two. Atlantic was in large part the creation of Ahmet Ertegun, son of a former Turkish ambassador to the US, who had abandoned his college studies in medieval philosophy to pursue his passion for blues and soul music. With his brother, Nesui, and producer Jerry Wexler, he had built up a matchless catalogue that included Ray Charles, Otis Redding, Aretha Franklin, Wilson Pickett, Percy Sledge, Sam and Dave, Solomon Burke, and the Drifters. Implausible as it seemed, the bald, bearded, immaculately blazered Turkish American was also the composer of numerous classic R&B songs. Ertegun had had his eye on Eric as a potential signing since seeing him jam with Wilson Pickett's band at London's Scotch of St. James Club a few months earlier. On the evidence of fresh cream, other Atlantic executives thought Jack Bruce the star of the band, but their boss knew better. I always knew what I had, and what I had was Eric Clapton, he would remember. The trio was great, but the sole part was Eric Clapton. Ertegun was insistent that Cream should visit New York with all speed to promote the album and begin recording a follow-up one in Atlantic's own studios. 
Stigwood found a means of financing through his role as the Who's booking agent. On the 25th of March, the guitar batterers were scheduled to begin a 10-day appearance in a live show at Manhattan's RKO Theatre, presented by the famous DJ Murray the K and co-starring Wilson Pickett, Simon and Garfunkel, Smokey Robinson, Mitch Ryder, Blues Project and The Young Rascals. Stigwood popped cream in at the bottom of the bill. The trip to New York brought a radical new look, dictated by their most fashion-conscious member. At Eric's impetus, out went military tunics and Amy Johnson goggles, in came brocaded waistcoats, crushed velvet-flared trousers, snakeskin boots, peach-coloured satin shirts with leg and mutton sleeves and collars reaching down to nipple level, all embellished with scarves, cummerbunds, necklaces, bracelets and amulets. The makeover extended to their instruments. Through their PRs, they had met a Dutch couple named Simon Postuma and Marijke Kroger, who were currently designing Art Nouveau-inspired posters for Brian Epstein's Seville Theatre. Later, under the pseudonym of The Fool, they would decorate the exterior of the Beatles' ill-fated Apple Boutique in Baker Street. Postuma and Kroger's first commission as court artists to Britain's rock aristocracy was to paint psychedelic designs on Eric's Gibson SG guitar and Bruce's Fender bass and around the sides of Baker's drums. The image they chose for Eric was a naked cherub figure with wild flowing hair, a starry sky above it and hell flames beneath. The cherub's hirsuteness had a real-life model, for his hair had been sculpted into the Afro style he'd seen on Jimi Hendrix, a tightly curled aureole whose volume was a tribute to the ongoing health of his scalp. It gave him a rather top-heavy look, accentuating his pointed features and habitual expression of wary anxiety. During his grey post-war childhood, America had been a paradise by proxy that flaunted its colour and energy and luxury and enormity on cinema screens while remaining as unreachable as the moon. Before setting off, in his methodical way, he made a to-do list of everything he'd once fantasised about in the darkness of Ripley's single picture house. He would buy a pair of cowboy boots and a fringed buckskin jacket and visit a diner for a hamburger and milkshake that would be nothing like their feeble British counterfeits. Stigwood did not feel it worth his while to be present at this crucial moment in Cream's career and organised the journey as much on the cheap as possible. With them to New York went an entourage of only three. Eric's faithful Ben Palmer, acted as tour manager, supported by two roadies, Mike Turner and Bert Schrader. Janet Bruce also went along. Baker could have claimed the same prerogative, but his wife, Liz, preferred to be at home with their small daughter. Times had certainly changed since the Beatles' historic landing at John F. Kennedy Airport in February 1964. Since then, America had become satiated with British-accented music and fallen entirely out of love with British long hair, no longer a signifier of charm and decorous wit, but drugs, promiscuity, protest against US foreign policy in Southeast Asia, and faggots. Some people looked at Eric, Jack and Ginger as if they were wild animals, Janet Bruce recalls. Eric's afro, in particular, got a lot of very hostile stares. Kindred spirits were not far away, for in Central Park that Easter Sunday, 10,000 hippies were holding a bee-in in protest against the Vietnam War. Despite their jet lag, the British visitors could not resist a stroll among the multitudes lying about on the green sward in a haze of marijuana smoke. We only smoke dope, Janet Bruce says, but then Jack was given some popcorn spiked with LSD, he was freaking out in case he wouldn't be able to play afterwards. Whereas the Beatles had stayed at the luxurious plaza on Central Park, Cream were accommodated at the grim-looking Gotham Hotel on West 55th Street. Cockroaches ran out of every cupboard or drawer you opened. Next door, a building was being demolished, so explosions were going on all the time. We still thought it was all so exciting. But the show, on which they were booked at the RKO Theatre three blocks away, proved a severe letdown. The promoter, Murray the K. Kaufman, 
had found fame by latching on to the Beatles as a radio WINS disc jockey in 1964, and had since pursued an entrepreneurial career as a self-styled fifth Beatle. Although grandiosely titled Music in the Fifth Dimension, it was a hangover from the package shows at the old Paramount, which used to run continuously from mid-morning to early evening. Cream were contracted to give four performances a day, between 10.30am to 8.30pm, and were forbidden to leave the theatre between shows. Murray the K, whom they had expected to be full of wisecracking bonhomie, proved to be a neurotic character in an ill-fitting toupee, obsessed with the box office, and haunted by fears of misbehaviour among his artistes. The two top American acts, Smokey Robinson and Simon and Garfunkel, both pulled out at the last minute. In a nod to swinging London, the programme included a cheesy dance routine by the promoter's wife Jackie and a troupe of go-go dancers, known as Jackie and the K-Girls' Wild Fashion Show. As the bottom of the bill, Cream were allotted time enough for only three songs. Since The Who and other headliners all began wildly overrunning, this was cut to only one. I'm so glad. Then Murray the K told them to hurry through even that. Nonetheless, in a telephone interview with Melody Maker's Chris Welch, Eric said everything was great too much. On the first day of the run, 17-year-old Catherine James managed to sneak into the theatre between shows with her friend Emeretta, hoping for a glimpse of Smokey Robinson. As they hid out in the stalls, watching the rehearsal in progress, they realised Eric was sitting a few rows away. According to his autobiography, Catherine approached him and, sensing my shyness with women, did her best to put me at my ease. According to her, he was the one who did the approaching. He looked so cute in his granny's, velvet trousers from Chelsea's Granny Takes a Trip boutique, and his afro. Catherine had packed a lot into her 17 years. Born in California to an alcoholic, transsexual father and a sadistically cruel mother, she had run away at 14 and since then survived alone on her eye-popping beauty, golden hair and an infallible homing instinct for British rock stars. When she met Eric, she had just returned from London after an affair with Denny Lane from the Moody Blues. She was currently borrowing a friend's apartment in New York and after only a few minutes' conversation, invited Eric to stay with her there. The gods who always found him cosy billets had smiled again. Catherine showed him around the city and helped him tick the various items off his wish list. The music shops, the clothes shops, the boot shops. He was very generous. He bought me a guild guitar for my birthday and a Native American necklace. He was incredibly sweet, though he could be moody too, so deep in his own thoughts. I have to admit that was a big part of his attraction. The only consolation in Cream's daily house arrest at the RKO Theatre was the camaraderie with their fellow musicians, especially The Who, whose drummer Keith Moon, a.k.a. Moon the Loon, gave even Ginger Baker lessons in anarchy, both on and off the kit. Eric developed a particular friendship with Al Cooper, who played keyboards in Blues Project and had been a key session musician in Bob Dylan's controversial transition from folk to rock. Cooper was in the process of forming a new band named Blood, Sweat and Tears, and took Eric to the Café Ogogo in Greenwich Village to see one of their first performances. Another night at the Café Ogogo, he caught B.B. King, the stateliest and most dapper of old-school bluesmen who played only one note where others would have played three on the cherry red guitar he called Lucille. Afterwards, they were introduced and spent a couple of hours jamming together. B.B. noticed how Eric put the music together so carefully like the pieces of a puzzle. In the blues, you have to have a story to tell, and he told me quite a few. While Fresh Cream had reached only number 29 in the US charts, it had received admiring airplay on FM radio stations across the nation, and Ahmet Ertegun was still just as keen for them to make a follow-up at Atlantic's own studios in the footsteps of Ray Charles, Otis Redding, and Aretha Franklin. Ertegun had assigned them Atlantic's most talented engineer, a collegiate-looking young man named Tom Dowd. Like other studio people before him, Dowd's first experience of their volume level was traumatic. 
They had two of everything other bands only had one of, he would recall. But once he'd adopted their British engineer's practice of wearing headphones at all times, things went swimmingly. With their short-stay work visas about to expire, there was time to lay down only one track, Lordy Mama, which Eric had pulled off Buddy Guy and Junior Wells's album Hoodoo Man Blues. It was agreed they would return to make the bulk of the album the following month. Back at the RKO Theatre, Murray the K was growing increasingly paranoid about the show's poor receipts and the behaviour of its British casts. How's he going to play? The fifth Beatle was heard to wail on finding Ginger Baker under a table, insensible after downing a whole bottle of Bacardi. Most provoking was their ill-concealed mockery of his wife Jackie and her go-go dancers in the wild fashion show, whose length had seemed to increase as Cream's stage time shrank. By way of farewell, the Who and Cream between them had planned to give the show an unscheduled finale by pelting Jackie and the K-Girls' wild fashion show with flour and eggs. The plot was discovered and foiled by Murray the K, but the flour and eggs did not go to waste. They were emptied into the backstage showers to form a glutinous, cream-coloured pudding. Then Pete Townsend was thrown into it. Even for lords of misrule like Baker and Keith Moon, it went without saying that one did not try such things with Eric. In 1967, anyone who was anyone in London's rock community hung out at the Speakeasy Club in Margaret Street. This echo of gangster-operated drinking dens in Prohibition-era America had an added frisson as its co-manager, Laurie O'Leary, had previously run Esmeralda's barn for the Cray Twins. Entry was down a narrow staircase with murals of mob wars in 20s Chicago and through a mirror-glass door into Stygian gloom where the alabaster face of a beetle, a rolling stone, or some lesser chart deity, was often dimly visible. Mixing celebs with non-celebs in this way, the speak seemed to embody the egalitarianism and classlessness so dear to 60s youth culture. In reality, it was as class-bound as any Victorian's gentleman's club in Pall Mall or St. James. Its management kept the most secluded booths for VIPs and ensured that no ordinary mortals bothered them. There, one spring night, Cream's PR man Ray Williams introduced Eric to his girlfriend of the moment, an 18-year-old French fashion model named Charlotte Martin, often to be seen in glossy magazines like Vogue, Nova, and Nineteen. Eric, in his usual instant apocalyptic way, was totally smitten with Charlotte. She was very beautiful in an austere way, classically French with long legs and an incredible figure, he would recall, but it was her eyes that got me. They were slightly oriental with a downward slant, and a little bit sad. Williams obligingly stood aside. Eric and Charlotte began an affair, and before long were living together. Eric's former semi-squatting domestic arrangements now clearly would not do, but the task of finding a flat was as far beyond him as taking a driving test. Robert Stigwood therefore arranged for him to borrow one in Regent's Park, owned by Stigwood's business associate, David Shaw. It was at the speakeasy that he first took one of the mind-expanding or conscious-altering synthetic drugs now flooding into London, mostly from America's west coast, and only recently made illegal. That particular night, all four Beatles were in the club, having just finished their next album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Somebody started handing round tablets warranted to be STP, standing for Serenity, Tranquility, peace, a particularly potent hallucinogen whose effects could last for days. When everyone had freely partaken, George Harrison gave the club DJ a first rough pressing of Sergeant Pepper and asked him to play it. The tiny dance floor filled with stoned people, Eric among them, blissfully dancing to the most blissfully stoned music ever caught on vinyl. At dawn, Everyone spilled outside to find a large contingent of police waiting on the other side of the street in a weird state of paralysis. A few weeks earlier, the law had decided to make an example of the disorderly Rolling Stones by arraigning Mick Jagger and Keith Richards on drugs charges and sending them to trial. 
but busting a sacred beetle, never mind all four at once, remained unthinkable. John Lennon simply gave the masked constabulary the finger, then got into his psychedelic Rolls Royce and was driven away. As can happen with hallucinogens, Eric's initially beatific first trip turned into a nightmare. For the next three days, he was unable to sleep and saw everything as if through a thick pane of glass covered with mathematical equations and hieroglyphics. He couldn't eat meat because it seemed to turn into the living animal it had once been. But this drug, at least, was never to become a serious problem. The speakeasy helped break the block he had seemingly felt about joining Cream's songwriting circle. For some time, he'd been toying with a chord sequence based on the Loving Spoonful's 1966 hit, Summer in the City. Then one night he found himself sharing a table with an acquaintance of Charlotte's, named Martin Sharp, an Australian graphic designer and cartoonist who had been part of the recent Antipodean influx into London's media. Sharp was co-founder of a satirical magazine named Oz, which had already been prosecuted for obscenity in its home country, and whose newly launched British edition was to meet a similar fate. Learning that Eric was a rock musician, he said he'd written a poem which might make suitable lyrics for a song. It was inspired by Homer's epic The Odyssey, about the siege of Troy and the eventful ten-year homeward voyage of its Greek hero Odysseus, or Ulysses. Eric asked to see it, and Sharp jotted it on a paper napkin. It began... You thought the leaden winter would bring you down forever, and you touched the distant beaches with tales of brave Ulysses. Like all the girls who'd ever meant anything to him, Charlotte was soon taken to Ripley to meet Rose. Travelling by the Green Line suburban bus service, he still used more frequently than chauffeur-driven cars. For all his growing fame and sophistication, he was drawn back as strongly as ever to the village where almost everyone still knew him as Rick, whose pubs were still as alluring in their own way as any speakeasy, and whose eternal cribbage or dominoes players still treated him as if he was about twelve. Though they no longer mocked his hair and clothes, he still received the same greeting from Charlie Cumberland, a local farmer who was said to have walked to Surrey all the way from Cumberland during the Depression. Still playing that old banjo boy? Charlotte found his grandparents a lovely couple. Rose was besotted with Eric, and Jack was the gentle giant, quieter but as solid as a rock. I remember a warm, modest home with cakes and tea and everything English. The only awkward moment came when she innocently repeated some swear words picked up from Ginger Baker, and Eric had to kick her under the table. And to a Frenchwoman, the toilet at the end of the garden, presented no problem at all. Early in May, Cream returned to New York to resume their interrupted second album sessions for Atlantic. This time, as protégés of Ahmet Ertegen, one of them at least, they weren't quartered at the Gotham Hotel, but at the luxurious Drake on Park Avenue. At Atlantic's hallowed studios, they were treated like VIPs, one of them at least, with label mates like Otis Redding and Booker T continually dropping by their sessions to listen. As well as the empathetic engineer Tom Dowd, Ertegen had assigned them a producer, 28-year-old Felix Papaladi, who was also a performer and multi-talented instrumentalist. It was a partnership as fortunate, though not as long-lasting, as the Beatles with George Martin, Felix was the first person to produce Cream imaginatively, Pete Brown recalls. Before then, they just blasted things out in the studio as if it was a live performance. Like Dowd, Papa Lardy had instructions to establish Eric as their leader beyond any doubt, principally by giving him a greater share of lead vocals, hitherto Jack Bruce's near monopoly. While they were briefly back in London, the producer had found their version of Buddy Guy and Junior Wells's Lordy Mama, taken the tapes home, and, helped by his songwriter wife, Gail Collins, who some years later would shoot him dead for infidelity, revamped it as a weird, somnambulistic chant called Strange Brew. This he now cajoled Eric not merely into singing, 
but venturing out of his Brit blues comfort zone into a near falsetto. Eric agreed only on condition he was allowed to play a solo, sounding like another Atlantic stalwart, Albert King. Back in his normal register, he also sang Blind Joe Reynolds' Outside Woman Blues, dating from 1928. The whole album was recorded between a Thursday and a Sunday. Jack Bruce was puzzled and resentful at having been so obviously downgraded, but still gave his full-throated all to Tale of Brave Ulysses, which matched Martin Sharp's rather good words with Eric's Summer in the City chords. From the Bruce Brown axis came Cream's first and perhaps greatest classic, Sunshine of Your Love, built around a bass riff Bruce had extemporized after seeing Jimi Hendrix on stage at Brian Epstein's Seville Theatre. The trio left New York, exhilarated by what Felix Papaladi had helped them achieve and eager to share it with their peers, maybe at the speakeasy like Sergeant Pepper. But their homecoming brought a severe letdown. The debut album by the similarly three-man Jimi Hendrix experience had just been released in Britain, containing incendiary tracks like Foxy Lady, Manic Depression and Red House. Are You Experienced was already on its way to spending 16 weeks in the UK album charts, peaking at number two. As Eric gloomily remarked, Jimmy wasn't just flavour of the month, but flavour of the year. And after communing with the giants of soul in New York, Cream were back to small-scale British gigs like the May Ball at Pembroke College, Oxford, which now came in for some of the same misconduct recently visited on Murray the K. During the evening, Jack Bruce found a bucket full of vomit, which he took great satisfaction in leaving in a professor's study, and Ginger Baker purloined a bicycle and rode it through the bar. The students were amazed at the amount of food Ginger ate, Pete Brown recalls. They asked him if he wanted more, and he kept roaring, Yeah! They looked at him as if he was some mythical beast. In June, Strange Brew was released as a UK single, coupled with... Tales of Brave Ulysses. It was the first test of the Eric First Cream prescribed by Ahmet Ertegun, but disappointingly reached only number 17. Although waves of brilliant music were ushering in this so-called summer of love, to Eric the radio still seemed like wall-to-wall -wall Jimmy. Nor could he count any longer on Robert Stigwood's undivided attention. In January, Stigwood's company had merged with Brian Epstein's NEMS organisation, a move initiated by an increasingly exhausted and unstable Epstein. When first mooted, the idea had outraged NEMS's four original and preeminent clients, on whom Epstein had always lavished uniquely personal attention, and who unanimously disliked and distrusted Stigwood. Paul McCartney had threatened that if he were given any sway over them, they would record nothing further except God Save the Queen out of tune. The Beatles had therefore been left out of the merger deal to remain under Epstein's personal care. Stigwood had still come into an impressive new client list, not only comprising NEMS's other Liverpool acts, but easy listening attractions like Petula Clark and Matt Munro. Additionally, he had just signed up a band consisting of three brothers, Barry, Robin and Maurice Gibb, born in Britain but raised in Australia, whose name, the Bee Gees, seemed rashly similar to Beatles. He was now spending large amounts on advertising them in the music press, as Ginger Baker fulminated, when we get a two-line mention on the next page. Little did Baker or Bruce suspect it was to the despised Gibb brothers that Cream owed their Atlantic Records contract. At the beginning, Ahmet Ertegun only wanted to sign up Eric, a former Stigwood associate recalls, but he also really wanted the Bee Gees. Stiggy said he couldn't have them unless he took Jack and Ginger too. 11. The Pheasantry Australians, traditionally derided by the British as muscle-bound, beer-swilling Philistines, were suddenly cool, and in Martin Sharp, Eric had met one of the coolest. Sharp seemed to know everyone in swinging London's top drawer, 
and most of them seem to find their way through the psychedelic blue door of his studio at 152 Kings Road, Chelsea. This coolest of addresses on London's swingingest boulevard was better known as the Pheasantry, a faux Louis XV mansion with a walled front courtyard and grandiose entrance arch, on whose site during the 18th century pheasants had been bred for the royal household. In 1967, the Pheasantry was one of Chelsea's last refuges for impecunious artists and bohemians. It had been divided into studios that still rented cheaply and imposed few, if any, restrictions on their tenants. The basement was a nightclub of legendary looseness whose clientele, past and present, included Augustus John, Francis Bacon and Humphrey Bogart. Sharp's top-floor studio come apartment had a large spare room, and following his debut as a rock lyricist with tales of brave Ulysses, he invited Eric and Charlotte to move in. It was an irresistible offer to the one-time failed art student, hardly less so to one who'd spent so many winter afternoons of his boyhood as a beta for pheasant shoots around Ripley. In addition to Sharp designing scurrilous but graphically brilliant covers for Oz magazine, the pheasantry pulsed with creative endeavour and wild eccentricity. On the ground floor, portrait painter Timothy Widborne was at work on a life-size study of the Queen reviewing troops, unironically scarlet-coated and mounted on a horse named Doctor. His neighbour was another new arrival from Down Under, Jermaine Greer, typing what would be feminism's defining manifesto, the female eunuch. The middle floors harboured a resident with a pet rabbit, painted green, which he fed with LSD until it apparently committed suicide by jumping off the roof. One of the few journalists to visit the Sharp apartment, melody makers Chris Welch, found himself ascending a dark Dickensian staircase through clouds of chicken feathers. Beyond the psychedelic blue door, he found a state of indescribable clutter, vast, eye-assaulting paintings, old copies of Beano, a rubber statue of Mickey Mouse and postcards of Victorian nudes were some of the objets de junk that hit me. Soon after Eric and Charlotte's arrival, the other spare room was taken over by Philippe Mora, an aspiring young filmmaker whose French-Australian parents were friends of Sharp's family back in Melbourne. 18-year-old Mora was in awe of the handsome, charming Martin and was surprised to find Eric somewhat the same. Eric was the rock star, but we both said the same thing about Martin. How does he get all the girls? Mora remembers that despite Eric's growing celebrity with Cream and Sharp's dominant presence in Oz and other underground magazines, the household was permanently impoverished. We seemed to live mainly on bird's custard. I'd go out early in the morning and steal bottles of milk off people's doorsteps to make it. In fact, the only person with any money was Charlotte, who earned a good living from modelling, but she didn't have much idea about cooking. Once, I remember, she heated up a tin of baked beans without opening it first. The tin exploded and the beans went all over the ceiling. The stain's probably still there. Although both Sharp and Mora were devout rock fans, it formed no part of their conversations with Eric. All we ever talked about was art, Mora recalls, and we talked about it for hours. Art in music, art in film, art in the theatre. Martin was heavily into Van Gogh, and we spent hours discussing madness in art and the fine line between it and genius. As well as an aspiring filmmaker, Mora was an artist, like both his parents, and helped Sharp on Oz projects, notably its all-illustrated magic theatre issue. The atmosphere has soon affected Eric, who began to sketch again for the first time since leaving Kingston Art College, and to paint and decorate again. As he'd learned from Jack Clapp, refurbishing his and Charlotte's room in dark red and gilt yellow. He even thought of making art his career after all when rock blew over, as even its most celebrated performers still expected. I'll pack the guitar in when I start to go downhill, he confided to Melody Maker. I don't know when it'll come, maybe tomorrow, maybe when I'm thirty. I'll do something that's not so much in the public eye, maybe painting. The blue door that Sharp left permanently ajar 
admitted a constant stream of visitors. It seemed like everyone interesting who came to London ended up at the pheasantry, Philippe Mora says. Artists like Eduardo Paolozzi and Malcolm Morley, the poet Heathcote Williams, the art critic Robert Hughes, the model Amanda Lear, the jazz singer George Melly, Oz's editor Richard Neville. Martin would be cartooning, I'd be painting, Eric would be there with his guitar. It was a salon. Once we had the whole American Living Theatre group there, and several slept over. Another time someone brought R.D. Lang, the psychologist who said there was no such thing as crazy because the whole world was insane anyway. He sat there making notes of everything we said and did. Even Eric Clapton just went to the loo. The journalist Anthony Hayden Guest brought Brigitte Bardot once, but it was one of the few times when Martin had locked the door. He never did again. Their most frequent visitor, so much so as to seem like an extra tenant, was a gay Russian-Jewish East Ender of 39 named David Litvinov, whose slightly old-fashioned Italian suits stood out among the satin shirts and crushed velvet flares, and whose hawkish face bore a livid white scar stretching from ear to ear. A sometime Daily Express gossip columnist, Litvinov had connections stretching from London's Haute Bohème to the darkest recesses of its criminal underworld. He was at the same time a crony of painters such as Lucian Freud and Francis Bacon and a factotum of the Cray twins, reputedly tasked with picking up boys for the psychotic pederast Ronnie Cray. The terrible scar across his face, he would say without rancour, indeed with pride, was a little present from the Crays. Freud had done his portrait in oils, titling it the Procurer. Latterly, his social circle had extended to the Rolling Stones, who liked having real hard men around to bolster their synthetic bad boy image. Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, who both lived in Chelsea, were still trying to unmask the informer who had precipitated their drugs bust at Richard's Sussex cottage the previous February. The chief suspect was a King's Road hippie named Nicky Kramer, also well known at the pheasantry, who had been among Richard's house guests that weekend. Litvinov was deputed to beat up Kramer systematically until he confessed his guilt. When he did not, even after being battered to a pulp, he was pronounced in the clear. David never mentioned his underworld connections around us, Philippe Morrow recalls, and although he was gay and we were all young boys, he never tried to lay a hand on any of us. The crucial thing was that he loved blues music and just about worshipped Eric. Litvinov was incredulous that Eric came nowhere near worshipping Eric and still felt positively hounded by the Clapton is God graffito that to Litvinov was an incontrovertible statement of fact. Appointing himself Eric's unofficial PR man, he enlisted a squad of graffitists to revive the sentiment on walls throughout central London, though he was too much of an aesthete to include the pheasantry's entrance arch and orange and white facade in the campaign. His claim to know everyone and be able to fix anything proved no idle one. During one of their frequent long talks at the nearby Picasso coffee bar, he learned of Eric's fascination with Harold Pinter's play The Caretaker, and in particular, the charismatic, manipulative tramp, known simply as Davies, who dominates the action. A few days later, he came through the blue door, accompanied by Pinter's supposed model for the Davies character, a cadaverous, toothless Welshman named John Ivor Golding. Clad in a decaying outfit of pinstripe trousers and an old-fashioned frock coat, Golding was not just a down-and-out like his fictional counterpart, but a psychiatric patient, currently on the run from the institution that had been treating him. In that era before destitution became commonplace in Britain, there was a romantic view of tramps as men of intellect deserving respect, even envy for having resigned from the rat race, and Golding's sonorous cryptic monologues did seem to suggest a weird wisdom and insight. Eric loved listening to him, Philippe Mora said, as we all did. The pheasantry salon was some consolation to Eric for missing out on much of the summer of love which by June 1967 was in full flower in Britain and America, in both often conspicuously failing 
to live up to its name. If the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper album had been its oral starting point, its physical one was a three-day pop festival in Monterey, California, whose extensive bill included The Grateful Dead, Jefferson Airplane, The Who, Otis Redding, Ravi Shankar, Big Brother and the Holding Company with Janis Joplin, The Mummers and the Puppers, and The Jimi Hendrix Experience. In the hippie spirit of togetherness and altruism, everyone, Shankar accepted, performed for free, and the money they would have earned was given to charity. Cream had been invited to take part, but Stigwood would not let them, arguing that they might get lost amid such heavyweight competition and should relaunch their American performing career in a less high-risk fashion. Reading the ecstatic press reports of Jimi Hendrix's performance at Monterey, Eric could only wonder if the crown that was such a burden to him hadn't slipped a little further. After a rendition of the Trog's Wild Thing, amounting to an act of public indecency with a guitar, Hendrix had doused it in lighter fuel, put a match to it, and tossed its burning carcass into the crowd. The initiative switched back to Britain on the 25th of June, when the first international satellite television broadcast beamed to a worldwide audience of between 40 and 70 million, climaxed with the Beatles performing All You Need Is Love in a flower-bedecked studio filled with fellow musicians and friends. Inconspicuously among them was Eric, seated with Charlotte, a few places from George Harrison's wife, Patty. Otherwise, he remained invisible throughout that brilliantly sunny season when pop stars seemed to monopolize Britain's headlines, often in a far-from-loving context. The conviction of Mick Jagger and Keith Richards on microscopic drugs charges and committal to prison in handcuffs, the hotly clashing arguments of those who held long-haired musicians responsible for turning young people to drugs and those protesting the harmlessness of cannabis and calling for its decriminalization, the huge legalized pot rally in Hyde Park and the open letter to the same effect in The Times, signed by leading figures in the arts and media, including Brian Epstein and the martyred Stone's good friends and tacit supporters, The Beatles. The job of Cream's tour manager was way beyond the gentle Ben Palmer, as their first American visit had shown, and to take over, Stigwood hired Bob Adcock, a Liverpudlian who had previously worked with two bands from his home city, the Roadrunners and the Merseys. I didn't want the job, but Robert kept phoning me and saying I'm desperate, so I agreed to do it for two weeks. I ended up being with them for the rest of their career. Adcock had heard tales of the Bruce Baker wars, but in his experience most bands had internal conflicts of some kind, and compared with his previous charges, the Merseys, Cream were like travelling with the London Philharmonic Orchestra. Jack and Ginger could have their moments, but I never had a word out of place with Eric. He'd sit in the front seat of the car with a shoebox on his lap that was full of singles versions of blues songs. I carried a portable record player around, and all he wanted was to listen to that music. As Eric still couldn't drive, Adcock would take him down to Ripley for his regular visits to Rose. She was such a lovely lady. I knew she was his grandma, but she could have been his mum, the way she fawned over him. The album Cream had made in New York the previous May was not scheduled for release until November. Since July was almost empty of live gigs, their new producer Felix Papaladi came over from New York to work on new material for the one to follow, including Albert King's Born Under a Bad Sign and a new Bruce Brown composition, White Room. They also recorded a radio commercial for Full Staff Beer, a sellout that they swallowed for the sake of the free publicity it would give them in America. Jack Bruce's voice lost none of its passion in extolling the beer you reach for first when you want to quench your thirst and Eric put just as much into a riff with an echo of White Room. Working in IBC Studios with Papaladi exposed Stigwood's pretensions to be a record producer to an often embarrassing degree. He had absolutely cloth ears, Pete Brown recalls, but he kept turning up and trying to interfere with what Felix was doing. In the end, when he was there, Ginger just poured Coca-Cola all over the recording desk. 
August would find the band back at the Windsor Blues and Jazz Festival, where they had launched exactly a year earlier, yet with no sense of major accomplishments behind them. On the contrary, a nagging fear of having already fallen behind musical fashion. For a couple of years already, the guitar's barometer-shaped eastern cousin, the sitar, had been infiltrating western pop, first employed by the post-Eric Yardbirds in Heartful of Soul, successively taken up by the Kinks, See My Friends, the Stones, Mother's Little Helper, and the Beatles, Norwegian Wood, a classical instrument dating back to the Mughal Empire lost its eye and became a star. The hippies, with their hunger for the mystical and meaningful, had not only embraced the sitar, but the whole culture, multi-theistic religion and ancient philosophies of India behind it. From George Harrison's Within You, Without You on Sgt. Pepper to Scott McKenzie's San Francisco, its wiry voice was as essential to the summer of love as caftans, jostics, and the raindrop sparkle of good acid trips. If it could be mixed with Alice in Wonderland faux naivete, as on Traffic's Hole in My Shoe, the effect was doubly potent. Eric had been a fan of the Indian musician Bismala Khan since John Mayall days, often trying to make his guitar mimic Khan's oboe-like shanai, and Jack Bruce was currently mastering the sitar as rapidly as all Western stringed instruments, yet not the slightest suspicion of a raga would ever be heard on a cream track. In August, the Beatles took the Indian vogue to the next level by becoming followers of the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, and his transcendental meditation movement. The instigator was George Harrison's wife, Patty, who had become interested in meditation during a trip to Bombay the previous year. Hearing that the Maharishi was scheduled to give a lecture in London, she made George round up the others to attend. The following August bank holiday weekend, while they were receiving further instruction from their new guru at a teacher training college in North Wales, Brian Epstein was found dead of an alcohol and barbiturates overdose at his London home. Epstein's death was an immeasurable catastrophe for the Beatles, but good for his lately acquired business partner. The ensuing reorganisation of the NEMS company saw Robert Stigwood swiftly axed as managing director and replaced by Epstein's younger brother, Clive. Stigwood, received a substantial sum in compensation and walked away with the choicer names on NEMS's roster, including Cream and the Bee Gees. From then on, the latter would seem to enjoy most of his attention. Eric hadn't missed the summer of love after all, though he didn't catch up with it until the leaves were starting to turn. Late in August, Cream returned to America for a seven-week tour starting out at Bill Graham's Fillmore Auditorium in San Francisco. Graham, born Wolf Volodia Grajonka, the child of Jewish refugees from Nazi Germany, was that rarity, an entrepreneur with a soul. Under his management, the Fillmore had given a home to the Californian bands who created psychedelic rock as well as to theatre and poetry readings by San Francisco's earlier beatmakers. Michael McClure, Gregory Corso, and Lawrence Ferlinghetti. He had chanced to hear Cream on the radio, and on the strength of it, had booked them for 11 straight nights. They set out on the 20th of August, their entourage as modest as it had been on the much smaller scale trip to New York the previous May. With the new tour manager, Bob Adcock, were just two roadies, Mike Turner to handle Baker's drums, and Bert Schrader to handle the guitars. In defiance of the rock world's most sacred rule, no wives or girlfriends on tour, Janet Bruce was also along, and Eric's girlfriend Charlotte and Baker's wife, Liz, were to join up for short periods at various points along the route. At that point, it all seemed very civilised and homely. Despite the number of brilliantly inventive polysyllabic bands San Francisco had produced and was still producing, Cream had built a sizable following there, and its welcome put cold-shouldering New York to shame. When we woke up on the first morning at the Sausalito Inn, there was a big crowd of hippies on the grass in front, Janet Bruce recalls, and all the cars were covered in flowers. 
nor was Bill Graham another Murray the K, measuring out their stage time like a miser. At the Fillmore, they and their co-attraction, the Paul Butterfield Blues Band, were each allotted two 45-minute sets. Their second technically ended the night's proceedings, but no one would be standing by with a stopwatch. Stretch out, Graham urged them. If you want to play Spoonful, their new American single, from night till dawn, do it. So Cream stretched out songs whose recorded versions lasted only two or three minutes into half an hour or more, largely by means of extended solos having more in common with bebop than rock. By that time of night, the Fillmore's $2,003 per ticket patrons were a heaving, amorphous mass, drenched in colour or flickering black and white in the light show projected from the bandstand. Many under the influence of acid or grass, and so with all critical faculties suspended. No matter how long the number thundered on, it was never long enough for them. Eric would always remember the perfect cohesion of Bruce, Baker and himself when times were good. We had no other interest. There was nothing else going on. There was no family. There was no desire for success. No commerciality. There was no responsibility other than to that unique moment in time. And for a short period, it was unfettered and extreme and beautiful. More often than not, he was on an acid trip himself, in a world of his own bounded by his giant twin martial stacks. Sometimes I didn't know if my hands were working, what the guitar was that I was playing, or even what it was made of, he would recall. On one trip, it was in my head that I could turn the audience into angels or devils according to which note I played. Between shows, there was ample time to explore the hinterland of the two streets named Haight and Ashbury that was the hippie's mecca or hangout in Sausalito, the houseboat community where Otis Redding had written Dock of the Bay. Here, usually over a joint or a tab, Eric acquired a new circle of friends, including David Crosby from The Birds, Mike Bloomfield, the Paul Butterfield band's brilliant guitarist pianist, Terry the Tramp, the six-foot-two-inch leader of the Oakland Hells Angels, one of whose number would fatally stab a spectator at a Rolling Stones concert two years later, and Owsley Stanley III, who financed the Grateful Dead by selling high-grade LSD he cooked in a laboratory that he convinced the police was used for scientific experiments on rats. Owsley came to the Sausalito Inn, Janet Bruce remembers. There was a clanking noise outside because he was carrying a big canister of laughing gas from which he took a big puff from, then passed around. Stigwood had hired a yacht to take them on a sail around San Francisco Bay, and before they set off, Owsley and David Crosby turned up with a bunch of the most enormous spliffs, says Bob Adcock. Ginger climbed the mast and then accidentally lost all the money out of his pocket, a big sum that went fluttering down into the sea. He was screaming, Stop! Stop! to the skipper. The single-dollar bills were near the boat and easy to get back, but the hundred-dollar ones were floating just out of reach. As an impresario, Bill Graham combined the ego-massaging skills of a geisha with volcanic ferocity when the occasion demanded. To me, he looked like another Hell's Angel, Adcock recalls. Later, after he'd opened the Fillmore East in New York, I once saw him take on twenty thugs who were trying to wreck the place. He took off his belt and whirled it around his head like a maniac, and they all ran. General good vibes notwithstanding, there was a dispute with Graham over Cream's fee, which had been fixed before anyone expected them to be a sellout. It ended in a confrontation with Bruce and Baker so acrimonious that Graham later made a peace offering of antique gold watches. But Eric took no part in the fracas, nor any other one ever. He kept away from all the flashpoints and stayed in his room a great deal, Ben Palmer remembered. Nobody picked on him. He was completely safe. After the Fillmore, Cream had two more months on the road, travelling on domestic flights or by hire car, greeted with rapture by anyone of either sex in sandals or a headband, with suspicion by police and hotel desk clerks, and blank disbelief by huge men in white short-sleeved shirts with cigarette packs shadowing their breast pockets and hair cropped to the scalp bone. Yet all of it seemed the greatest fun. 
In Los Angeles, they played three nights at the Whiskey A Go Go on Sunset Strip, where people were still talking about Jimi Hendrix's appearance months previously. Charlotte took a break from modeling to join the party, staying with Eric at the glamorous Beverly Hills Hotel. We saw Joni Mitchell perform in a very small club, Janet Bruce says. There was a plane trip over the Grand Canyon, but it didn't have enough seats for everyone, so only the boys went. America's summer of love had been belied by race riots in several major cities, one of the worst in Detroit, where Cream were booked for three nights at the Grand Ballroom. The streets were still empty except for the police and National Guard, Bob Adcock recalls, with tanks on every corner. Yet despite the tense interracial atmosphere and Detroit's natural bias towards black soul music, as apotheosized by its Motown label, Cream broke all attendance records at the Grand. In contrast, a Boston psychedelic supermarket in Boston and the Action House in Long Beach, New York, only a few dozen people turned up. New York City this time around kept them downtown, at the Village Theatre, which Bill Graham was soon to turn into an East Coast Fillmore, and then at the Café Ogogo, supported by Richie Havens, who did not sing so much as weep, nor play a guitar so much as try to scrub it into extinction. Some nights, their opener was Tiny Tim, the furthest pop music would ever go from Elvis Presley, singing Tiptoe Through the Tulips in a camp falsetto to his own ukulele accompaniment. One of his sets goaded a cream fan into throwing a heavy metal padlock at his head, but Graham, who happened to be present, caught it before it could make contact. The New York stopover allowed further recording time at Atlantic Records and brought further evidence that in Ahmet Ertegen's eyes, they were not all equal. One night, he called Eric to the studio where Aretha Franklin, until then Atlantic's greatest asset, was working on her album Lady Soul. He found the famously temperamental and insecure Franklin with her clergyman father and sisters and a crowd of top session musicians with five guitarists among whom he recognized the brilliant Joe South, Jimmy Johnson, and Bobby Womack. Ertegen dismissed them all and sent him in alone. Aretha was at the piano, Ertegen would recall. When Eric walked in with his afro hair and pink trousers, she started to laugh. But as soon as he played, Aretha stopped laughing. Twelve. Fuck, I'm rich! Cream's second album was released in November 1967, with a cover designed by Martin Sharp, on which their three sombre faces loomed from a firmament of day-glow red, pink, green and blue, like a phantasmagorical Mount Rushmore. Its title was inspired by the van driver with John Mayles Bluesbreakers, an Irishman named Tony Shakespeare, whose malapropisms had entertained Eric and Jack Bruce during many monotonous miles on the road. One of his best had been in a discussion about cycling, still a passion with Eric, when he awarded Derelia three-speed gears the name of Queen Victoria's favourite Prime Minister. You can't beat those Disraeli gears, he declared. The Mount Rushmore-esque group photograph at the centre of Sharp's design was by Robert Whittaker, who had set up the Beatles' infamous Butcher album cover and whose studio was at the Pheasantry. There was a connection between these rock faces and actual geological ones. Whittaker had accompanied Cream's summer 1967 Scottish tour and, prompted by Bruce, had shot them at the summit of Ben Nevis, the highest mountain in the British Isles. Needless to say, the decision to climb to an elevation of 1,345 metres was not taken with their full wits about them. We were all on an LSD trip, Janet Bruce remembers. It was the only time I ever took it with Eric. We went up by the supposedly easy route, but it seemed pretty difficult to us and at one point we met some climbers in full gear who asked Eric for his autograph. About three quarters of the way up, there's a kind of plateau and I sat down and began to cry because I was thinking, I'm never going to get off this mountain. After the photo shoot, we decided the only way to get down was to run all the way. I remember us going through this gully of broken rocks. Do they call it a scree? Sliding and slithering in the mud. 
It was a miracle nobody got hurt. Disraeli Gears was the fruit of those three and a half days at Atlantic Studios back in May, when producer Felix Papaladi and engineer Tom Dowd had honed the new, less is more approach with Strange Brew, Tales of Brave Ulysses and Sunshine of Your Love. True to Eric's promise of a da-da goons element, the Bruce Brown partnership satirized mystical lyrics with S.W.L.A.B.R. She Walks Like a Bearded Rainbow, a Bruce vocal as charmingly playful as the title was heavy-handed. Side 2 ended with Mother's Lament, a faux music hall ballad, better known as Your Baby Has Gone Down the Plug Hole, sung by all three in a rare instance of Cream publicly having fun together. Tales of Brave Ulysses, in particular, demonstrated how far Eric's technique had developed beyond the common syntax of blues and rock. Thanks to Jimi Hendrix, he had discovered the wah-wah pedal, a device that allowed the guitar a vastly greater range of moods and emotions, and, in hands such as Hendrix's and his, gave it an almost human quality, as if breath were being exhaled and inhaled rather than strings being struck. He had subsequently developed his own softer, blurrier sound that he named Woman Tone, with no feminist objection as yet from his pheasantry neighbour, Jermaine Greer. Disraeli Gears was Cream's breakthrough in America, receiving saturation play not only on specialist rock FM radio stations, but AM Top 40 ones, reaching number four on every album chart, as against five in the UK, and ultimately becoming Cashbox's top album of 1968. I was with Eric at the Pheasantry one day when he got a phone call from Robert Stigwood, his co-tenant Philippe Morrow remembers. I heard him say, fuck, and then a moment later, fuck, and then, fuck. He hung up, turned to me and said, I'm rich. The first big amount of money he was owed from records or touring had just come through. And, this was so Eric, one of the first things he said to me after he found out was, didn't you want to make a film? That same day, he took me to Stigwood's office in the chauffeur-driven car that had been sent for him. He walked in and said to Stigwood, Philip needs £5,000 to make a film. Stigwood said, hold on, what's the deal? Eric said, there's no deal, just give him £5,000 to make his film. It spoilt me for the rest of my filmmaking career. Despite his new wealth, Eric showed no desire to move from the top floor flat at the Pheasantry, where so many interesting people were always coming and going and the talk was always more about art than music. The balance changed slightly when he arranged with Martin Sharp for Pete Brown to move in also. Brown's writing duties for Cream took up only a small portion of his time, and he was developing as a performer in his own right, with bands more overtly fusing rock, poetry, and jazz. I was just starting the first real poetry band with this fantastic young guitarist named John McLaughlin, later a contender for Eric's crown through his work with the Mahavishnu Orchestra and Miles Davis. Martin Sharp didn't like me rehearsing them in my room and didn't like me much, so I didn't last very long. Being under the same roof as Cream's main lyricist, however briefly, might have been expected to stimulate Eric's still negligible songwriting. We did work together on a song that became Anyone for Tennis, Brown says, but the chemistry just didn't seem to be there. From early 1968, another musician began slipping through the flat's blue door with a reticence unusual among its saloneers. Since meeting George Harrison, when the Yardbirds played on the Beatles' Christmas show, Eric had stayed on friendly terms with him, but their paths had crossed only seldom. Now, in what was an increasingly fraught time for George inside the Beatles, he began dropping in frequently to see Eric, encouraged by the fact that one could park a Rolls-Royce or psychedelic mini without restriction on the King's Road right outside the pheasantry. George was always very sweet and very shy, Philippe Mora remembers. He and Eric didn't seem to do much guitar playing together. They'd talk for hours in Eric's room, then go off somewhere, just the two of them. He himself would recall how being with George felt like basking in this golden light, walking with him into a restaurant or anywhere, 
everything that I might have thought I was just shriveled to nothing. Hanging out with George had the inevitable result of wanting to look like him. So Eric let his hair fall to his shoulders the way George's had since discovering transcendental meditation and grew a bushy moustache exactly replicating the one that latterly seemed to have swept all humour from the beetle's face. Yet he still barely knew George's wife, Patty, who, like all beetle spouses, was seldom seen in public with her husband. He had met her after a cream performance at the Seville Theatre, thought her the most beautiful woman he'd ever seen, and, his inferiority complex instantly kicking in, assumed her to be immeasurably above and beyond him. She belonged to a powerful man who seemed to have everything I wanted, he would recall, once again not for the years of Germaine Greer. Amazing cars, an incredible career, and a beautiful wife. They were like Camelot. I was Lancelot. In February 1968, George's path and his diverged again. The Beatles and their wives travelled to Rishikesh in India to meditate with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Cream set out on a five-month American tour that would simultaneously take them to their zenith and blow them apart. Disraeli Gears had contained two unwitting advance warnings. Jack Bruce's standout lead vocal was a keening lament, written by him without Pete Brown, called We're Going Wrong, and in Eric's rendition of Blind Joe Reynolds' Outside Woman Blues, the line Great God, Don't Lose Your Mind, had a faint vinyl whisper of King Lear's, Let Me Not Be Mad, Sweet Heaven. Even in the best cases, a rock band is an unnatural entity whose members, more often than not, have only music in common and are otherwise totally incompatible, yet must live in close confinement together for weeks and months on end, like hostages with room service. Internal personality problems exhaustion, boredom, the awful millstone of mega-fame finish all of them in the end. But historically, even the most strife-torn have managed to keep going longer than Cream's two years. Our last tour was two years and two months, says Lars Ulrich, the drummer with Metallica, one of numerous modern heavy metal bands who regard themselves as Cream's heirs. We've had parties that lasted longer than two years. Rather than the fisticuffs and knife-waving of the Graham Bond era, Ginger Baker and Jack Bruce had settled into perpetual nagging, like an old married couple who know all each other's weak points and scratch away at them remorselessly. They focused on each other all the time, for their aggressions and their frustration, and it wore me out, Eric recalls. From time to time I'd break down and go, I can't stand this any longer. More than once, it reduced him literally to tears. Yet musically, they were the power that drove him, even while driving him half mad. They both had an energy and determination that jazz musicians don't usually, and that Eric certainly didn't at the beginning, Pete Brown says. Between them, they got more out of him than he can ever have known was in him. That was the basic difference between Cream and the Jimi Hendrix experience. Jimmy was always challenging his rhythm section, and Eric was always being pushed by his. Matters might have been helped by increasing the trio to a quartet, as was often suggested, thereby lightening the musical load on each of them and giving Eric a bulwark against the bickering. But Stigwood would not hear of it because of the extra expense involved. For the same reason... Brown did not travel around with them as Elton John's lyricist Bernie Taupin later would with Elton. Stigwood had never liked the tousled, bearded poet and considered him an unnecessary appendage. If they could have written more songs on the road with Pete, Janet Bruce says, they might not have got as bored with their repertoire as they did by the end. External pressures contributed almost as much to the rapidity of their disintegration. Even now with America supposedly at their feet, they travel with none of the luxury and ceremony and protection that even minor rock bands nowadays take for granted. Their road crew still numbered only three, tour manager Bob Adcock and a guitar and drum tech. In those pre-oil crisis days, aircraft seldom took off more than half full, 
so Adcock would simply check in their equipment as excess baggage. Cream were the last major band to go on the road without their own sound system, he says. So in every city where they played, they had to use a new PA. There usually wasn't time for them to do sound checks and there were no monitors, so they couldn't hear themselves on stage. Chauffeured limos, the norm for other bands, were seldom deployed for Cream. When they played Santa Monica Auditorium, the support band were Deep Purple, who had a limo each, plus another one for the management, six in all. We had one Ford Mercury station wagon, driven by me. Although Stigwood was often in America, he rarely attended their tour gigs. He might as well have been on another planet, Adcock says. He never felt comfortable around Cream, especially not after he took on the Bee Gees as well. They all hated the Bee Gees and thought he gave more time to them than to Cream, and they used to take the piss out of him something rotten. For those five months, Adcock was effectively their manager, carrying a lump sum in US dollars, few Brits used credit cards then, and noting down their seldom excessive on-the-road expenses by hand in a Woolworths notebook. London to LAX, $30.25, hotel bill, $308.46, Jack Amp rental, $15.75, Beer and Cokes, $5. As it happened, the summer of 1968 was the worst possible time to be on the road in America. In April, the great civil rights leader, Martin Luther King, was assassinated, unleashing further traumatic race riots. In June, Robert Kennedy met the same fate as he campaigned for the presidency in succession to his brother John F. Kennedy, who had been cut down in Dallas five years earlier. The night after Dr. King's murder, Cream played at Boston's Back Bay Theatre with James Brown, the godfather of soul, appearing on the opposite side of the street. They had to be smuggled off the premises when Brown's audience went on the rampage, looting and beating up white bystanders. At every airport we landed, Adcock recalls, there were cops, National Guard, tanks, helicopter gunships. In the Deep South... The length of their hair stigmatised them as freaks, or faggots at best, at worst a menace to public health. We woke up one morning, pulled back the curtains, and the mayor of the town had paid for a billboard right opposite our hotel, saying, Keep America clean. Get a haircut. As the tour wore on, Eric became increasingly depressed by what to him was the stagnation of Cream's music. Like the Beatles in concert, As his friend George had bitterly recounted, they soon realised it wasn't worth trying. However bad the sound system, however ragged their playing, the ovations never slackened. It became impossible to keep the music afloat, and we began to drown, he would recall. I began to be quite ashamed of being in Cream because I thought it was a con. Both his bandmates were equally unhappy, Jack Bruce chafed at being downgraded in the recording sessions that were crammed between the live shows and longed for a normal married life with Janet. Ginger Baker chafed at receiving no royalty share from Bruce Brown's songs, which had benefited from his perfect time. Like the 5-4 Bolero in White Room, that makes it. Besides, the cadaverous, ponytail, freckle-spotted, wolfishly grinning, wild red man who nightly battered the living daylights out of twin bass drums, double-stacked cymbals, and high and low tom-toms, whose twenty-minute solos with supersized sticks doubling as missiles enthralled young men and made martyrs of their girlfriends all over the continent, had begun to accuse his bandmates of playing too loud. When we started in 1966, Eric and Jack had one Marshall each, then it became a stack, then a double stack, finally a triple stack, Baker would recall. I was just the poor bastard stuck in the middle of these incredible noise-making things. Once, Eric and I stopped playing for two choruses. Jack didn't even notice. The hooliganism of British rock bands touring Middle America in the late 60s has passed into legend. The post-gig drunkenness, orgies with groupies and trashing of hotel and motel rooms. Such behaviour demanded a degree of sociability among the musicians. And after every show, Eric, Bruce and Baker always firmly went their separate ways. 
There was never any of that hotel-wrecking nonsense with them, Bob Adcock says. Big cities like LA were sensible places where they could have bought their way out of trouble, the way people like the Rolling Stones did. But in some of the southern shitholes where they played, it could have got them lynched. Not that individually they were models of puritanical decorum. During the LA leg, Adcock drove Jack and Janet Bruce and the two roadies over the Mexican border to Tijuana, where Jack got wasted on mezcal, the brain-blasting liquor that has a live worm in every bottle. Back on the Californian side, during a stop for gas, he got into an altercation with some police which ended up in him shouting, Fuck America! and being carted off to jail. The incident got into the local media, and hippies picketed the police station demanding Bruce's release. He was in really serious trouble, Adcock recalls. Stigwood had to bring in a heavyweight lawyer to sort it out. Ginger Baker was the groupie magnet, even though they shrieked in mock terror at his approach like children on Halloween. Nor did the line of brazen would-be bedmates dwindle when his wife Liz was visiting from England. Once there was a knock at our hotel room door, she recalls. I opened it, and there were three of them standing there. And despite Eric's knack for avoiding trouble, the tour brought what was to be his one and only brush with the law over drugs. In Los Angeles, his main escape from the tensions within Cream was spending time with Stephen Stills from the short-lived but brilliant Buffalo Springfield. One evening, he was invited to watch Springfield rehearse at the Topanga Canyon home of Stills' girlfriend. With him, he took Mary Hughes, a blonde actress best known for Bikini Beach movies, who had recently starred opposite Elvis Presley in Double Trouble. A neighbour complained about the noise to the police, who arrived to find the place swimming in pot smoke. Eric was among a random group hauled off to Malibu Police Headquarters, and since it was Friday night, held in the L.A. County Jail over the weekend to be dealt with on Monday morning. He found himself sharing a cell with a group of black guys who I immediately concluded must be Black Panthers. As I was wearing pink boots from Mr. Gohill in Chelsea and had hair down to my waist, I thought, I'm in trouble here. Although soon let out on bail, arranged by Ahmet Ertegun, he faced possible imprisonment. At best, instant deportation from America and a criminal record that would have given him endless problems if ever he tried to return. But when he came to court a few weeks later, it was merely on a charge of being in a place where marijuana was suspected of being smoked. He swore on the Bible that he didn't know what marijuana was and walked free without a stain on his character. There was never a better instance of the Clapton luck. Cream's boredom with themselves showed all too plainly in an appearance on the Smothers Brothers television show to promote their new American single, Anyone for Tennis. The song that Eric was unable to write with Pete Brown, he had finished with Martin Sharp. It had been chosen for the soundtrack of a biker film, The Savage Seven, although played by another band, The American Revolution. The show's bizarre staging hardly helped. After a close-up of live toads appearing to croak, Cream, cream. They were shown standing in a weary faced row, Ginger Baker merely patting a pair of fortunate conga drums with a cigarette the size of a generously made spliff drooping from his lips. In an inserted film clip, they executed a half hearted Pied Piper dance, wearing black uniforms with peaked caps, which made them look like bus drivers, and strumming tennis rackets for guitars. Eric, did little more than murmur the prissy lyric through his new George Harrison moustache. Twice upon a time in the Valley of the Tears, the auctioneer is bidding for a box of fading years, and the elephants are dancing on the graves of squealing mice. Anyone for tennis? Wouldn't that be nice? At intervals, they had returned to New York to work on the album begun at IBC Studios in London the previous summer. But neither these rests from the fatigue and tedium of the road, nor the transformative input of their producer Felix Papaladi and engineer Tom Dowd, seemed able to lighten the atmosphere. There were times, Dowd remembered, 
when I thought they were going to kill each other. The album Wheels of Fire was in the new double-disc format that normally contained around 24 tracks and required months of concentrated work in the studio. Since Cream's piecemeal sessions would not nearly fill such a yawning space, the first disc consisted of studio productions, the second of live recordings made during the tour. It was released in July 1968, with a cover once again designed by Martin Sharp, this one a whirling collage of silver and black that could have fronted any audacious issue of Oz magazine. In live performance, their individual isolation and apathy were painfully obvious, even to the most myopically devoted Cream fans. The worst example occurred in a show at the old Wembley Empire Pool, an arena normally devoted to ice skating spectaculars, which retained its sharp chill when converted to rock concerts, forcing many bands to go on stage in winter clothes, whatever the weather outside. Wearying of trying to play bass in an overcoat and woolen muffler, Jack Bruce walked off stage in mid-performance, got into his car, and drove home. The other two played for a further hour or more without realising he had gone. Yet on Wheels of Fire, the trio's disharmony had never been less evident, never less so than in White Room, Pete Brown's SOS from his padded cell as an alcoholic speed freak, with its never more perfect synthesis of Jack Bruce's vocal passion, Eric's furry woman tone, and Ginger Baker's Bolero 5 4 time. Never less so than in the searing blues covers of the Mississippi Shakes sitting on top of the world and a version of Born Under a Bad Sign that would forever rank alongside Albert King's original. They could hardly bear to be in a room together, but in the studio, with the extra instrumentation Papaladi had provided and sometimes played, they had made one another masters of every modish rock style, from the atonal raga-like as you said, and passing the time, to politician about the 1963 Profumo scandal, which had kicked off at Soho's Flamingo Club and Baker's whimsical Cockney monologue, Pressed Rat and Warthog. The highlight of the live disc had been recorded at Winterland, Bill Graham's new and much larger San Francisco venue back in March. This was Crossroads, Eric's interpretation of Robert Johnson's Crossroad Blues, a supposed direct reference to Johnson's soul-bartering Midnight Tryst with Satan. Now, the acoustic blues wail in a 1936 hotel room was hard rock for 5,000 hippies with every marshal turned up to the max. Yet Johnson's self-effacing shade seemed to be at Eric's shoulder that night, imbuing his voice with a power and abandon eons away from the embarrassed mumbler of anyone for tennis. Wheels of Fire went to number one in America and three in the UK and became the first double album to go platinum with sales of two million copies. Surely, no one in their right mind would want to walk away from this kind of success. A few weeks previously, Eric had taken his pheasantry flatmate, Philip Mora, into his room to hear a new American album, music from Big Pink, by the band. This part Canadian quintet, whose artless name conveyed the same unassailable superiority as Cream's, not just a band, the band, had been sidemen to Bob Dylan when Dylan controversially went electric. They had since turned their backs on contemporary rock to explore the roots of American country and folk music with a love and respect that were particularly striking at a time of profound national self-doubt. Eric sat me down with the headphones on and made me listen to every track, commenting on each one very seriously, almost like a schoolmaster, Mora recalls. It was a side of him I'd never really seen before. With their Civil War songs and acoustic mandolins and dulcimers, the band were as intricate and subtle as cream were brash and thunderous. And music from Big Pink spoiled any triumph Eric had felt over Wheels of Fire. Listening to that album made me feel we were stuck, he would recall, and I wanted out. The critics seemed to be feeling the same disenchantment. 
On Cream's most recent American tour, Eric had received the accolade of an interview in San Francisco's new, serious rock paper, Rolling Stone, with his George Harrisonized face on the cover. But in the same issue, reviewer John Landau had described him as a virtuoso performing other people's ideas and a master of the blues cliché. When I read it, I was in a restaurant and I fainted, he recalls. When I woke up, I immediately decided it was the end of the band. He made repeated phone calls to Robert Stigwood in London, pleading, I can't do this anymore. I want to go home. Get me out of here. But Stigwood always managed to persuade him to do just one more week. On 6th of July 1968, Sunshine of Your Love from Disraeli Gears, which had previously performed poorly as a single, was re-released in the US to begin a rapid ascent to number six in the Billboard chart. A week later, Melody Maker announced Cream's breakup. Eric had told Chris Welch in May, but asked him to hold off on the story until business problems had been sorted out. The explanation he now gave was of a change of attitude among ourselves. We've been on the road a long time before Cream started. That was a big hang-up. I went off in a lot of different directions, but I find I have floated back to straight blues playing. I was not being true to myself. I am and will always be a blues guitarist. It was, in fact, what Stigwood and Ahmet Ertegen had always wanted, an unencumbered Eric who could now be developed to the full limit of his potential as a solo artist. With only a token show of regret, Stigwood busied himself with wringing every last drop of profit from Cream, persuading them to put out a final album and squeeze in yet another tour, 18 American cities in five weeks, followed by two farewell concerts at London's Royal Albert Hall. Actually, Eric's thoughts were fixed on anything but solo stardom. I am rather off the virtuoso kick, he told Welch. It was overexposed. I want to be in a band where I could control the music, but I want to be at the back. In October and early November, Cream went through the five weeks and 19 cities of their American farewell tour like schoolboys counting down the days until the end of term. There were no brushes with the law, no mishaps, barely so much as a raised eyebrow between Bruce and Baker, what I remember mainly is the overwhelming feeling of relief, says Bob Adcock, especially from Eric. In New York, where they played to a capacity 22,000 crowd at the newly rebuilt Madison Square Garden, Ahmet Ertegen presented them with their platinum disc for Wheels of Fire. That was the one gig Stigwood didn't miss, Bob Adcock remembers. The two Royal Albert Hall concerts on the 25th and 26th of November were filmed by the BBC, with a hyperbolic introduction such as even the Beatles had never received. Cream, the sonorous and naturally male voiceover declared, had given rock a musical authority which only the deaf cannot acknowledge and only the ignorant cannot hear. Their records have sold more copies in the last 24 months than the Bible has sold in the past 24 years. They earn more per year than the annual British government subsidy to the arts. They are admired by Leonard Bernstein and Igor Stravinsky. Eric Clapton, a 23-year-old former stained glass designer, is acknowledged the finest instrumentalist of his kind in the world, his guitar straining and sawing against the entire dark ages of music, which still, in spite of Stravinsky, believes in 4-4, and the Common Chord. Both concerts sold out months in advance and were attended by the cream of Rock's new aristocracy. Eric, wearing a fancy red cowboy shirt and using a Gibson Firebird, borrowed at the last minute from Bill Kinsley of the Merseys, had never been more lionized and never looked more uncomfortable. As he played, the people in the front seats repeatedly showered him with confetti, but gone forever was the tripartite power that at its best, in Chris Welch's words, had generated the exhilaration of a lightning jet screaming past at street level. That Eric had already moved on at his own customary subsonic speed 
was obvious from his appearance. The George Harrison moustache had faded to almost nothing, and the shoulder-length hair was much shorter and shaped, just like the boys in the band. 13. Into the Woods A few weeks earlier, George had driven Eric to Abbey Road Studios, where the Beatles were at work on the follow-up to Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band that had the plain title, The Beatles, but would become known as The White Album. It was supposed to have been just a social call, but on the way, George suddenly suggested Eric should play on a song he'd written for the album and was about to record. Eric had already been on a single produced by George, Jackie Lomax's Sour Milk Sea, to which Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr had both lent a hand. But this was temporarily joining the Beatles, something no outsider had ever been invited to do before. The accolade was so unexpected that he hadn't thought to bring a guitar with him, so had to borrow one of George's. It became clear that he was needed for moral support as much as musicianship. The White Album sessions were making George feel more crushed than ever by the Lennon-McCartney songwriting juggernaut, which had always limited him to only a couple of tracks per album. The one on which he wanted Eric had already been tried out by his bandmates, but in a grudging, half-hearted fashion. Entitled While My Guitar Gently Weeps, it found George expressing more emotion than he ever had before in a song. Tenderness, sadness, above all the feelings of exclusion and belittlement to which he felt he could fully give voice only through his instrument, like a ventriloquist throwing his voice into a doll. Yet, when it came to it, he wanted that voice to be Eric's. It was the closest moment in their friendship. But being the friend of someone so monstrously famous and so famously private and hypersensitive, had its pitfalls. Before Eric left on Cream's farewell American tour, George gave him an acetate, or rough pressing, of the White Album which he played to various musician friends in Los Angeles, believing he could only be thanked for spreading the word of its brilliance. Instead, George regarded it as a grave breach of confidence and gave him a furious dressing down by phone. This, he recalled, hurt like hell, and made him draw back from the relationship for a while. The honorary Beatle was also co-opted as a rolling stone, at least by association. That December of 68, the Stones staged their rock and roll circus, a belated answer to the Beatles' magical mystery tour, filmed in a mocked-up circus tent with a live audience and support acts including The Who, Jethro Tull and bluesman Taj Mahal, interspersed with amusingly third-rate acrobats, jugglers, and clowns. Eric appeared in a one-night-only supergroup with John Lennon, Keith Richards, and drummer Mitch Mitchell, from the Jimi Hendrix experience, playing Lennon's Your Blues under the Lennon-bestowed name Winston Legthigh and the Dirty Mac. Though it was Lennon's song and Richards' film, there was no contest as to the Dirty Mac's lead guitarist. The band represented a show of support for Lennon amid the ferocious, often racist outcry that had greeted his new romance. So Eric and Richards also backed a vocal performance by the Japanese Yoko Ono, modelled on the shrieks of serving women in labour she'd overheard during her privileged Tokyo childhood. Thanks to the caprice of Mick Jagger, the film would not be released until 1996. Jagger was concurrently making Performance, a cinema feature about an encounter between a rock star and an East End heavy with links to a pederastic crime boss overtly based on Ronnie Cray. David Litvinoff, who had lived such a role with Eric, albeit without any sexual overtones, was employed as the film's technical advisor, and its director, Donald Camel, visited the pheasantry several times to get set-decorating ideas for the weird old house in which it was meant to take place. Performance, in turn, gave impetus to the film Eric's flatmate, Philip Mora, was making with the £5,000 that Eric had extracted from Robert Stigwood. The Jagger Project's co-producer, Sandy Lieberson, 
another regular at Martin Sharp's soirees, gave Mora a quantity of unused film stock, which enabled him to begin shooting at various locations around Chelsea with a cast including the editor of Oz, Richard Neville, and Jermaine Greer in the decidedly unfeminist role of a dance hall chanteuse. The film, for which Eric would receive a producer's credit, was entitled Trouble in Melopolis and starred John Ivor Golding, the enigmatic tramp whom David Litvinoff had sold to him as Harold Pinter's model for Davies in The Caretaker. On the first day, in a scene Pinter would never have dared, Golding publicly defecated. Cream's final album appeared in February 1969, titled simply Goodbye. It was meant to have been a double LP like Wheels of Fire, but barely enough material could be scraped together for a single disc. The only two new studio tracks, What a Bring Down and Doing That Scrapyard Thing, were bulked out by lengthy live versions of I'm So Glad, Sitting on Top of the World and Politician, recorded at the Los Angeles Forum during their American farewell tour. There was also a song written by George Harrison as an Eric vocal, with George playing rhythm guitar under the alias L'Angelo Misterioso. It was listed as badge, despite having nothing discernible to do with badges. George's handwriting was notoriously indecipherable, and Eric had misread the word bridge on his lyric sheet. The cover showed Bruce, Baker and himself as in the finale of a Hollywood musical, dressed in shiny silver tail suits and doffing matching top hats. One commentator wrote that it was the first time in their career he'd seen all three smiling. Despite giving vastly shorter weight, Goodbye did a smidgen better than Wheels of Fire, reaching number one in Britain and two in America. For Eric, it was also goodbye to the pheasantry. Since the Jagger Richards trial, the police had been cracking down on rock stars for their drug use that few bothered to conceal and some positively flaunted. Nor did the Beatles' status as national treasures any longer guarantee them immunity. One officer in the Metropolitan Police's drug squad, Detective Inspector Norman Nobby Pilcher, was celebrated for the famous scalps he had accumulated, among them John and Yoko in October 1968, and George on the day of Paul McCartney's wedding to Linda Eastman in March 1969. Now Ginger Baker came to see Eric and warned him he was next on Pilcher's list. His response was to run, so intent on self-preservation he didn't think to warn his flatmates and fellow pot enthusiasts Martin Sharp and Philip Mora that a police raid was imminent. For the next few days, he and Charlotte hid out at Robert Stigwood's baronial country home, the old barn in Stanmore, enjoying amenities that included a private go-kart track, while Stigwood looked into finding him a new address well outside the danger zone. Pilcher and his squad swooped early in the morning. I woke up to find a bloke in a raincoat standing at the end of my bed, Mora recalls. There were about seven of them with a dog. They'd got into the house by telling Martin over the entry phone that it was a telegram delivery. Nothing incriminating was found in Mora's room and only a small amount of pot in Sharp's. Nonetheless, both were added to Inspector Pilcher's bag, along with the photographer Bob Siderman, who turned up while the raid was in progress and unsuccessfully tried to do a runner down the King's Road. The cops were very disappointed, Mora recalls. It was obviously Eric they were after. To make some amends to Mora and Sharp for being left in the lurch, Stigwood provided a lawyer to defend them. All the charges against me were dropped, Mora said, and Martin was told he'd only have to pay a five-pound fine if he told the judge he was sorry. Instead, he made a speech about how great pot was and how the judge and all other judges ought to smoke it. So he got done for 50 quid. Eric never thought of owning a country house anywhere but in Surrey, and as close to Ripley as possible. Equally, being a rock star who did none of life's mundane chores for himself, he never thought he'd be the one to find the perfect place. Initially, the search was left to Robert Stigwood's office, 
which came up with several properties in the Box Hill area for him to view, but none caught his fancy. Then, one day, while leafing through Country Life magazine, he saw an oddball six-bedroom house for sale in the village of Ewhurst, just ten miles from Ripley. It was called Hurtwood Edge, a forbidding image belied by mellow sandstone walls, tiled roofs, and colourfully paved front terrace, all suggesting some towered villa or small palazzo in Tuscany. Built in 1910 by the architect A.G. Bolton, it was so named for its commanding position on the edge of the Hurtwood, a 3,000-acre expanse of pine forest and heath, of which its tower provided magnificent views away to the south coast and the sea. In its extensive gardens, poplars, palm trees and several giant redwoods added to the Mediterranean feel. The surrounding woodland made its approach road like a green tunnel and imposed a silence one could hear. When Eric drove down to view Hurtwood Edge, it had been empty for about two years, and visitors came so rarely that in the summer the estate agent responsible for selling it was in the habit of sunbathing nude with his girlfriend on its terrace. The advertisement did not mention one particular of interest only to this potential buyer. During the Second World War, it had been used to accommodate officers from the Canadian Army formations, in which his long-lost father, Edward Fryer, had served. Close to its front gate stood Ewhurst's village pub, the Windmill, and Fryer might well have drunk there, or even played the piano for sing-songs in the bar parlour. The house was anything but welcoming, with its cavernous rooms, abandoned odds and ends of furniture, and dusty curtains. Yet as he stepped inside, the boy who'd grown up with a toilet in the garden, who'd never considered owning property while there were couches to be borrowed in friends' flats, and who normally agonised over the smallest decisions, except about clothes, instantly made up his mind. I had the most incredible feeling of coming home, he was to recall. I decided it would be the place where I would live for the rest of my life. The asking price was £30,000. It seemed like millions to us, recalls Guy Pullen, whose father, not long previously, had purchased the freehold of their family home on Ripley Green, a few yards from Eric's birthplace, for £250. However, Stigwood seemed to think it was not extortionate, and the earnings of which Eric had by now lost count, and never sought to check on, were debited accordingly. He decided to move in immediately, despite having little to put into his woodland palazzo beyond a couple of armchairs, a bed, and a sound system he upgraded with a pair of six-foot-high cinema loudspeakers, there being no one for miles around to object to the noise. Aside from guitars and clothes, his only other significant possession was a vintage 1912 Douglas motorcycle that he'd never managed to start and now positioned like an art object in the centre of the main living room. After acquiring a few pieces of furniture off his own bat from Chelsea and Fulham Antiques Markets and being thoroughly ripped off, he found professional help through his connection with the Rolling Stones. The fashionable young interior designer, David Mlinarik, who had recently decorated Mick Jagger's Cheney Walk Home, installing, among other things, a chandelier whose £6,000 cost caused the parsimonious Jagger actual physical agony, agreed to give Hurtwood Edge the Spanish or Italian feel Eric desired. Mlinarik, in turn, enlisted the antiques dealer Christopher Gibbs, who'd been innocently caught up in the Jagger Richards drug bust, and more recently, designed the sets for performance with more than a nod to the pheasantry. A house of such size would have been impossible for any single occupant to keep up, never mind a rock musician, who in 25 years had never had to do anything for himself. So it was that after a few baptismal parties at Hurtwood for his musician friends, a card advertisement appeared in a local newsagent's window. Cleaner required, it said. Urgently. The card was spotted by a local man named Arthur Egby, an ex-soldier whose wife, Iris, happened to be looking for work. When I phoned the number on the card, a man's voice said, "'Can you get over right away? The place is in a bit of a mess,' he recalls. 
I didn't have a car, so the man said, That's okay, I'll send one for you tomorrow. Next day, Iris said, Eggy, come and look, there's a Rolls Royce outside. It was a vintage 1924 Rolls Royce that had come to fetch her. A bit of a mess proved something of an understatement. Iris said that in the kitchen there were about four sinks full of washing up and every surface was covered with dirty dishes, plates and knives and forks that had been standing there for a very long time. It was only now that the Eggbees discovered the deficient washer-upper's identity. I remember the first time I met this person who our neighbours said was a marvellous guitarist. He was wearing a yellow shirt and platformed heel boots, and I noticed he was a bit wobbly on them. The gardens at Hurtwood also needed work, having been neglected for many years, so Eric offered live-in jobs to both Iris and Arthur Egby. She as cleaner, he as gardener handyman, and they took up residence in the flat above the gatehouse with their schoolboy son, Kevin. Now that he'd found a dream home for himself, he wanted to do the same for the person who meant most to him, the little woman with the crease in her cheek who'd been both his mother and grandmother. Since becoming rich, he'd spoiled Rose every bit as much as she used to spoil him with mock turtle soup and sugar-coated bread and butter. After a lifetime self-effacement and denial, she had a wardrobe full of designer clothes and an elaborate bouffant hairdo. Whenever she came to his concerts, she was treated like royalty, Guy Pullen recalls. All Eric's fans knew who she was. They'd give her a round of applause, and she'd stand up and take a bow. Rose would usually be alone, or accompanied by her son Adrian and his wife Sylvia, who'd once been a vocalist with the Les Reed Big Band, but never her husband, Eric's step-grandfather Jack Clapp. Jack remained mystified by the profession he had chosen in preference to bricklaying and plastering, and was a little resentful of Rose's delight in it. Eric could never rekindle the rapport they had once enjoyed working together on building sites, and, as time passed, found it harder to think of anything to say to Jack. It was no easy job persuading Rose to leave Ripley, where her family had lived for generations, and the little house at One the Green, where Eric had been born, along with the fiction that she was his mother. Eventually, he found a postcard-perfect cottage in Shamley Green, on the other side of Woking, that melted her resistance. Sadly, only a couple of weeks after taking up residence, Jack suffered a major stroke and remained bedridden, lovingly cared for by Rose, for the last two years of his life. Ewhurst was only eight miles from Esher, where George and Patty Harrison lived in a psychedelically painted bungalow named Kinforns. After Eric moved into Hurtwood Edge, he began calling regularly on the Harrisons, and they on him. Since the White Album, George's unhappiness with the Beatles had intensified still further. In January, collectively influenced by the band, they had begun recording a Back to Roots album on a freezing soundstage at Twickenham Film Studios. During the increasingly uncomfortable and aimless sessions, George had temporarily walked out, with gallingly little effect. If he doesn't come back by Monday or Tuesday, John had shrugged, get Eric Clapton. Now, the four had abandoned the Roots project and were back in the studio, trying to recapture their old cohesion in the album that would become Abbey Road. One day, as George and Eric walked round Hurtwood's garden with their guitars, something Eric would never have thought of doing with anyone else, the spring sunlight filtering down through the ancient redwoods started George strumming a new song of atypical lightness and optimism, Here Comes the Sun. Eric was by now nearing the end of his two years with Charlotte Martin. It had broadened his horizons immeasurably. Without her, he would never have known Martin Sharp and Philippe Mora, nor lived in the pheasantry, nor hung out with David Litvinoff, R.D. Lang, George Melly and Germaine Greer, nor met the model for Davies in The Caretaker. Those two years had seen Eric metamorphosed from cult blues guitarist to international star, and though he was not in the least egotistical, the very opposite in fact, Charlotte 
felt their relationship to be increasingly under strain. I was in love with Eric, but now the whole world was too, she recalls, and with the tours and recording, there was less and less time to be together. The guitar was there too, all the time. Sometimes when I said something, I'd just get a riff back. I'd always felt he was running away from something, but we couldn't talk about feelings. He'd just never go there. Unknown to Charlotte, someone else was commanding my every thought, with whose beauty went a turn on he'd previously felt only from guitars. She seemed utterly out of his reach. If the 60s had allowed Eric to blot out the insecurities of his childhood, it was even truer of Patty Boyd, later Harrison, then Clapton, though in her case they were to return with a vengeance. Born in Somerset in 1944, Patty spent her early years in Kenya, at the tail end of British colonial rule. Her father, Jock, a former RAF officer, had suffered disfiguring burns from a wartime runway accident and in consequence was moody and withdrawn. Her mother, Diana, was a beautiful socialite with little interest in children. Patty spent long periods away from her younger siblings, Jenny and Colin, boarded out with relations or crying herself to sleep at a succession of bleak boarding schools. After the birth of a third daughter, Paula, in 1951, Diana divorced Jock and married Bobby Gamer Jones, an ex-guards officer employed by the Dunlop Rubber Company. Bobby was a domestic tyrant, given to physically abusing his three oldest stepchildren with a streak of inventive sadism. He also began an open affair with the wife of a neighbour, to which Diana turned a blind eye, even when the other woman scratched an erotic message on his car windscreen with her diamond ring. Patty's salvation was to grow up gorgeous, with a gap in her front teeth and a snub nose that wrinkled when she laughed, as she often did, a secondary salvation in years to come. She arrived in London just as the swinging was getting started, and it gobbled her up. After a brief period as a trainee beautician for Elizabeth Arden, she joined the new breed of long-haired, doe-eyed, knock-kneed, dolly-bird fashion models, invading the pages of Vogue, Honey, and French L. She acquired a boyfriend named Eric, in this case the photographer, Eric Swain, who first aroused her interest in getting behind a camera, as well as pouting in front of one. When she was 19, she did a television commercial for Smith's Crisps, whose director, Richard Lester, was about to start shooting the Beatles' first feature film, A Hard Day's Night. Lester recruited her as an extra for the sequence on the train that rescues them from a mob of screaming fans. She and a companion were dressed as schoolgirls, which in 1964 did not raise a single eyebrow, and Patty spoke a one-word line. Prisoners? In the lunch break, she sat next to George, who jokily asked her to marry him. Their first date revealed what a protective bubble Brian Epstein had created around his cherished boys. It was dinner at London's super-stuffy Garrick Club. Epstein went, too, and chose their food and wine for them. When George proposed for real two years later, he had to clear it with Epstein and be instructed when the wedding should take place. Initially, the romance had to be kept secret for fear of alienating George's fans. Patty grew accustomed to being a shameful secret, allowed to appear with him only in protected environments like the Ad Lib Club. On one occasion, in company with John's wife Cynthia, being smuggled past the press in a pair of outsized laundry baskets. Once unmasked, she faced verbal abuse, sometimes even physical assault, from frenzied adolescent females who regarded George as their personal property. And, like all royal consorts, she had to stay one step behind the monarch. When we'd go to a hotel, she recalls, they'd hold open the door for George, then always let it slam in my face. She was the silent witness to formative events in the Beatles' later career, from their first LSD trip, administered at a dinner party by their dentist, 
to the moment they learned of Brian Epstein's death and their sojourn with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi in Rishikesh. Her younger sister, Jenny, who'd followed her into modelling, also joined this inner circle, running the short-lived Apple Boutique, joining the expedition to Rishikesh, and inspiring Donovan's song, Jennifer Juniper. Jenny was an eyewitness of the awful moment when Cynthia Lennon returned from holiday to find John had installed Yoko in their home. Seemingly unconcerned, he wiggled his bare toes at her and did a squeaky voice as if they were saying, Hello, Jenny. For their first two years of marriage, Patty recalls, George was divine, sweet and kind and adored by her whole family. She was his inspiration for Something, a love song of a tenderness he had never touched before, destined to be covered by the likes of Frank Sinatra, Elvis Presley, Ray Charles and Shirley Bassey, and a victim of Lennon-McCartney blockage, as it was written long before being included on the Abbey Road album. Things changed after their return from the Maharishi's ashram. If the experience had given George a fulfilment he no longer found with the Beatles, she felt it had also taken some of the lightness out of his soul. Far from granting the inner peace his guru had promised, his obsessive meditating and chanting and spinning of a prayer wheel seemed to make him depressed and moody in a way he had never been before. He was angry because he couldn't achieve the level of spirituality he wanted, Patty recalls. He wanted to reach Nirvana. Derek Taylor, the Beatles press officer, told the story of being with him on a flight from New York to London. The stewardess asked if he wanted anything to eat or drink and George said, Fuck off, can't you see I'm meditating? On a less spiritual level, he was fascinated by images of Krishna, the love god, surrounded by nubile handmaidens and overtly aspired to a similar role. Patty knew only too well that the supply of nubile handmaidens available to a beetle would have made even Krishna's jaw drop. Left at home while George was in London, recording or at the Apple offices, she took refuge in her diary and in designing the perfect suicide for herself, a leap from the top of Beachy Head wearing an Aussie Clark dress. In the frequent get-togethers with Eric and Charlotte Martin, she took little notice of Eric, beyond thinking him rather nice, totally unaware of his overwhelming infatuation with her. However, in her solitary, insecure state, she became extremely friendly with his girlfriend. When Eric broke up with Charlotte at the end of 1968, it seemed natural for Patty to offer sympathy and invite her to stay at Kinforns while she considered her future. In the aftermath of a New Year's Eve party at Scylla Black's, she recalls, Everything went swiftly downhill. Charlotte didn't seem remotely upset about Eric and was uncomfortably close to George. He denied there was anything going on and accused Patty of paranoia, whereupon she fled from the house and went to London to stay with friends. On about day three, Eric rang me saying, I know you're on your own. Would you like to come out for dinner? She refused the invitation. I was actually quite annoyed that he'd done that while George was with his girlfriend, as if the whole thing was a plot. It felt like a setup. After six days, George phoned to say that Charlotte had gone. She moved to Paris and subsequently began a relationship with Jimmy Page, one of Eric's successors in the Yardbirds, by now with Led Zeppelin and one of his principal rivals. Patty agreed to return home little imagining how the triangle of George, Eric and herself was to develop or how bizarre would be its outcome. Cream's breakup had left Eric feeling like the survivor of a particularly brutal war and the best person he could think of to help him recuperate was Stevie Winwood. They'd been friends since Winwood was the 15-year-old wunderkind of the Spencer Davis group playing keyboards and guitar and singing in a voice that stood comparison with Ray Charles. Eric had several times unsuccessfully tried to bring him into Cream as a calming influence. Now he too happened to be at a loose end, having recently walked out on traffic. 
He was living in a cottage near the Berkshire village of Aston Tyrold, and for some weeks the two of them hung there, smoking pot and jamming for the sheer pointless pleasure of it. Winwood received a preview of the first real song Eric had written, prompted by moving into Hurtwood Edge. It was called Presence of the Lord, and was literally a hymn of praise. I have finally found a place to live, just like I never could before. Then one night at the cottage, there was an unexpected knock at the door. Winwood opened it to reveal a flaming red head and pair of staring triumphant eyes. Ginger Baker had somehow got wind of their activities and found his way to this remote niche in the Berkshire Downs to participate. Eric's immediate thought, he would recall, was, Oh no, whatever's going to happen, I know it's all going to go wrong. The presence of the Lord had an extra meaning now that he was romantically involved with the Honourable Alice Magdalene Sarah Ormsby Gore, the youngest daughter of the fifth Baron Harlick. Alice came from an unusual mixture of aristocracy, wealth, and brains. Her father's title was among the most ancient in Wales, enshrined in Men of Harlech, an anthem well known to every British schoolchild of Eric's generation. Prior to inheriting it, he had been Sir David Ormsby Gore, a Conservative government minister, and then British ambassador in Washington from 1961 to 1963. Alice, born in 1952, was one of Ormsby Gore's five children with his first wife, Sylvia. She grew up on the family's extensive estates in Wales and Shropshire, with a two-year break at the British Embassy in Washington, where Ormsby Gore enjoyed a close relationship with President John F. Kennedy. In 1962, while Yardbird Eric was using the Cuban Missile Crisis to lure girls into bed, what does it matter? We could all be blown up tomorrow. Alice's father had been an essential link between Kennedy and the British government in staving off a potential Third World War. She was beautiful, in the ethereal style of her Lewis Carroll namesake, and the camera discovered her early. When she was nine, she posed for America's mighty Life magazine before Thomas Gainsborough's portrait of her great-great-grandmother. In 1967, her mother was killed in a car crash, leaving Ormsby Gore with five children to parent. London Society Columns announced that 15-year-old Alice had been placed in the care of her grandmother, the Dowager Lady Harlick, and would be attending New York's exclusive Dalton School under the chaperonage of a former U.S. ambassador to London, John Hay Whitney. After a decent interval, her father proposed marriage to the widowed Jackie Kennedy, but was turned down in favour of the shipping billionaire Aristotle Onassis. Her two older sisters, Jane and Victoria, were among the aristocratic hippies who gravitated to Chelsea in the mid-sixties, many of them to employ their titles in business ventures like interior designers or model agencies. Jane was said to have had an affair with Mick Jagger, and inspired the Rolling Stones song Lady Jane, while her husband, Michael Rainey, opened the Hung On You boutique, Eric's favourite place for flowered shirts and kipper ties. Alice herself inclined towards fashion modelling, a career now as open to Chelsea posh girls as to East End Cockney ones. Her in-wonderland look made her perfect for the floaty, bangly, Moroccan-influenced fashions of the late 60s. She was photographed by the likes of Clive Arrowsmith and Patrick Litchfield, appeared in two consecutive issues of British Vogue magazine, and had a walk-on role in Andy Warhol's short film Pre-Raphaelite Dream. Instead, just after turning 16, she took a job with the interior designer David Mlinarek, whose current projects included doing up Hurtwood Edge. Meeting her was a weird moment for Eric, as a small boy, his favourite game with his bosom friend Guy Pullen had been to dance around chanting the double-barrelled names of posh people they had read in newspapers or heard on the radio, and cackling hysterically. And the one that always had the most in fits was Ormsby Gore. He was immediately taken by Alice's enigmatic smile and wonderfully infectious giggle, 
but thought no further than that. She took the initiative by asking him to a party in London. Then, when he turned up, she ignored him for the entire evening. It was his first taste of British upper-class cool, against which rock and roll cool stands no chance. One of the most interesting non-musical friends he had made in Chelsea was an actor and television director named Ian Dallas, whose family owned a large estate in Eyre, Scotland. A few years later, Dallas would convert to Islam, take the name Abd al-Qadir al-Sufi and become an early Muslim radical preacher, founding the Marabitun sect whose followers eventually ran into the hundred thousands. Around the time that Eric met Alice Ormsby Gore, Dallas read him the 12th century Persian tale of a young man named Majnun who falls hopelessly in love with a high-born maiden named Layla. Her father will not hear of the match and marries her off to someone more suitable, reducing Majnun to despair and madness. Alice's father, Lord Harlech, looked easily capable of such despotism. He was an archetypal toff, tall and lanky with a languid drawl and a great beak of a nose that seemed made to be stuck in the air. Among many public posts, he was president of the British Board of Film Censors, meaning that every film Eric had seen for several years past had borne the signature Harlick on its certification. However, he was not in the least censorious of his daughter for going with a working-class rock star, not even when Alice moved into Hurtwood Edge. In fact, Eric and he had more in common than they knew. Harlick was a passionate music fan who in younger days, especially during his Washington posting, had known many jazz stars about whom he loved to reminisce. He was always to treat Eric with sympathy and understanding, almost miraculously so as time went on, and Eric would always regard him with love and respect. Outwardly, countercultural high society seemed to have gained a perfect couple in the landed gentleman rocker and his exquisite blue-blooded wild child. But... As was so often the case with Eric, his life was a good deal less enviable than it seemed. Although, in that permissive era, no finger was ever pointed at him for cohabiting with a 16-year-old, he was uncomfortably aware of Alice's age and profoundly dismayed when she informed him she was still a virgin, even though virgins could hardly have been absent from his innumerable one-night stands. With this element of guilt on his part, Sex did not play any part in their affair. They were more like brother and sister, or platonic classmates at Hollyfield School. When not out at gigs or clubs, they spent most of their time smoking dope and listening to records. Alice was not his Layla. He embarked on the relationship still helplessly infatuated with George Harrison's wife Patty, and remained so throughout its unexpected length, until its terrible end. Since Ginger Baker had materialised out of the West Country darkness, a new group with the dread word super attached to it was exponentially taking shape like a car airbag that can't be stopped from inflating. That first jam at Stevie Winwood's cottage, unfortunately, had been too good, with Baker and Winwood finding an instant empathy. Baker exercised his considerable charm on the boy wonder who decided that all the stories about him must be exaggeration and it would be crazy for the three of them not to team up properly. So keen was Eric to work with Winwood that he did a U-turn straight back into everything he'd been running from. The new entity, for this time no name suggested itself as naturally as Cream, save perhaps Double Cream, was born amid managerial complications that set the tone for its brief, unstable life. Robert Stigwood could not scoop it up, as was his wont, because Stevie Winwood had a powerful and prestigious manager in Chris Blackwell, the founder of Island Records. There was no alternative but for Stigwood and Blackwell jointly to manage the Clapton Baker Winwood project, and unluckily, the gentrified Australian and the laid back English public school boy could not stand each other. When jamming turned into proper rehearsals at Hurtwood Edge, 
Eric and Winwood realised that the latter playing bass lines on his electric organ was not enough and they needed a bass player whose main qualifications would be negative ones, i.e. not being small and Scottish and truculent and called Jack Bruce. These were all present in Leicester-born Rick Grech, whom Eric had known since blues boom days when he was with John Mayle and Grech was with the Farinas. Grech would add another line to the supergroup tag as he was now in Family, an aggressively mystical ensemble whose every show began with a dedication to Krishna. In February, the still unnamed quartet went into Morgan Studios in Wilsdon, northwest London, to start work on their first, and it would prove only, album. However, music journalists who picked up the story were told to forget any idea of Eric's being involved in further supergroupery. He was simply making a solo album with Stevie Winwood's help. The sessions began under the supervision of Chris Blackwell, who was as noted a producer as he was an entrepreneur. Work had not proceeded far before Baker was screaming at Blackwell with a savagery that made several of the women present flee in terror. For the good of the project, Blackwell turned over the control room to Traffics and later the Rolling Stones producer, Jimmy Miller. By May, when work transferred to Olympic Studios in Barnes, the story could no longer be contained. Rock fans knew they had a new supergroup, potentially surpassing all others, one indeed whose lineup made the term seem almost an understatement, even though it still didn't have a name. As to its aims, Eric had no very clear idea beyond a British version of the band, cohesive and interdependent and in every way different from the clash of individual egos that had been cream. His own role sounded so modest as scarcely to put him on stage at all, a subordinate and nurturer of Stevie Winwood. Stevie is the focal point. He needs a lot of encouragement. I think a lot of his energies have been wasted. By now, the album was at the design and marketing stage, yet still its makers had not come up with a name for it, or themselves. The cover was to be by the American photographer Bob Siderman, whose portfolio included The Grateful Dead and Janis Joplin, and who'd been caught in the pheasantry drug swoop after Eric had beat his hasty retreat. In a few weeks' time, America was to make the first attempt to put a man on the moon. Siderman's idea was to juxtapose such modern scientific marvels with the innocence of a girl as young as Juliet. Shakespeare's star-crossed heroine is said to have been around 14, but not wearing Elizabethan hoops and ruffs. In fact, not wearing anything. On a tube journey to Stigwood's office, he encountered the perfect model, aged 13 and dressed in a school uniform of blazer and ankle socks. She proved willing to model nude for a record cover, and her parents, a wealthy couple named Goshen, made no objection. These were the 60s after all. Then she had second thoughts, and her 11-year-old sister Mariora volunteered to take her place. Siderman's picture showed Mariora topless and holding a silver ornament resembling the hood of an American Chevrolet Bel Air, made by Eric's celebrity jeweler friend, Miko Mulligan. Mulligan's creation, the photographer explained, symbolized the fruit of the tree of knowledge and his pre-Raphaelite-looking child, the fruit of the tree of life. To express youthful trust in science's benefit to humankind, he captioned it, Blind Faith. The phrase was instantly seized on to name both the album and the band. In 1969, no one worried too much about the manifold ways in which the rock business made use of very young girls, then known as nymphettes, whether as groupies, subjects for leering lyrics, good morning little schoolgirl, or titillating images for records and concert posters. But a naked 11-year-old brandishing what resembled a metal phallus was a first and caused panic at Polydor, the label that was to release the album in the UK. Eric insisted that the picture was beautiful and tasteful and refused to change it, further demanding that it shouldn't be defaced by any typography 
and the album title appear only on an outer wrapper. That summer, the endemic shape-shifting among top rock bands reached even the Rolling Stones. Their lead guitarist, Brian Jones, who had both created and named them, had become too much of a liability, thanks to drug and psychiatric problems, and so was summarily fired. To replace him, Mick Jagger made approaches to Eric, though no definite offer ever resulted, and Eric, in any case, was hardly in a position to consider it. Instead, the job went to 21-year-old Mick Taylor, one of his many fellow graduates from John Mayles Blues Breakers, who was already shaping up as a contender for his title. 14. Million Dollar Time Bomb Blind Faith made their performing debut on 7th of June at a free concert in London's Hyde Park, attended by 120,000 people, the first in a series of huge alfresco musical happenings that would try to hold back the end of the 60s, and almost seem to have succeeded. Among the backstage VIPs on that gloriously sunny afternoon were Mick Jagger and his girlfriend Marion Faithful. It would be no coincidence that a month later, the Rolling Stones gave their own free concert in the park to introduce Mick Taylor and as a memorial to Brian Jones, who'd been found dead in his swimming pool a few days earlier. That day in June should have been a moment of supreme triumph for Eric, topping an impressive supporting bill of Donovan, Richie Havens, Edgar Broughton and the Third Ear Band. Surveying a huge, basking, pot-hazed multitude, agog to see his new Beyond supergroup, and hear how they might evoke a naked young girl holding a silver motor accessory. But his day had been poisoned when the band met at Robert Stigwood's office before going to Hyde Park. He looked into Ginger Baker's eyes, and expert drug diagnostician that he had become realised that Baker was back on heroin. He would later recall that I felt I was stepping back into the nightmare that had been part of Cream. In truth, Cream cast a shadow over the whole performance, for the martial amplifiers still bore their white stenciled name, and spasmodic cries of, Bring back Cream! and Where's Jack? floated through the balmy air. Though Blind Faith were all seasoned performers, none of them had ever faced an audience on this scale, stretching to the westward horizon, standing on car roofs, overloading rowboats on the serpentine, and perched in trees like schools of spaced-out monkeys. It was as if even the mighty marshals were suffering from stage fright and unable to give out their accustomed roar. But the real problem was one that Jimmy Miller had already faced with Blind Faith the album. In the headlong rush to launch, they had not written enough new songs to differentiate them either from Cream or Traffic. Stevie Winwood had made the largest contribution with Sea of Joy, Can't Find My Way Home, and Had to Cry Today. Eric had offered only Presence of the Lord and a radically new arrangement of Buddy Holly's Well, All Right. Winwood was, as Eric had promised, the focal point, taking lead vocal even for Presence of the Lord, as a result, the predominant tone was not of rock, but somewhat meandering jazz funk. Eric, using a Fender Telecaster, chose the least visible place, behind Ginger Baker's drums, and remained unsmiling and motionless, but for the occasional girlish shake of his hair off his forehead. He'd been doing amazing stuff in rehearsal and recording, Baker recalls, but in Hyde Park, I kept wondering when he was going to start playing. In the retreat from Cream's improvisational style, every song had a set arrangement from which no one departed. Even Baker's solos lasted nothing like as long as their former hundred years. Much as the music press longed to be captivated, there was a decided faintness to the praise as to the applause. They played together tastefully, almost gently, in contrast to the violence of Cream, noted Melody Maker, with arranged passages well together. I wasn't really there. I'd zoned out, Eric would admit. 
Then, after a third encore that stretched the band's repertoire to the limit, a typical reaction set in. I came off stage shaking like a leaf because, once again, I felt I'd let people down. Straight after Hyde Park came a four-concert appearance in Scandinavia, then a seven-week stadium tour of America, lasting until the end of August. Box office advances added to record sales, and film and TV rights, negotiated by Stigwood in uneasy harness with Chris Blackwell, added up to more money than any rock act had ever made off the back of one album. Yet amid the whirl of interviews and photo calls, no time had been set aside to reflect on the lessons of that debut performance or write desperately needed new material. As Stevie Winwood would observe in bruised hindsight, Blind Faith were not so much a band as a million-dollar time bomb. In America, advanced sales of 250,000 guaranteed the album its number one spot even faster than in Britain. There was a nasty wobble when US record retailers first beheld Bob Siderman's cover and around 70% refused to stock it. Atlantic Records president Ahmet Ertegen, who himself saw nothing offensive in the image, came up with a brilliant strategy that appeased the retailer's moral outrage, yet avoided the kind of contretemps Eric had had with British Polydor. Siderman's image was replaced by a straightforward shot of the musicians in the main living room at Hurtwood Edge. However, a note inside each album said that the purchasers could write to Atlantic Records and have the censored cover sent to them. This hugely alluring suggestion of the dirty book trade was enhanced by widespread rumours that the unidentified model was Ginger Baker's daughter, or was a groupie kept as a slave to service the whole band. Most American music critics, not that they mattered, commented on the album's combined virtuosity and insubstantiality. Rolling Stone, reviewing it three times in the same issue, called it phenomenal in places, weak in others, but praised Eric's presence of the Lord with a paraphrase of Winston Churchill on the Battle of Britain. Never has a guitarist said so much so beautifully in such a short time. For the New York Times, Blind Faith were more versatile and precise than either Cream or Traffic, but unfortunately not as exciting as either. America's welcome was very different from the languorous crowds and good vibes in Hyde Park. The opening show, before 20,000 people at Madison Square Garden, ended in a riot, an invasion of the stage that took half an hour to bring under control. As would repeatedly happen throughout the tour, police and security personnel behaved worse than the spectators. A young boy who tried to pick up one of Ginger Baker's cast-off drumsticks, was clubbed to the ground by a security man, bringing Baker leaping to the attack, just like in days of old with Jack Bruce. All that these audiences wanted to hear were the greatest hits of Eric's and Stevie Winwood's former bands, and with so little original material, there was no choice but to oblige them. At one moment, Blind Faith would sound like Cream, at the next like traffic. What they never remotely sounded, looked or felt like, was Eric's ideal, a British version of the band. It had been at his personal request that the husband and wife duo of Delaney and Bonnie Bramlett were booked on the tour. He'd heard their album, the original Delaney and Bonnie, also known by its subtitle, Accept No Substitute, at the same time that he became enamoured of the band, and had found the same relief from roaring martial amps in their largely acoustic blend of country, blues and gospel. Also along, for diplomatic reasons, were Free, a young British hard rock band lately signed to Chris Blackwell's Island label. He was immediately drawn to the black-bearded, roistering Delaney Bramlett, the blonde, cherub-faced Bonnie, and the highly accomplished backing band known simply as their friends. He adopted us right off, Bonnie recalls. We didn't know what to make of this British guy who'd come over to the States playing music that we felt belonged to us. I was ready to be a little tough on him, 
but the moment he started to play, I knew he was one of the anointed. And let me tell you, no one could ever be as tough on him as he was on himself. The couple were not quite as they appeared. Although Delaney seemed saturated in country blues, his career until this point had been largely in mainstream pop, playing bass in the shindig TV show's house band. The refined-looking Bonnie, by contrast, had been raised in East St. Louis, the city's vibrant blues quarter, learning her chops from the great Albert King, who regarded her as an unofficial goddaughter, and later working almost exclusively with black groups like Sly and the Family Stone and Ike and Tina Turner. But Delaney told Eric he'd been to the crossroads, just like Robert Johnson, she says. From there on, Eric loved him. He took to jamming with them in their dressing room, then sitting in with them on stage until he had all but forsaken blind faith for them. While his bandmates travelled between shows by air, he scrambled onto Delaney and Bonnie's bus, his friend Ben Palmer remembered, with all the enthusiasm of someone climbing into their first dormobile and going off to the Ricky Tick Club. It was on these journeys that he saw a way out of his prison of hype and over-adulation. Delaney and Bonnie must come to Europe on tour, and he would join them as just another of their friends. The couple were, of course, delighted, and a date was set for the end of the year. No escapee in his favourite war film, The Colditz Story, ever looked forward more yearningly to going under the wire. But with the transfiguring new friendship came an uncomfortable revelation. Delaney Bramlett was physically abusive to his wife, often beating her up so badly that she went on stage with her eyes blackened and face bruised. The trigger tended not to be domestic disputes so much as their professional partnership, in which Delaney seemed to feel an illogical resentment of Bonnie's honeyed vocals and impeccable blues pedigree. His violence therefore usually erupted in front of other people, as she recalls, like he was giving them some kind of entertainment. These were days when wife-battering was still widely regarded as a husband's prerogative, and nobody else's business. So, like all their musical collaborators, Eric could only stand sheepishly looking on. Stevie Winwood, very naturally, felt hurt at being dropped by his once appreciative jamming partner, and resentful to find almost the whole burden of blind faith shifted onto him. The young support band Free had spent their first two weeks on the road without even being introduced to their headliners. Then, one night, to their astonishment, Winwood came into their dressing room to hang out. He spent much of the time telling them how he envied their being at the start of their career, without the burdens of supergroupdom and super hype, in a word, free. Now, too, Winwood realized why Eric had been so reluctant to go back on the road with Ginger Baker. For Baker, in his own recollection, was flying all the time, fueled by the heroin which Eric still resolutely refused. There was at least a harmony in Blind Faith's rhythm section that Creams had never had, Rick Gregg being a drug abuser almost on the same scale. At his farewell concert with family, the previous April, he had been so stoned that he could barely pluck a note. Baker was as happy as a pig in shit, and the happier he got, the more Eric and Winwood feared consequences from the battalions of overzealous cops at every gig. He remembers driving a Shelby Cobra with three gorgeous girls in the car when suddenly the radio stops the music with the news that Ginger Baker, Blind Faith drummer, has been found dead in his hotel room of a heroin overdose. I thought to myself, fucking hell, I must be in heaven.' 